The following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope. Okay, so Alex is now completely yours. Oh, okay. Uh, hello to everybody. I am glad to welcome you at the session uh, of Upgrade and Performance Detector, which is devoted to the colorimetry and mirrors. Uh, so since our schedule is quite tough, we uh, have to follow schedule. So please uh, try to be in time. And uh, during uh, the talks, please uh, mute your microphones. And after finishing, you can ask question, raising a hand or uh, writing in the chat. Okay, so uh, let's start from the first talk. Uh, Dario will talk about precision colorimetry at high luminosity, the CMS electromagnetic colorimeter from the LHC one two to the high luminosity LHC. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to be here to show you the CMS electromagnetic colorimeter, uh, the upgrade from the LAC RAN2 uh, to the ILUMI LAC. Um, the electromagnetic colorimeter of CMS is characterized by a high granularity. It's almost 76,000 crystals of a lead, lead uh, tungsten. Uh, this allows the detector to have a fast decay situation light with a, a shorter radiation length to gather a smaller radiation, Molière radius. And uh, the crystals are read by avalanche photodiodes, the APDs. And of course, the detector is fundamental for the uh, particle identification in CMS to detect electron and gammas, but also jet. And uh, uh, it's um, good uh, uh, the photon mass resolution of about 1%. Um, it, as a crucial role for the discovery, for example, of the Higgs boson, but in many other uh, CMS analyses, of course. In the run two conditions, we had to fight uh, against two uh, different uh, enemies. One was the higher integrated uh, luminosity with respect to run one. Uh, this means a larger uh, radiation dose that increase uh, the loss of light of the crystals. Basically, it's a transparency degradation of the crystals and um, the uh, radiation induced aging of the photodetectors and of the detector readout. Uh, uh, in, in total. The other enemy is the, is the pile up because with respect to the RAM1 in RAM2 and in RAM3, we have a higher bunch intensity and um, a 25 nanosecond bunch spacing. This has an impact on the pulse reconstruction. You can see in the plot in this slide on the, on the left, the, uh, what does it mean, uh, the radiation um, dose that uh, decrease the transparency of the, of the crystals. Basically, we have uh, that at the end of the run two, uh, of the, run two the barrel has uh, lost 13% uh, of the transparency, while for the end cap, it's even worse. And we have to monitor each channel with a dedicated laser system and perform every 40 minutes uh, a check, and then the correction will be provided every 48 hours. This regular calibration allows to maintain an excellent energy resolution and a good stabili stability over the time, as you can see in the plot on the right. But um, we have also to implement a multi-fit algorithm considering the out-of-time pass effect to mitigate the pile up at the construction level. And we'll not uh, uh, speak about this, there is a, a uh, poster dedicated uh, by Dimitri. And uh, so I can go directly for the high lumi, which is the challenge, 
basically we want to maintain the same performances even in the phase two when the pileup will be five, even seven times larger. Just to give you an example of the luminosity of five times 10 to the 34 centimeters square per second, we will collect uh, almost uh, one inverse femto to by every 5.5 hours. This implies to have a higher figure rate, of course, and a higher bandwidth to be sustained. Of course, a higher radiation that implies a higher noise and a higher anomalous uh, high energy signals that we call spikes. Those spikes are basically signals of hadrons that interact directly with the APD instead of the uh, crystals. And, um, we want to reject the spikes and we want to change uh, the electronics in order to reject the spikes. In fact, what we can do to sustain the phase two um, uh, luminosity is the substitution of the end cap part of the vehicle with a new uh, high granularity calorimeter. And for the barrier, we have to reduce the temperature from 18 to 9 Celsius degrees to mitigate the APD dark current. And uh, we have to upgrade the aircal barrier electronics in order to have precise timing, the spike rejection, and the full detector readout at level one. The precise timing in phase two is quite important, it's quite peculiar for a calorimeter, because uh, when you run at uh, 140 or 200 uh, pile up, um, the vertex reconstruction efficiency is uh, reduced uh, to 30%, for example, for the X in gamma gamma. Uh, if you want to constrain uh, the vertex localization uh, in one centimeter, you have uh, to um, uh, use a precise timing of about 30 picoseconds. In this case, you will have a 10% improvement in the fiducial procession sensitivity uh, and the X gamma gamma resolution. Regarding the X gamma gamma resolution, you can check the plot on the right. You can see that the green uh, curve is uh, uh, the um, precision without any, any timing applied. Well, if you have a precise timing of 30 picoseconds, you get more 10% uh, more uh, better uh, uh, precision. Well, if you add the um, uh, timing layer, which is uh, presented by Nanlu on Tuesday, you can basically um, go back to the run two uh, situation. So uh, the message is that uh, the new uh, readout chain is specified to deliver the desired time resolution of 30 picoseconds for energy greater than 50 uh, GeV. In general, we change uh, the, the pre-amplifier of the electronics from a charge sensitive amplifier to a trans impedance amplifier with uh, different uh, gain values in order to use a uh, less number of bits. In fact, then we have to use an uh, analog to digital converter of 12 bits. And we move from a frequency of 40 mega sample to 160 mega sample per second in order to, to, to to obtain the 30 picosecond uh, resolution, timing resolution that we want. And we have to uh, compress the data. In fact, before uh, data were sent uh, out of detector in pipeline, but before in the front end, we were, we were doing the uh, trigger primitive generation uh, in a tower of five per five crystals, while now uh, we will send uh, data of detector uh, in, using the LPGBT uh, data links uh, with the trigger data granularity of the crystal. So uh, we are not using any more the towers, but uh, we have a full readout uh, uh, at the trigger level for the detector. Uh, this means that if you try to deliver the entire, uh, the, all, all, the, all the channels with the 13 bit words, the, um, the channel bandwidth is 2.08 uh, gigabit per second, while the LPGBT uh, rate, uh, it's 1.28 gigabit per second. So you have to uh, basically reduce our factor to the, um, the bandwidth. And how we do it uh, is uh, with a very simplified Huffman code. Uh, basically, we usually uh, send uh, data with six bits that we call baseline. So in six bits, you can store basically 2.4 GB and usually you have less than 2.4 GeV. So uh, six bits are enough to um, describe the energy. In fact, the probability to have two, more than 2.4 GeV in a single crystal per, uh, per event, it depends on it, of course, but you can see that it's at the level of 10 to the minus four. While uh, for, for a signal with the higher energy, you send 13 bits, 12 of the ADC plus one that tells you if you are using gain 10 or gain one. So a uh, signal multiplied by a factor 10 or a signal multiplied by a factor one. 
We test the um, CATIA, so the trans impedance amplifier uh, in a test beam uh, connected with a 160 megahertz commercial ADC, so not with the final uh, trans, uh, ADC and transmission unit that we will have, uh, but with uh, in an electron beam in a range of 25 to 250 GeV and uh, the temperature uh, current. Uh, currently used in nickel, and we find that even with a commercial ADC, uh, we are uh, good enough to uh, match with the, the energy resolution of the, of the actual electronics, and the time resolution match the targets of 30 picoseconds. Moreover, the new transient impedance amplifier is able to well separate the signal from the spike with respect from uh, the electromagnetic shower uh, in the crystal. As you can see, in round two, the two signals are basically the same, while in, uh, for, for the phase two, you can see that uh, we are able to separate them already at the trigger level and we can reject them. Now we are doing uh, several tests to characterize, uh, to characterize the full et electronics chain, uh, like the radiation hardness, which is of course fundamental uh, for high lumi, the characterization of the um, trans impedance amplifier with the gain, with the noise, and also the characterization of the light DTU ADC, uh, like the effective number of bits, the INL, the NL. And finally, we are now testing uh, for the first time the connection between the CAT and the light DTU. I just put a couple of pictures of the test, uh, radiation hardness test that we did um, uh, in various facilities like Padova, like Pavia, like Louvain, etc. So to conclude, the transition from the round two condition to the high luminosity for the CMS equal calorimeter has been presented. In round two, the increased pile-up and radiation required to constantly monitor and calibrate the detector and the system maintain indeed an excellent energy resolution together with a good stability over the time. Nevertheless, if you want to go to phase two, you have to do some intervention, like to the substitution of the end cap with the high granularity calorimeter. You have to reduce the temperature in the barrel and you have to, uh, create, to build a very brand new electronics for the, for the barrel. This will provide a time resolution of uh, about 30 picoseconds to mitigate the pileup effect and will provide a new shaping uh, in order to reject the spikes already at the readout level. Uh, and it will allow to read each single channel already at the trigger level, providing a full detector uh, readout for the trigger. Uh, preliminary result from the test bench have shown promising result with only Katya and a commercial ADC sample at 160 megahertz. Well, now we are doing some tests with the LIDTU block, and, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions uh, to Daria? Maybe I would like to ask if I can. Uh, I would like to ask what are the expected fluencies uh, for the high luminosity uh, during the high luminosity LAT? I mean, like total fluencies for the full high lumi life. Uh, the, the, the exact number I don't remember, it's written in, uh, in the TDR. Sorry, I, uh, I will send you. Okay, no, no problem. Uh, and maybe, maybe the second question, uh, what parts of the calorimeter will be most affected by, by these fluencies, like detection parts or electronics? Well, uh, the, the electronics, of course, has to, uh, has to fight uh, against uh, um, the, uh, the, the radiation. And, uh, while for the crystal is, uh, okay, once you know how to calibrate the crystal, uh, you can correct it, while for the electronics, you have to make it uh, working even at uh, a higher uh, fluency. So that's the, the point. Okay, thanks. Oh, oh, okay, I don't see other request for question. May I ask a short question? Uh, during test beam, you uh, carry out measurements at uh, 18 uh, degrees. Uh, did you perform measurements at nine degrees? Not yet. No, this is something that we have to do. Unfortunately, we have a bit uh, um, stop due to the COVID and there are many tests that we want to, to do that are still pending. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you uh, again. So let's move to next presentation. Uh, Pavel. Hello, good morning or good afternoon. I would like to say a few words about uh, Atlas Liquid Argon Calorimeter commissioning and preparations for the run three. Short outline of my talk, I will say a few words about the calorimeter and the preparation for the next run and we'll describe in more details the phase one upgrades which are currently ongoing and which is most of the work done during the LS2. A liquid argon uh, calorimeter for Atlas is um, using three technology, three geometries, let's say. Um, in the central barrel, it uses accordion uh, geometry. In the hadronic end cap, it is the parallel plate geometry. And in the forward detector, it's the uh, very new design of the cylindrical electrodes parallel to the beam. The calorimeter is highly granular. We have in total nearly 200,000 channels and covers the, have the full coverage up to ETA 4.9. Uh, so it's um, very useful for identification of the particles for measuring the jets uh, and so. Um, the calorimeter signals are amplified outside the cryostat in the so-called front end boards, which has 128 channels each. And on the board, the signal is split into the three gains in order to, to cover the full dynamic range of the detector. And then the signal is sampled and stored in the analog pipelines. And only in, in the current readout, once the uh, level one accept uh, signal comes, then the proper gain is selected and transmitted to the, to the bag. In addition, we are sending the analog signals to the level one trigger system. This is done before last stage of the integration. And uh, um, in, we have nearly everywhere the, around two millimeters gaps in the uh, liquid argon and with the two kilovolt nominal high voltage, our drift time is around 40, uh, 450 uh, nanoseconds. So uh, now uh, why we are thinking about uh, some upgrades, uh, we could not change the detector itself, of course, that's too costly and take too much time. Uh, and with the, but with the increasing luminosity, which we expect in the run three, around mu 80, uh, there will be quite challenging to select the right event because the Atlas plans to stay with the same level one rate as during the round two, around 100 kilohertz, out of which the 20 kilohertz uh, should be devoted to electrons and gammas, which are the primary particles identified by the liquid argon calorimeter. These luminosities were achieved uh, during the round two already, but only for the short time. And for the um, Run three, we expect to have such conditions for most of the beam time. So in order to achieve the, uh, the goal to keep the trigger uh, efficiency uh, S in the run two and to stay within this 20 kilohertz rate without some important acceptance loss, we need to do something without triggering. And because we could not change the, the detector, as I said, but we have enough granularity in the detector itself. Um, we have prepared the upgrade, which by using this higher granularity in the trigger, we'll be able to, to stay with the expected rates without uh, uh, raising the ET thresholds. And even this higher granularity allows to use some shower shape variables to better distinguish, I mean, the electrons and the jets already in the trigger. And also to use some rejection criteria similar to offline algorithm, which will better 
reject the QCD background jets. So the, this upgrade uh, in the trigger consists basically from the new digital trigger boards, which directly in the front end cray are taking the existing trigger signal from the front end board, but with much higher granularity. And this will uh, allow uh, uh, to achieve the goals which I have now just described. In order to have this board working, we need many more signals coming from the front end board to this new trigger digitizer, as well as to exchange this layer sum board on the FAB, which are collecting and summing the signals from the few cells to form the analog trigger signal. We need to do this now which, with much higher granularity. So this was the proposal and we are now intensively working during the LS2 to implementing. Um, basically for this, we, we needed to reinstall all our cr crates with electronics on the cryostat exchange the base planes on the top right plot, you see the, the picture of the one new base plane, uh, which needs now to route 10 times more signals than before. Um, they are all produced and more than 80% of them are installed as well as these new layer sum boards are produced. And we are working already for more than a year to refurbish the, this front end boards, which uh, has um, many steps to, to do the thing. It needs unmount the cooling plates, exchange the thing, put back, uh, test the leak, test the, all the parameters of the FEP. But uh, I mean, with the external contractor, you know, we are happy with the work which is ongoing in the it was, was ongoing in the raid more than 50 FEPs per week. And afterwards the FEPs are reinstalled back to the detector because we don't have enough space in the lab to, to keep the, them all. Um, so uh, now how, how this uh, new board looks like or what was needed to have uh, the expected performance is not only to develop uh, our custom ADC because we, we required very low power consumption. We were, we were simply adding the boards to the front end crate, which has already quite some power and we were not able to, to increase it too much. Another part which was very interesting or for development was the optical transceiver because there is no commercial modules or were not available at the time where we were planning this. And we had only, we had less than six millimeters space on the board available. And the typical height of the optical transceiver is around 14 millimeters. So we have developed the uh, our uh, transceivers, and they are uh, multiplexing the, the the ADC channels in the from the board and uh, use the five gigabit links. Um, and there is twenty such modules, two channels modules per digitizer board. All this work is already work going on, uh, uh, and then um, uh, the data are should be passed to the digital processing system, which some characteristics you see here. And uh, this system needs to reconstruct the ET time and transmit all this to the, uh, to the level one trigger system. The, the, the whole thing needs to work as it is triggered with a very strict latency limit for the computations around five or six bunch crossing. And we are currently investigating different uh, filtering options to get the maximum performance. So the status of the work, one can see on such diagram, we chose uh, four faces of, of our calorimeters. And with the different coloring code, the status of the individual crates. 
basically the barrel A side is now fully completed with all boards back, uh, everything cabled and already tested. In the uh, uh, end cup A and barrel C, we have mostly board front and boards back. Uh, some parts are also cabled, but we are missing there the digitizer boards and, and cabling still. And the refurbishment work of the FEPS is still ongoing on the on the end cup C side currently. Um, so we were able to keep our system running despite the COVID lockout and even some people were able to bring their test setup to home. So the firmware and software development was not interrupted and we resumed the installation in Atlas Cavern uh, in mid-May. So most of the uh, hardware components are either produced or the production should be finished after the summer. Another very tedious task was to route uh, many optical fibers in the already full Atlas cable trays and bring the signals to the to the counting room, but uh, it was achieved at the end. And you see now in, in, the, in the photos, some examples of the backend installation uh, in, the, in the counting room. And um, as well as for these front end boards, we have um, all the hardware already produced. And we are starting now the integration tests and commissioning on the real system. Uh, recently also the, the Felix servers, which are the common uh, CERN product for the control monitoring and, and duct, providing a duct has um, started. And we, the lower photo here uh, shows the connection of the all LTDBs from the barrel A to the Felix server. So we can now, control and read out the big chunk of our detector already. And in recent milestone week um, uh, in Atlas data taking, we achieved uh, the, uh, the goal to run the full chain of the phase one hardware up to deliver the data to the Atlas centrally recorded events. So we could be sure that the, the pieces which we are installing now and we are commissioning are working fine. Uh, of course, the preparations for the run uh, three are not only the phase one trigger upgrade, but we need to refurbish and improve all our infrastructure and uh, what it concerns uh, offline software, which uh, need to be migrated to the multi-threaded environment because these high pileup um, you know, uh, events uh, in the run three will need too many memory for the reconstruction. So this was already done for our detector specific code and it's extensively testing now. The similar we need to do with all the data quality infrastructure uh, monitoring and similar tools, which uh, help us to keep a very high quality of uh, our data. So that's also basically migration to the multi-threaded environment and the testing currently. Uh, we also need to- We have one minute left. Yes, I, I will one slide more to uh, migrate the online software where the main task now is the inclusion of all the packages which are needed to work with the new newly built phase one trigger elements. And similarly for the detector and control systems which are now integrating all the new delivered hardware. So in conclusion, uh, our liquid argon calorimeter achieved the excellent performance during the run two. And in order to keep it also in the harsher environment in the run three, we uh, are refurbishing all whole infrastructure software wise and uh, workflow and data, data taking wise. And as well, we are successfully installing and commissioning the phase one upgrade uh, creating a digital trigger 
which should uh, allow us um, to keep our performance. And despite no major delays were developed during the lockdown, so we should be ready to in, in time and ready tested for the LHC restart. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions to Pyle? So uh, 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 let me ask some uh, question. Uh, 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 about, uh, after your modification, uh, uh, do you expect to improve some improvement of performance? Or it just will be the same? No, it, I mean, it will not improve the reconstruction itself. It will only improve the triggering uh, efficiency. I mean, or better say, our trigger will stay efficient, equally efficient also in higher pileup uh, environment. And uh, it should be also, uh, or will be also used uh, in the after phase two upgrade in the uh, H high Lumi LHC, a so-called lever zero trigger for, for the new triggering full digital trigger system. So the, the performance of the detector itself, we expect to stay the same. Okay. Uh, I don't see other questions. So thanks. Thank you. Pavel, so let's move to uh, next presentation performance of Atlas type colorimetry for Sergei. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you, but we cannot see your slides. Yes, it seems to be a problem. I cannot share them. Is it possible to share somehow? Uh, yes, give me give me a second. I will try to download them and share them. Just a second. Oh, okay, many thanks. Okay, <clears throat> many thanks. Can you see them? Uh, not right now, but uh, oh. okay. I see them right now. Uh, is it possible to make them? Uh, uh, give me, yeah, give me, give me a second. I, I uh, okay. A bit mess. Uh, uh, Okay, just a second, please. Uh, Control L. -L. Then you can press F5. Yeah. Mm. F5, and now. I think it's control and L. Okay, let's 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 try this. Okay, now it's much better. Uh, many thanks. So I would like to present uh, the status about 
performance of uh, the Atlas style colorimeter. Next slide, please. Uh, the tile colorimeter is central Catronic colorimeter in the Atlas detector, which measures Catrons, jets, missing transfers energy, and provides input to level one colorimeter trigger and assist in MION identification. As one can see from the top plot, it consists of uh, three barrels, one long hop barrel and two extended barrels, and uh, each of them is divided into 64 modules. It is sample colorimeter with iron plates as passive material and plastic scintillating tiles as active medium. Each uh, uh, tile is read out by two PMT uh, from each edge, as one can see on the bottom left plot, uh, via uh, wavelength shifting fibers. And uh, there are about 10,000 uh, readout channels, uh, which will give uh, about 5,000 cells, which are formed by grouping uh, fibers into bunch and connecting it to the same PMT. The cell, level, cell layout one can see on the bottom right plot <coughs> for one half of long barrel model and one Extended barrel module, one can see here three layer, layers in depth like A, B, C, and D, and one layer of E cells. The aim for jet energy resolution is given by formula at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. On this slide, it, one can see signal processing and calibration tail colorimeter. So signal from PMT is shaped, amplified into gains, low and high gains with uh, the ratio of 64 to one and digitized uh, each 25 nanoseconds. Upon receiving tri trigger decision, amplitude and time are reconstructed from seven uh, consecutive measurements like it is presented uh, uh, by formula in red color, in blue color, with so-called optimal filtering algorithm. The energy is evaluated from amplitude using calibration coefficients, like it is shown uh, by formula in red color. Uh, the first calibration factor is provided by charge injection system, which monitors electronic chain stability and linearity. Uh, the second one is uh, actually electromagnetic scale, which was measured and fixed in, in special test bin campaigns. And third one is provided by cesium calibration system, which monitors all optic uh, components like tiles, fibers, and PMTs. And the last one is provided by laser calibration system, which monitors PMT stability. As one can see from the bottom plot, uh, the pass of different calibration system uh, partially overlaps, and that allows uh, cross-checking of different calibration systems. Next slide, please. Charge injection calibration system injects a signal of known charge and measures the electronic response. It is spanning full ADC range from zero to 800 picocoulomb. In such a way, it provides the possibility to probe two gains for each channel and allows to extract the conversion factor from a DC count to picocoulomb. And one can see from the right plot uh, uh, distribution of this uh, calibration factor for low gain uh, from whole uh, tile colorimeter. Calibration is performed about weekly during special calibration runs. Precision is about 0.7% and time stability is 0.03% uh, as one can see from the left uh, plot, where is it to show uh, time evolution of calibration factor for whole run to period. It is also used to calibrate analog level one calorimeter trigger. Next slide, please. Uh, the cesium calibration uses uh, a movable uh, cesium radioactive source, which uh, passes through the calorimeter body. It is done two or three times per year in run two in special cesium runs. It uses independent integrator readout uh, which during source moment, which integrates the signal in time window about 10 milliseconds. Deviation of the cell response in time is caused by PMT gain variation and scintillator degradation, and this converted in additional calibration factor. On the 
right plot one can see maximum drift as it is seen by cesium systems over whole uh, run to period uh, for different uh, cell types uh, as function of eta and the left plot one can see the time evolution uh, of this calibration factors uh, not calibration factors but down drift uh, in both cases, uh, they are corrected for cesium decay. As one can see, maximum drift is uh, in layer A, which is the closest to the collision point. Precision in typical cell is about 0.3%, and that allows to adjust PMT gain by changing high voltage to restore calorimeter response uniformity. Next slide, please. Uh, laser calibration system uh, sent a controlled amount of light into each PMT. It is performed about weekly during special calibration runs and uh, in empty bunches during collisions to monitor and calibrate timing. It measures the drift seen in PMT with respect to the last cesium scan. And uh, this uh, drift is converted in addition, into additional calibration factor. And uh, time evolution of this average PMT drift, one can see on the right plot over whole run to period. And uh, for different cell types, one can see on the left plot. Precision is better than 0.5%. Uh, and maximum drift is observed in A and E still cells, which are the cells with highest energy deposits. Next slide, please. Uh, minimum bias systems uh, measures the response to minimum bias events. It uh, shares the same readout with cesium systems, but uh, integrates the signal uh, during data taking. It also monitors the full optical chain and also calibrate E, e cells and uh, minimum bias trigger uh, scintillators because uh, cesium uh, calibration systems are not available for these uh, cells. Uh, on the left uh, plot, one can see the typical signal uh, for different uh, cell types as a function of eta. And uh, on the right plot, one can see that measured signals uh, depends on the inst instantaneous luminosity linearly. And that provides an additional way to measure and monitor the instantaneous luminosity in Atlas. Next slide, please. Uh, comparing uh, different calibration systems allows to get additional information because cesium and uh, minimum bias systems see PMT gain drift and uh, scintillator aging, while in the same time the laser system only monitors PMT gain drift. And the differences between laser and minimum bias measurements can be interpreted as uh, scintillator aging due to irradiation. And one can clearly see this effect on the bottom plots, the left one from 2016 and the right one from 2017. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, time calibration is very important uh, for cell energy reconstruction. It sets the phase so that uh, particle traveling from the interaction point at the speed of light gives the signal with measured time equal to zero. Time calibration is calculated using jets and monitored with laser, as one can see from the right plot, uh, the reconstructed mean uh, cell time over whole run to period is very good. Uh, I mean, the stability is very good and resolution is better than one nanosecond for cells with energy greater than for GV as one can see this uh, from the right plot. Next slide, please. Total noise per cell and calorimeter comes from two sources. The first one is electronic noise, which is measured uh, regularly in special runs without signal in detector. And the second one comes from uh, multiple interaction in the same or neighboring events and called pileup noise. As one can see from the right plot, electronic noise is below 20 MeV for most of the calorimeter cells. And uh, total noise is increasing with pileup as one can see from the right plot. 
the largest noise in the region with highest exposure, A and E cells. Next slide, please. Uh, monitoring of data quality includes uh, identifying and masking uh, problematic channels, monitoring data corruption, other hardware issues, uh, correcting uh, miscalibration and timing. The identified issues are fixed during maintenance campaigns, and that allows good recovery of the system, as one can see from the right plot. Overall, data Quality efficiency is about 99.7% during round two. And uh, on the uh, right plot, one can see distribution of masked uh, cells uh, at the end of round two period. The red line corresponds to switched off module due to cooling problem. Next slide, please. Uh, the ratio of calorimeter energy at electromagnetic scale to track momentum for isolated charge hadrons is used to probe hadronic response. It is measured in minimum bias events. And uh, as one can see from the left plot, the average E over P is uh, 0.67. Uh, and it is expected to be below unity due to the non-compensating nature of the sampling calorimeter. And as one can see from the right plot, uh, data and Monte Carlo simulation do agree well within 5%. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, we have one minute left. Oh, okay, thank you. Mions from cosmic uh, rays are used to study in situ the electromagnetic scale and the calorimeter cell intercalibration. Cell response is estimated as energy deposited by the muon per length of the track pass. As one can see from the right plot, uh, the distribution in phi is very good. And uh, as one can see from the right plot, the response non-uniformity in it is below 5%. Next slide, please. And that is uh, just conclusion. Tau parameter is an important part of Atlas detector which measures uh, hadrons, jets, and missing pronouns e energy. A set of calibration system is used uh, to monitor and calibrate the signal uh, at each, uh, each stage. Intercalibration and uniformity and monitored with isolated charge hadrons and high momentum cosmic neurons. The stability of absolute energy scale at the cell level is better than 1% during round two. And the overall all data quality efficiency is 99.7% in round two. That's it from my side. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, question to Sergei. Okay, I don't see any hands. So may I ask, uh, 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 you, you showed that according to your CSI, uh, cesium calibration, uh, uh, you have a degradation of uh, light output. And, uh, uh, do you have some uh, uh, recovery during shutdown? Uh, I don't. Uh, we uh, actually we have recovery only in PMT gain variation, not in the scintillator degradation. And since it uh, by cesium it see both, uh, probably something can be seen as a recovery, but. Uh, But uh, okay. so, so uh, for PMT, you observed some recovery of performance. Yes, one can see on the, I think, uh, comparing uh, different calibration systems uh, on this plot. Okay, uh, probably on even on this one, one can see that during uh, non collision period, we see uh, PMT updrift. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Okay, so thanks.
for your presentations. Let's move to the next presentation. It's a, a presentation a performance of Atlas uh, RPC detector and L1 million barrel trigger at square root of S, 13 GV, cooling hum. Please go ahead. Yes, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so let's start. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Kuning Han and my talk is uh, performance of uh, Atlas RPC detector and the uh, level one neon barrel trigger at uh, central mass of 13 TeV. So page two is, uh, is the introduction. So in the Atlas experiment, the muon is an important signature and its efficient selection is crucial to a lot of physics program. The right plot is even display of the Z edge candidate in two electron and two muon final state. The two right trucks represent the muons. In order to select the events containing muons, the level one muon battle trigger system is using uh, resistive plate chambers, which is placed uh, in three concentric uh, double layers shown in the left uh, figures. The muon candidates uh, uh, are selected using six PT thresholds, while the minimal one is uh, 40 V. Page three is a brief introduction to Atlas resistive plate chambers. Uh, in the detectors, the RPCs cover a huge number of, of uh, amount of area around uh, 4,000 uh, square meters. In each RPC chambers, it consists of uh, two detect layers each with eta and phi radio panels. The bottom figures is, uh, is a schematic of Atlas RPC single layers. From these figures, you see that the two parallel uh, residual plates are separated by uh, two millimeters. And uh, the readout system is, uh, is, has uh, orthogonal eta and phi strips. Uh, and uh, in the gas volumes, uh, RPC use a mixture of uh, three gas and uh, it operates in a safe avalanche mode. The intrinsic resolution of RPC detector is around one nanosecond to have uh, a faster response. So, yeah, so, so in the following slides, I will present the, uh, uh, the RPC performance results obtained from the 2018 data. Uh, the, the, they use the probe muon from the bosom productions to avoid uh, partition files from the trigger. So page five is the first result for RPC cluster uh, heat multiplicity and the cluster size. So the left uh, plot uh, is showing the, the RPC cluster heat multiplicity distributions uh, averaged over all RPC modules. From the, the first beams, you see the a fraction of uh, 60 to 70% muons produce cluster with uh, single heat. And uh, the different uh, construction uh, between eta and phi panels will cause uh, small differences, uh, which is observed from this mean value between eta and phi panels. And then uh, the average cluster size values are calculated uh, for each modules and the president in the right side for the eta and phi view. Next page is uh, for the detect RPC detector efficiency. This uh, efficiency uh, is defined as a ratio of number of muons selected heat over uh, over all probe muons. The selection is, uh, is, is, is for the timing window and also the position cut uh, of, from the expected muon ex uh, impact point. Uh, the, the, as in addition, the gap efficiency is also measured including eta and phi strips. So the left plot shows uh, the, uh, the, the individual detector and the gas gap efficiency for one run. Most of gas gap have uh, very high efficiency uh, around 95%. The electronic efficiency leads to lower uh, average values for, for the eta and the phi panel efficiency. Filling all 2018 runs, it results as a functional time. So the good sta uh, sta uh, stability is observed in the, on the right side. Um, page seven, it's the RPC total time resolution measurement. So the diagrams in the top part, it shows the procedures in this measurement. The heat uh, time difference is computed by, by the heat, uh, 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 which uh, matched with the same muon track in two detect layers uh, uh, for eta of, uh, either eta or five views. Then a Gaussian function fit is applied to extract the width of distributions. And the left plot is an example fit for one eta eta strip pairs. And the, the, so we summarize the Gaussian width values for the entire RPC system and uh, 
shown in the right side. Uh, after dividing the square root of two, of, um, <coughs> the, the total time resolution is around 1.5 now second. And from this uh, mean value, the differences is come from the different uh, cluster size composition between eta and phi panels. The next uh, page is the, uh, the uh, is the intrinsic resolution of PC detector. The total time resolution includes uh, two components. One is the uh, intrinsic detector resolution, and the other is from the radar system. The diagram uh, shows the procedure for the electronic uh, resolutions measurement. So it's slightly different from the total one. So the time difference is using uh, eta and phi heats in the same gas volume, which observes the same uh, avalanche. The intrinsic part is canceled for uh, is canceled, and uh, the uh, and to the left plot is the the weighted average values uh, distribution for the electronic component uh, for for layer zero and the layer one also the combined cases, uh, uh, giving the, the comparable behaviors we choose the combined uh, result to extract the intrinsic uh, com uh, uh, component shown in the right part in in the right side. And, uh, uh, and after uh, dividing the square root of two, the intrinsic uh, resolution is around one nanosecond. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so then I was talking about this uh, RPC background counting rate uh, <laughs> is measurement, uh, which is dominated uh, by the secondary uh, particles. Uh, the background heat was selected in the time window preceding triggered bunch crossing. And the normalized uh, counting rate was calculated and plotted as a function of instantaneous luminosity uh, on the left side. Different colors represent uh, panels at three different radius. For all cases, uh, the linear dependency is observed, and uh, the right plot shows the differential counting rate at a given luminosity for one RPC uh, layer. The background counting rate changes with particle flex at the different eta and uh, radial positions. Page 10, it's the RPC current measurement versus uh, the luminosity for several uh, modules. So the, the, the left plot, so it shows the, the RPC current density for modules at, uh, at the different uh, eta positions of uh, one, three, and six. Each point uh, represents uh, one RPC panels. Uh, and the, in the right plot, it uh, shows uh, uh, it shows uh, the, diff, uh, the result for different uh, RPC size and the radial modules. So similar to the background counting rate results, the current skew, uh, skew linearly to luminosity and affected by the particle flux. And in the right plot, is, is there are some differences between the small and the large sector. It is due to the magnetic coil shielding and uh, the radius is, is slightly different. Combining this uh, uh, background uh, counting rates and the uh, current results, the affected avalanche chart is uh, estimated by their ratios. This parameter is uh, also a key to the performance. It depends on the electrical field and the gas mixture. The distribution of the average avalanche charts is shown on the left side, and the mean values of the of uh, thirty point four picocoulomb is in good agreement with the previous measurement. The right plot shows that the avalanche charge as a function of eta and phi position. The variations uh, is uh, uh, between different, uh, diff among different positions is due to the uh, high voltage and uh, fr uh, front end threshold settings. So the second part is, uh, is a level one muon better trigger performance. So page 13. So it, it is a good trigger timing performance require uh, uh, accurate timing calibrations of the RPC heads, which is uh, made in, uh, in step of 3.125 nanosecond. In one run of uh, Data 2015 uh, in the left plot showing the left plots about 99.7 percent of muon candidates are associated to the correct bunch crossings, and in the in the 2018 the fractions was around 99.6 percent in the on the right side and it remained stable during the data taking. Some of the runs uh, uh, have for lower uh, values is due to this lost trigger tower. And uh, so page 13 is the trigger efficiency results uh, uh, to, uh, to detect the muon is measured as a function of several parameters. So then so the left plot is showing, uh, so this, uh, the left plot shows the trigger efficiency as a function of, uh, uh, several, uh, of offline muon PT uh, for six uh, PT thresholds. And so, so the efficiency is limited by the geometric acceptance and uh, uh, gives uh, stable plateau values 
about 20 GV from the right plots is as function of the efficiency as function of the time. The, the efficiency to detect muon is 76% for low PD thresholds and smaller for, for high PD ones due to additional requirements. Here is the summary. Uh, again, the, the efficient uh, muon selection is very important to Atlas program. And many studies uh, have been done to monitor uh, RPC performance during the year. And uh, uh, so, so RPC, Atlas RPCs have uh, uh, been working with uh, excellent performance since the uh, uh, completion of the system in 20, uh, 2008. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions to Kunlin? Maybe, maybe I would like to ask uh, if you, if there is some plan of the upgrade of these chambers for high luminosity LAT. Yes, there are two parts. Once the new RPC uh, chambers will be installed, uh, like the, in the innermost uh, uh, stations, and the other is uh, for the high luminous high luminosity uh, RPC, they will it will, it will uh, justify a bit for the, the high voltage ratios uh, in order to get a safe. Uh, performance for the current RPCs. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, one more questions. Uh, you showed uh, the dependency of uh, background on luminosity. Uh, do you have uh, dependence of uh, other characteristics? For example, time resolution, is it changing with uh, increasing of background? No, I, I don't think I think we have done to that part. Okay. So you you didn't check or you don't expect or oh, I don't oh, we do not expect a large difference from this current result mm -hmm. actually. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. So let's move to other uh, presentation. Uh, Track-based muon system alignment of the CMS detector, Hong Yang Kim. Yes, can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah, so today I will present about the track-based muon system alignment of the CMS detector. So page two shows online. So I will introduce the CMS muon system for alignment and explain the trap-based muon alignment method. Then I will show you the physics validation result and then run three commissioning and someone will be there. Uh, so page three shows the CMS muon system for alignment. So in the better region, there are the DTs. The, the eta range is up to 1.2 and DT have five fields and each of here, the DT is arranged in the pool station. And the pool in chambers in the pool station can only measure the high direction of the track. And at the end cap region, there are the CFC, the uh, ETA region 0.92, 2 .4. And each handicap has a pool station and the uh, station just arranges the uh, rings and uh, it has up to three. Page four shows the track-based immune alignment method. So this track-based immune alignment method calculates immune residue. So the, this figure explains that. So we calculate the immune propagation track from the inner track or track to immune system and there is the two hit, one is the reconstruct position and other one is the predicted position. So if there are uh, the meta alignment of the immune shift, there will be the immune residue. So this TBMA technique is proven to efficient, robust and stable in run one, run three, run two. And we, uh, consider the all possible systematic uncertainties and then we improve the depth. 
And muon system alignment is very important for the muon reconstruction. And this TBMA has a good occurrence order of 100 micrometer. So tomorrow there is the track alignment of the Shemans detector. So if you have interesting, please attend that. It will uh, cover the details of the Shemans inner track alignment. So page five will show the alignment uh, input. So we selected the global muon, the pit range is 30 GB to 200 GB. For, so minimum PT selection, uh, we to ensure the scat less scattering and higher PT 200 GB we, to ensure the less showering. And we also selected only good quality muon trap. So it required MS 10 hit in the inner tracker. And we required the MS2 muon chamber matched with the muon. And then we also selected the, the muon track by chi scale and impact parameter TFY. Uh, here, uh, we, this figure explains the PDSR selection criteria. So the muon can scatter before the muon chamber, then it makes a smearing. So this case is fine. The, any direction inside the chamber, then it just uh, uh, make a larger muon residual distribution. But in this case, the one direction can be outside the chamber and then make some bias, geometrical bias. So to remove this bias, we are using the PD share selection. Uh, page six uh, explain the uh, muon chamber theory of freedom. So this figure shows the DT and JSC, they are local uh, alignment parameters, X, Y, G, and the rotation of X, Y, G direction. So the TBMA, the uh, effectively the minimizes the, the residual with these six parameters. So for GT, there is residual X and Y, and CSC, there is the, the residual R pi instead of X. And local X and R pi are in, in the global coordinate, they are pi direction, and it is the most sensitive direction in the PT resolution. Page seven shows the accuracy plot. Uh, these two plots, uh, shows the interest luminosity and the chamber position RMS. So after two inverse pentaban, the RMS distribution getting the saturation. So we re recommend NS2 inverse pentaban for the this muon alignment. And the accuracy depends on the detector position and time. So the it, so you can see the difference the real number and station one and four. Uh, page A summarized the run to performance. So during the run to the muon alignment, try to uh, solve the weak mode problem. And also we try to qualify the precision order of 100 micrometer per linear DOF and 0.1 million radian for the angular DOF. And last year we performed the run to legacy alignment. We did the update and improved the tracker legacy geometry and we made some detailed interval. So before we have only one alignment per year, but now we have three alignments per year. And we can also perform with a higher integrated luminosity. And the CSC every year, the end cap it was opened. So we need some special the, the alignment for the CSC. I will explain it details later. So after alignment, <clears throat> we need to check the performance with the physics validation. So I will show uh, the legacy geometry result, the data collected at the beginning of 16, 17, 18, PP collision with a single muon trigger. And for the physics validation, we are using only global muon, the, which is the conscious track reconstruct the independently in a tracker and the muon system. So we selected the muon, global muon by inner tracker, eta and PT. And we calculated the muon environment with the two maths. 
method, the two global mean or global mean and standalone mean. And we calculate the mean PT resolution by the standalone mean PT and global mean PT. So when we are using the standalone mean part, it is very sensitive to mean alignment region. So this, this flow shows the invariant, diamond invariant mass and the mass width. So red dot and green dot, both one 17 data, same one, but red dot reconstructed with the 16 geometry. So at the high region, the mass was, mass and the mass width was changed due to long geometry. So because of the we opened the end cap, so it changed on the high Italian region. And page 10 explained the shape alignment. So the these two flow shows the R pi residue by the global pi position. So before alignment it shows the sinusoidal trend because the entire end cap was shifted. After that the uh, ledger became flat. So also this uh, effect to trigger also. So we did the some two special alignment, two step alignment. First step we shifted the entire disk and then we aligned the individual chamber. So finally we can get the displacement from initial geometry. So the third flow shows the step one plus the step two displacement. So we can also check the this effect by the physics validation. So this flow, first one shows the daimyo mass with the two global muon. The green dot is before the muon alignment and then red green is the after alignment. So it became flat. And also PT resolution, the blue one has larger uh, resolution with it, but after that alignment that the became the usual one. And we can see the a bit better the legacy geometry than the earlier geometry. Page 11 uh, shows the legacy geometry. So 16, 17, 18, Data and their uh, time math widths are stable and comparable. But at the high eta region, a bit unstable due to low statistics. So, page 12 explains the launch recommendation plan. So, CMS collaboration is toward the gem detector at station one. So, left figure red detector is the gem at the station one. And this gem improved the tracking and trigger performance with the CSC detector. So right flow shows the gem CSC bending angle calculation for the triggering. So that's why gem CSC alignment also very important to get the correct trigger. So I, there is a two gem talks if you have interesting, please attend that. And <clears throat> So muon alignment consider other uh, method to improve the weak mode problem and also improve the alignment itself. So we have a plan to use the beam halo and cosmic muon data set to improve two to topic. And we expect a large displacement of muon chambers during after LF2 because the opening end cap and many the TT chambers are extracted and reinstalled. But TBMA uh, methods support the iteration calculation, so we can expect a stable performance for the run three. And the cosmic muon data then can help the initial alignment before the collision. So page 13 is a summary. So the performance of the trapped muon alignment in the run two was robust and stable, and it supported the muon reconstruction and the CMS. So analysis used the many analysis used the muons, and run three workflow 
muon element has been prepared to include gems. And after run LS2, there will be large displacement of the muon chamber, but we have a plan to with the initially correct them with the cosmic ray muons and then the PP collision later with MS2 inverse pentagon. Yeah, yeah, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions to Hinang Yang? Uh, if I please. might, ah, uh, I would, uh, sorry, I would like to know if, uh, uh, how did you uh, cope with the systematic effects? Uh, so uh, did you have to, in the end, fix some degrees of freedoms for some modules or put additional constraints? Uh, so, of course, the uh, they're limited by the hard hardware resolution itself to the limited. And the other systematic uh, can be by the, the, the algorithm and <clears throat> the minimizer function. So, so it also related to the weak mode problem. So we did that and also we prepared the Monte Carlo simulation to understand the, the systematic uncertainty. So we mm -hmm. understand the, what is the, the systematic and their limit with the Monte Carlo study. Okay, thank you. And what is the uh, resolution of the modules? Like, interesting hit resolution? Uh, each DT, GSC, and their the, the station is different. But uh, I, I don't know the details, but you can see the, the reference. Uh, the, you can see the, them in the reference, yeah, here. I recommend the reference one explain the, the details about the million system. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Oh, okay, uh, you mentioned that you have uh, three alignments per year. Uh, what yeah. is the change during uh, from one uh, alignment to another? Uh, so we basically based on the track alignment. So if a track alignment uh, the changes the, the a lot, and then we we divide the the interval. So basically the. The track alignment has more detailed interval, but we we selected if the, the track alignment has changed their trend, then we we did the muon alignment for that interval. So you mean the change of alignment is uh, due to the uh, uh, new track alignment? Yes, correct. Because the this TBMA the mm -hmm. We are using the tracker, inner tracker track propagation to the muon system. So the muon system, their absolute position is not important, but the between the tracker muon system, they, their relevant position is important to reconstruct the muon track. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's move. Thank you once again. Let's move. Thank you. The next presentation, it's Mosen Nazari, small strip thin gap chamber and uh, electronic performance for the muon spectrometer upgrade of the Atlas experiment. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? And yes, we can hear. We can see your slides. You can see my slide. Okay. Uh, Okay, hello everyone. My name is Mohsen. Uh, 
it's my pleasure actually to be here to talk about about one of the well-defined projects for the Atlas experiments. So on behalf of the Atlas Mion collaboration, I'm going to talk about uh, a small thing gap chamber and also the electronic performance for the Mion uh, spectrometer uh, of the Atlas experiments. On the second slide, just as an introduction, you all know the, the, the motivation for upgrade of the LHC is actually to provide more uh, possibility for doing the standard model precise mission, but and also to extend uh, our sensitivity for the new physics search. To achieve this aim, uh, sequence of LHC upgrades are scheduled, for example, here the, the upgrade of the new uh, the small wheel during the long shutdown period. And we expect to call it to collect roughly 3000 uh, uh, inverse from to part of data by end of the LHC operation in 2037. Uh, why it's uh, mandatory to replace our current small wheel with the with the new one? So the present uh, wheel chamber will lose the efficiency at high rate, which we expect for the for the high luminosity phase, and this is because of the the higher instantaneous luminosity. Actually, the since the the current mean system only use the middle wheel for triggering, so it won't be able to hold such rate. And if you look at the right plot, you see a um, more- well, I'm sorry to disturb you, but I'm not seeing changing the slides. So I'm in a slide three. But we can we, we just front page. Yes. Oh. Maybe can you stop the sharing and maybe yes. you just don't share, don't share a full screen, but just a window of the well, what about application. Now? Now, now it's fine. Now it's fine? Yes, now I'm we see slide three. Yes, okay, good. Yeah, if you look at the, uh, the right plot, you see a large fraction of the single muon uh, one trigger currently originate from the forward region. And roughly 90% of the, the, this, the, this trigger actually are not originated from the, from the interaction point. And uh, this, uh, if you look at the, the left plot, you see the this uh, spurious trigger are fake muon, which mostly consists of the, the low energy particle, which are generated in the, the layer between the, the inner station and the, the middle station, where we have the, the troid magnet. Uh, on slide number four, the proposal solution for moderating the L1 trigger without raising the associated PT threshold is by improving the, the muon identification in the end cap region. So we are replacing the, our small wheel in the end cap with the new one. And uh, it has been this new small wheel, it has been designed in such a way to significantly reduce the fake level muon trigger. And we expect to have more than 90% 95% online uh, track reconstruction efficiency. To achieve this goal, some strict requirement for the new small wheel has been defined. For example, we require to have the excellent online angular spatial resolution less than one millirad, and we need to have the good uh, uh, and efficient performance at run three and beyond it. Uh, slide number five. The new small wheel is a disc shape arrangement of the, the detector module, which is made of eight large and eight small pie shaped sector. And uh, we use the two different technology to, to make this such wheel. So the micro megas detector, which are designed for precise uh, precision tracking and a small thin gap chamber, which are optimized for triggering. And each sector is made of two CGC wedges and two micro mega wedges. And slide number six, you just uh, I just bring this few words about the new small wheel uh, structure. As I said in my previous slide, we are using the CGC detector, and they are mainly used for triggering. But we all we all we also use them for the good tracking. This is because of the good timing resolution and also the small stereo pitch. And this detector will provide us the seven-fold increase in rejection rate for fake muon uh, triggers. 
And the micro megas detector are, will be mainly used for precise tracking. They, they are also used for, the, for triggering. And we, it will reach us to the, resolu the resolution less than, better than 100 micrometer, independent of the track incidence angle. And uh, a large collaboration has been established to construct uh, the, the quad. So the five countries, Canada, China, Chile, Israel, and Russia are involved to, uh, to construct a plenty of the a number of the, this quad for the, for the new small wheel. And, uh, and this slide and also the next slide, I will mainly, mainly focus on the SDGC detector. The SDGC, uh, chamber is a multi-wire proportional chamber, as you see on the uh, systematic uh, diagram. The, the wire, an array of the wire are sandwiched between the two, ca two cathode board. On the top cathode board, we have the, the, the pad uh, uh, channel, and on the, the top side, we have the, the strip copper channels. And this CGC chamber are operated with the mixture of the CO2 and, and pentane. And when the particle goes through the detector, the ionization part product induces a current on the, on the wire pad and strips. And we will use these three uh, uh, channel as the active channels to, to get the data. Uh, to produce the, the high quality uh, CGC module, so we need to to finish the, the different uh, stuff to complete uh, the, the quad the chamber. For example, we start from the graphite spraying where we uh, spray the, the cathode board and anode board. Then after the winding the, the pad board, we close the gaps. And, and after the closing gap, we assemble the doublets. And by merging the doublet, we will have the, the quad droplet. And for each of these uh, steps, we have the, the quality test, which is done in different construction sites. For example, high voltage tests are completed at different stage to just to identify the, the any leakage current or a spar. And one of the, 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 the important step is X-ray scan, which is done in the single gap stage too. We do this test to measure the gain uniformity and also to probe the internal structure of the gap which uh, I have shown here on the, on the right plot. You see, if you look at the, the gain uh, uh, uniformity plot, uh, we can prove the structure. Here you see the, the, the structure of the wire support and bottom and also the, 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 the level of the, the gain. And one of the other the check which we do in the construction site is the cosmic ray test. So we use the, the custom triggering, I mean the, the scintillator just to record the hits. And these tests are conducted to check the, the efficiency maps. And also we can check the resolution and means alignment correction using such tests. And on top of this, the noise measurement can be also performed uh, by using such setup. For example, on the left plot, you see the two-dimensional efficiency of the strip channel for one of the QS3 gaps. And on the right side, you see number of the cosmic muon, which is counted for the one of the, for the QS3 gap. Uh, and if you look at the right plot on the corner, we have the less number of the, the counting of the, the heat. This is because of the, the limited coverage of the scintillator on the edge. And once we complete the quad, these quads are sent to CERN. And at CERN, we merge uh, the crew qu three quad, we clue three quad to each other to assemble them to the wedge. And uh, after making the wedge, so we put the Faraday cage just to prevent the, any interference from the outside to the detector. And, and after that, the, we installed the electronic and once we finish the, the electronic component, I mean the installation, they are integrated to the to the micro detector to to make the sector and also the the wheel. And at CERN, we also have some quan quality control, which uh, are carried out at every step of the assembly. For example, we have the readout connectivity test to check the connectivity of all the strip or pad and the wire channels. And one of the, the, the most critical uh, measurement is a stability test, which is done under high radiation using the one uh, isotopic of the cesium, which radiates the, the gamma rays. So we use the G++ facility to do the, such tests. And there are some other, uh, other quality tests, for example, long-term high voltage tests, 
when we construct the wedges. Uh, um, so oh, on slide 14, so as I mentioned before, the, precise, the precision requirements are challenging to achieve. Therefore, beam test uh, experiments have been performed to check the quality of the detector. For example, on the left plot, you see the, uh, the STGC pad chart distribution for different level of the, the background photon rate, which is measured using a, a MION beam in the presence of the high rate uh, photon background. And, all, on the, and also on the right plot, you see the, the result of the, the, also the chart distribution for as a function of the, the, the high, uh, high voltage. And for both plots, you see that we, we have the good discrimination with suppression of the noise from, the, uh, from, the, from our signals. And one of the other uh, measurement, which is, uh, has been performed at CERN using the, our test beam setup is spatial resolution as a function of the applied high voltage. To extract the resolution, so we uh, distribute, we, we, uh, we estimate the res residual distribution. The, the residual uh, are decoupled to different component, to, to, to two different components. For example, the inclusive residual for a layer of interest uh, is defined at the position difference between the layer space point and the position of the track, which is reconstructed using from the other layer. And the exclusive residual are obtained the same way, but they're reconstructing the track without the space point of the layer of the interest. And if you look at the right plot, for, for example, for the 2.8 kilovolt, uh, which is the, the operational mode of the STGC detector, uh, we have the resolution less than 100 uh, uh, micrometer. Uh, and this resolution is within the, the current MION momentum resolution in the end cap uh, for, the, for the MION with 1 TeV uh, GeV as a PT. And uh, the STGC, uh, the, the, the pad uh, channel are used for the triggering. So to to implode them for the triggering purpose, uh, the pad layer are staggered to make the logical pad tower. And uh, this, uh, the triggering using the pad are, are um, completed in two different, uh, two independent steps. In the first step, three out of four layer with the heat required for the single wedge trigger. And the final decision will be based on the geometrical matching between the two wedge trigger which we have in the, in the outer layer of the, the STGC modules. And- uh, I'm sorry, you have one minute left. For... Yes, yeah. Uh, the, um, they are also used to define a region of interest that determine which group of strip need to be read out in order to obtain the, the precise measurement of the, uh, from the strips. And as a conclusion, the new small wheel is essential for Atlas to maintain high trigger efficiency and momentum resolution in the high pileup and the high radiation environment of the high luminosity LHC. The installation of the front end electric on the wedge is ongoing well. And the STGC quadruplet production is underway at all construction sites. So it is complete for side A, uh, for one side of the detector, uh, and well underway for the, for the other side. And the integration at CERN is, is progressing very well. And we have already uh, completed four small STGC wedges with electronic and, uh, and uh, all NSWA a large wedges have, have to be ready to install in, in sector by end of the January 2021. And the other side of the detector, I mean the NSWC side has to be complete by October 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, questions to Mohsen? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I, yes. Yeah, thanks for this nice talk. Maybe I just have a naive question. So you've mentioned that the wires have uh, more coarse uh, resolution for the position compared to the strips. But they seem to be more closely spaced. So maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding then why the strips are more precise than the wires. No, 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 no. I, I just wanted to say we will we, we will use the wire for the for the for the measurement of the five uh, coordinated 
not uh, more precisely. If I understand your question. Okay, yes. No, I, I see that's your point. You're saying that the strips and wires they observe in two orthogonal views. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, other questions? Oh, okay, I, I, uh, uh, on slide 15, you showed the dependence of resolution on, of, on high voltage. Uh, what is your working point? Is 2.8? Yes, for the STGC detector, we actually with the, for the quality test, we will use the different level of the high voltage, but the operation mode will be 2.8 kilovolt, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, increasing of high voltage uh, leads to some instability or? Yeah, so, so, yeah, so that's why we have decoupled the residual distribution to the inclusive and exclusive. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's move to the next talk. Uh, of uh, cosmic result with the final gas sector for the Atlas Milan upgrade for Gabriel. Okay, we can see your slide. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, uh, okay. So uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Gabriel Rabanal Bolaños and I'm going to talk about the cosmic results with the final micro mega sectors for the Atlas Neon upgrade. Uh, so this is the outline of this talk. I'm going to talk uh, about the Nismal wheel, the cosmic array test stand and everything we measure with it. So on slide three, upgrading the Atlas Neon detector. So as you heard during the previous talk, the end cap detectors of the Atlas Neon spectrometer will be upgraded. And the places where the end caps are, are shown here in, in, um, in red. Uh, as you can see, um, uh, the play, so um, we have site A and site C. The upgrade is not needed for the upcoming run three of, of the LHC, but will be needed for the high luminosity LHC. According to the Nismo wheel te the technical design report, the TDR, the Nismo wheel uh, is expected to work at up to 15 kilohertz per square centimeter at a zero rapidity of 2.7 and a speech resolution of 100 microns or better is needed for a momentum resolution better than 10% at one TeV, which is the resolution of the current small wheel. And you can see in the bottom right side um, uh, how we need different sizes of detector chambers for overlap. These are called small modules and large modules, SM and LM. Now on the next slide, slide four, we have the tracking technology of the new small wheel. So the previous talk uh, was about the, the triggering chamber. So this is about the tracking. So this is a comparison of the tracking technologies of the small wheel at the left and the new small wheel at the right. So on the left side, you can see there's a cross section of the monitor drift tubes, MDTs, which are still used in the rest of the muon spectrometer. And on the right side, there's a cross section of the micro megas detector, MM. So uh, the micro megas detector is a planar, has a planar cathode and then a thin metallic micro mesh and the gas between these two is, uh, works as an ionization region because there's a gas here. The gas is a mixture of argon and, 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 and carbon dioxide. And the electric field here drifts the electrons towards the mesh. And then this region here is the amplification gap where we have the avalanche. So when a muon passes through, you can see there's ionization and then an avalanche here. And, there, and we, there, here we have the read of electrodes. So the electric field here in the amplification region is about 10 times stronger than in the drift gap. So the comparison is like this. So for the MDTs, the tube diameter is two centimeters, but for the micro megas, the strip pitch is 400 microns and the strip width is 300 microns. So we have smaller numbers here. This allows us to have better resolution. The maximum drift time of the MDTs is 700 nanoseconds, whereas for the micro megas, it's in the order of 100 nanoseconds. And the MDTs are used for precision tracking and the micro megas is used for precision tracking, but also as a trigger. So in addition to the SDGCs that were discussed in the previous talk. So in the next slide, we have the goals of the cosmic ray test stand that we have at CERN. Uh, so complete the final electronics integration of the cham of each um, micro megas double wedge or chamber, which looks like a pie slice. Uh, test the, the data acquisition system, measure noise rate, high voltage, gas leaks, spark rate, sample the efficiency, get a sense of the resolution as well, and test a real detector with real neons. 
So on slide six, we have, um, a, this is a cross section of a nismal wheel chamber with a muon passing through the nismal wheel here, uh, through the trigger chambers in orange, and then the micromegas layers in green, which is the, the topic of this talk. On the right side, we have the different types of micromegas layers with the orientations of the strips in, in red here. Uh, so we have the so-called eta layers that measure the precision coordinate in eta, the pseudo rapidity, and also these other stereo layers that are tilted 1.5 degrees with respect to the eta layers to gather phi information. So on slide seven, we have the cosmic ray test stand at CERN. Uh, so seven out of 16 small chambers, SM, were tested with cosmic muons with no minimum muon momentum. Each small chamber consists of two modules, SM1 and SM2, that are also shown below. And we have pairs of scintillators above that make a trigger with a frequency of about 100 hertz and partially cover the chamber below. So you can, you can see here on the left, a side view of the cosmic ray test stand with the scintillators on top that we use for triggering on cosmic muons and the chamber below. And on the right side, there's a bird's eye view. So a view from above with the chamber here in green and the scintillators above, above it. It's worth noting that the scintillators do not cover the chamber uniformly. So this, they cover mostly the central part and this will be seen later today. So our setup is not optimal for measuring high momentum muons due to the absence of an absorber and scintillators below the chamber. So in the next slide, slide eight, we have the baseline electronic noise. So on the left side, we can, there's a, an event display. The axes are not at scale. So we can see a, a cosmic particle creating a track by um, inducing charge in eight layers. So this red line is a reconstructed track, uh, but also there's noise hits in different layers as you can see here. So the, the first thing we do is to measure the noise. So on the right hand side, there's an example of a baseline noise per strip measured in one front end board, which you can see in, uh, here, uh, strip number in the X axis and here the baseline noise. This is for hundred measurements and from, the, from this, we can get the spread, the root mean squared, which is about 2.5 millivolts. And the, this RMS, this unit of the spread of the noise is used to set up the signal threshold, RMS, RMS times two, RMS times three, et cetera, because uh, it, this changes from strip to strip. Once we measure the noise, uh, then we have to, we can set up the strip threshold to decide when, when we get a signal. So, but, but first we have to try different thresholds to see how everything goes. So in order to trigger a noise, we delay the single signal from one scintillator. So we delay to avoid cosmic muons, and this is our trigger. So the hardware threshold that we set must be selected first low enough to get a signal, but also high enough to keep the noise below the predicted hit rate at a high Lumi LHC, which is one kilohertz per strip. So on the right side, we have the electronic noise versus hardware threshold um, measured in, in units of baseline RMS. And the noise rate falls as a function of the threshold. Given that we want our noise rate to be lower than the high luminosity LEC rate, we have to sit below this red line. And right now we are testing this set, this setup, which is RMS times nine. And the effective charge threshold is 2.5 pentacolons. So this is an approximation of our current uh, charge threshold per strip. So now that we set up the, the uh, threshold, we can uh, read, read uh, our uh, cosmic uh, tracks and we can C plus like this, this is a, a plot of cluster charge. So first we have a simple clustering algorithm known as Pac-Man that is used to group neighboring strips into clusters and that are used to find tracks. But due to the high strip threshold that we have to set in order to have low noise, then we get single strip clusters as you can see in this arrow pointing to this peak here. Uh, also you can see the way, the, the, the place where it starts to rise, which is, which is the threshold at about 2.5 pentacolons, which is expected. And also for a straight down tracks, we expect on average three strip clusters. So what this means, this means that uh, these uh, single strip clusters are because we're not getting all the charge from a cosmic particle because we're setting such a high threshold, but they do have an important contribution to the overall tracking and efficiency calculation. So we cannot get rid of them. So we have to use, it, use them also. So on slide 11, we have uh, tracks, which are the physics objects. On, on the left, you can see again, another example of a track going through the eight layers. And on the right side, we have a track map, a track map of um, you know, one layer, one micromegas layer that we, that we make when you consider all the points crossed by tracks that are reconstructed with at least five layers. 
The main point of this plot is to show that our data is biased towards the center of the chamber because of the scintillator acceptance. On slide 12, uh, this is a summary of the high voltage configuration. Each micromegas layer has 16 high voltage sections, as you can see in this picture, 16 pieces. So the TDR had 600 volts as the nominal high voltage, but due to sparking, the new nominal high voltage was uh, set to 570 volts for the amplification gap. So, and if a high voltage section sparks at a high rate, then its voltage is, is lowered and lowered and or turned off. So, so here on the left side, we can, we can see an example of a possible configuration with one high voltage section at 550 volts, for instance, in orange and everything else good. And for, sorry, for seven small chambers tested in the cosmic ray test stand, roughly 89.6% are at nominal high voltage. This is not a, this is fine because even if you have, if we have uh, sections that are not at nominal high voltage, we have eight layers, right? So if one small section does not work properly, we have other seven remaining layers that allow us to, to reconstruct a track. So this is, this is fine, we can, this is workable. So on slide 13, um, how we measure the efficiency with a tag and probe approach. So first we exclude the layer I, we blind it, then we fit a line using the remaining seven layers. If a track is found, this is a tag. If, and then we unblind this layer, and if a cluster is found within a window of the track projection, then this cluster is a probe. The allow window is five millimeters for eta layers and 10 millimeters for steel layers. And the efficiency is just the number of probes divided by the number of tags, which is a counting process. On slide 14, we have the efficiency. So here's an example of a micromegas efficiency map for a layer at nominal high voltage, which is 570 volts. On the left, we have a two-dimensional plot where you can see the efficiency in the fiducial region of one micromegas layer with red uh, equals uh, an efficiency of zero and green, green an efficiency of one. And on the right side, we see the same layer, but this is, this is the same layer, but this is a, just a 1D uh, projection. So the same x-axis. Uh, which shows the efficiencies and the error bars. So here the axis is different. It's the axis is from 0 0.9 to one. So we, you, we can see better the error bars in the data. So now this, um, so since some of, since this is just for one, uh, one micromegas layer with, with good high voltage, then we have to study how the efficiency changes when we have lower voltages because, because we have sparking and we have to lower the high voltage. So we make high voltage studies, uh, which is uh, this. So this is a, a plot of a micromegas efficiency versus amplification voltage, high voltage, for small chambers tested with cosmic muons. So we have many lines in this plot, and this is because these are the results of various layers that could all hold nominal high voltage without sparking. This allowed us to, to lower or raise the high voltage at will. And this gives us a sense of the dependence of the efficiency of a good layer as a function of a high voltage. So um, at the very bottom in blue, we have the percentage of high voltage sections that are at each high voltage configuration for the seven small chambers that have been tested so far. So here we can see 89.7, 89.6% are at 570 volts, which have like a, a nominal efficiency of about 94 to 96%. But even if, you, so if you lower it up to like 550, then efficiency is about 80% or more. And if you, so, uh, sorry, again, so, I want, I want to repeat again, this is not a problem. This is fine as long as the sections with low high voltage do not overlap on top of each other. Because remember we have eight layers. So if one high voltage section has low voltage or is turned off due to sparking, we have seven remaining layers that do the tracking. And we never have more than two high voltage sections turned off that are overlapping each other. And on slide 16, we have the residuals. So an unbiased residual uh, is defined as the distance between the intersection of a track with a layer, but creating by blinding that layer. So not looking at what uh, any, any cluster in the layer. And then the center of the closest cluster in said layer, if any. So on, at the left hand side, you see the plot that I showed earlier, uh, showing how we blind one layer to find the track with the remaining layers. And then we find the residual of the cluster in this layer with respect to said track. And on the right hand side, there's, this, is, this is a sample of the distribution of all such residuals. But this is for tracks whose incident angles are less than five degrees. So this is mostly vertical um, tracks uh, that go perpendicular to the chamber. So that we were testing. So it is centered at, so, oh, sorry. So it is centered at zero 
And it has a Gaussian-like spread, which is expected from a tracking detector. And you can see a simple Gaussian fit in red. It is worth noting that the spread of this distribution is not only the resolution, but this also includes the effect of multiple scattering and extrapolation error. So the two, the two resolution of the chambers are actually a work in progress and need further investigation. And so and finally, um, on slide 17, a complete electronics integration with the final chambers has been done with cosmic rays and it works. Seven small chambers out of the 16 were tested with cosmic muons at CERN. And, and no large chambers were tested yet at CERN. Uh, we determined many sections how many sessions hold high voltage and the efficiency of each layer was measured. And also the projected time for this, as per the latest Nismo Wheel review meeting on, 20, on July 20th, was that the commissioning of the Nismo Wheel Site A is projected to finish by May 2021 and the Nismo Wheel Site C by October 2021. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, question to Gabriel. Uh, okay, I have a question uh, 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 about sparking. Uh, as I understand, the sparking is quite uh, critical. Do you observe some changing uh, of sparking rate with time? A change of sparking rate with time? Uh, so I, I don't think I don't I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, as as far as you know, they have a very we have a very dynamic definition of sparking. Uh, so right now, if anything goes ab above forty nano amperes, and then that's considered a spark, and then we, we start measuring how many sparks per minute we have. If the spark is more than five per minute, I think then we lower the voltage. But I, I, I don't know the answer to exactly to, to that question. But I can I can look it up and I can I can I can also write it to you afterwards. Okay, if uh, there are no other questions, let's uh, thank uh, Gabriel and uh, all speakers of this session. Uh, so uh, now we have uh, a break, we five minutes late. So let's uh, meet within five minutes. Uh, 5.25 for next session. Uh, pl please, uh, speakers who will do uh, the presentation next session, uh, check uh, the Zoom operation during coffee break if you have not done it. Thank you. See you in five minutes.
Um, hello, can you hello? can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I see Gabriel speaking, maybe still. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, Hi. so I think we have already time to start. So uh, let's start uh, next session. Uh, we, uh, we have quite tight schedule, so please be within the schedule. So let's come to luminosity measurements with Atlas experiment at LHC. So we can see slides. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll get started then. All right, well, thank you. It's it's a real pleasure to be here. So, so my name is Joey. I'll be giving uh, an overview of Atlas's luminosity measurement in, in run two. So, so first, uh, I'll start with a brief introduction and, and motivation for why we care about precision luminosity measurements at the LHC. So it's important for both online and offline measurements. Uh, so for online luminosity measurements, uh, an accuracy of roughly 5% was achieved in run two. And this accuracy was required for operating the accelerator and for operating the detectors. So for example, for performance optimizations, leveling and, and trigger optimizations. The a precise offline luminosity measurement is, is particularly important for, for all analyses, but especially for precision cross-section measurements. Uh, so an example I've given here is the uh, top uh, ratios of top, top cross-section measurements. So you can see from the green band how large the luminosity uncertainty is. And a luminosity of uh, uncertainty of 1% would be required to make it subleading amongst uh, other well-controlled systematics. So new for, for ICHAP, uh, Atlas has also just released new luminosity results on the 13 TV low mu and, and 5 TV low mu data sets. The motivation for these data sets was to provide uh, data for precision W boson measurements and also to serve as proton-proton reference data for the heavy ion program. So here's an overview of, of uh, the run to proton-proton data sets with, uh, with some tables of typical running conditions. So for 13 TV high mu, we have, we have these running conditions here. Uh, and for low mu, we have the typical running conditions here. For low mu, these, were, these runs were typically leveled to um, uh, average number of interactions for bunch crossing or mu of two or one in 2017 and 2018. And here on the plot on the right, uh, the bottom right, you can see the 13 TB low mu data set in this, in this little bump at, at low mu, which is a plot of recorded luminosity as a distribution as a function of the mean number of interactions per bunch crossing. Okay, so here's, here's the basic idea of measuring luminosity at Hadron Collider. So luminosity is given by the event rate divided by some quantity sigma viz. So R here is the event rate. That's the event rate that some detector measures. And sigma viz is, or sigma visible, is the visible or a cross section that is that that detector sees. So it's effectively that detector's calibration constant. So here we'll focus on the event rate measurements. So the primary atlas luminosity measurement uh, came from Lucid. So Lucid provides, or, or Lucid rather uh, uses a hit counting algorithm uh, using Trenkov light radiation from quartz windows. Uh, typically, or rather provided bunch by bunch measurements. And these are integrated over luminosity blocks, which are typically 60 seconds and use a hit counting algorithm of, of, these, of these photomultiplier tubes uh, for the offline measurement and use uh, sort of an OR algorithm of, of either side, four PMTs on either side of the detector. Lucid was complemented by several other detectors in, in Atlas. So first is, uh, is track counting. So this uses the multiplicity of reconstructed charged particle tracks uh, in the silicon layers of the inner detector. You can also use calorimeter data. So you can use the electromagnetic end cap or EMEC and the FCAL for the, the forward calorimeter. These are liquid argon sampling calorimeters. And then the proportions uh, or the quantity proportional to luminosity is, is the LAR gap current. You can also use the hadronic tile calorimeters. Here they use, uh, we use scintillating tile PMT currents as that quantity proportional to luminosity. 
Okay, so now that we have an event rate, it's all a matter of calibrating that event rate to get a luminosity. The method that Atlas uses is the Vandermeer scan method. So the basic outline of the Vandermeer scan formalism is as follows. So you get the uh, per bunch luminosity LB from the bunch revolution frequency FR and the bunch populations N1 and N2. And finally, the integral over the proton transverse density distributions, so these rho hats, as a function of x and y. The next step is to scan the beam separation delta x and delta y and the x and y planes, respectively, uh, and then compute the overlap integral to extract the convolved beam sizes, or, or the, this capital sigma, or cap sigma for short, that quantity here. So on the top right plot, this shows a typical uh, Vandermeer scan session. So you can see beam one and beam two being scanned uh, in X and Y, uh, and the, or X on the top one and then Y on, the, on the, the bottom part. And then the bottom plot shows a typical scan curve. So this is the event rate as a function of the separation delta X. So the scan curve is fitted with a Gaussian times polynomial to compute the overlap integral. And we try different fit functions uh, and then take the difference as a, as a systematic uncertainty. So with that scan curve, we can then take the integral here as we show in this equation here, normalize it to the rate at the peak of the scan. Mm -hmm. So to get a quantity that our dimensionless quantity and then rewrite this uh, in terms of the, uh, or the number of interactions per bunch crossing or the maximum integral interactions per bunch crossing visible to that detector. And then from that, we can calculate the calibration constant sigma this. Okay, so here's some uh, uh, details and, and sources of uncertainty from the Vandermeer scans. So the first I highlight is the scan to scan variation. So we expect to get the same sigma vis for different bunch pairs and scan sets. And then, but of course we don't. So we take the maximum difference between the extremes uh, as an uncertainty. And this is what the plot on the right shows. So in 2017, this gave rise to a 1.2% uncertainty, although it's typically half that in, in other years. There's also the length scale calibration. So this is the relationship between the nominal, or in other words, the requested uh, beam displacement and the actual beam displacement at the interaction point. This typically gave an uncertainty on the order of 0.3 to 0.4%. Uh, these are dominated by orbit drift corrections and magnetic hysteresis effects. Here on the bottom right, I've highlighted Another important correction uh, from non-factorization. So the Van Vandermeer scan formalism assumes that you can factorize these beam profiles into X and Y components, but this of course isn't actually true. So we need to, we need to correct for this. And the way we do the correction is to apply or, or do combined fits to the beam separation dependence of the luminosity and of the parameters of the, the, the luminous region in, in three-dimensional space. And then we do fits in both on and off axis VDM scans. So this typically leads to a correction factor less than 1% uh, and uncertainties of roughly 0.2 to 0.5%. I've highlighted another correction here from beam beam effects. So those are the electromagnetic interactions between bunches. Uh, so there are two main effects to correct for. First is uh, from optical distortion. So that's the defocusing of one beam by the other beam. And sometimes this is also called the dynamic beta effect. Uh, there are also nonlinear distortions uh, of the intended beam separation. So, so these are the two effects we correct for. The treatment of these corrections is, is under review. Uh, so the correction on sigma vis had previously been overestimated by 1% up until 2019, which was, which was uh, one of the things highlighted at the LHC Lumi Days workshop, which I've provided links to in the backup slides. So for the, uh, for the 13 TV data sets, uh, we still use the original correction of plus 1.3 to uh, to plus 1.7%, depending on the scan, so to be to be looked into in future work. Uh, but the five TV data sets that we've also looked at uh, use the updated correction, which give an upward correction of 0.2%. So the next procedure in the calibration of, of the main luminosity algorithm uh, from Lucid is the so-called calibration transfer. So that's to bring the calibration that we obtain in the Vandermeer scan regime uh, to the physics regime. And the reason we have to do this is because Lucid overestimates the luminosity by about 10% in high view physics conditions. Uh, so some of the some of the differences in conditions uh, from Vandermeer's to physics, uh, sort of going from low mu to high mu, going from isolated bunches to trains, and an overall increase in the number of bunches, and from zero crossing angle in the Vandermeer scan to nominal physics crossing angles. So the way we correct for this is to parameterize it in terms of mu with respect to track counting luminosity fit a straight line to it, and then correct the lucid luminosity from that. So this is what this plot shows on the right, the ratio of track counting luminosity to lucid, 
as a function of mu. This, of course, assumes that track counting is inherently linear with mu, and we need to verify this assumption. So the way we do that is look for another detector that's, that's uh, sensitive over these large dynamic ranges from Van to physics. And for that, we use the tile E cells. And then what we do is compare the tile over tracks ratios in the Van der fill, so in, in this part here, uh, and a closely following physics fill, so this part here. There's a relative 1.3% nonlinearity between the two, so we assign this as an additional systematic. At low mu, calibration transfer is still required, even though the, the range in mu is smaller. Uh, and of course, because the range of mu is smaller, the size of the correction is smaller as well. So this plot shows, again, ratios of track counting to, to Lucid, and there's about a 1.5, 1 1% 1 uh, uh, correction to make there. Next is the long-term stability. So this is where we monitor Lucid throughout each data-taking year with respect to other luminosity algorithms. Uh, and then we assign a stability band uncertainty to enclose the bulk of the points. So in 28, or in, in the high mu data sets, the, long, the largest stability uncertainty at 13 TV came from the 2017 running year. This gave a 1.3% uncertainty, which is shown by the yellow band here. It was smaller in other years, 0.7% in 2015-16 and 0.8% in 2018. Uh, at low mu, uh, the, the stability uncertainty is, is smaller overall, on the order of 0.4 to, to up to 1%. Up to 1%. And this is thanks to data being taken over a short period of time, so typically one to two weeks, and ideally close to the Vandermeer scan fill. Uh, so this is what these two plots on the right show. So the, the long-term stability at 5 TV on the top and long-term stability of 13 TV low mu on the bottom. So, so now that we have all these, all these uh, uncertainties and measurements of luminosity, the next step is because analyses treat data sets with common centered mass energy and running conditions from different years as a single combined data set, we need to then combine the luminosity and their uncertainties accounting for inter-year correlations. So this is what we do. We tabulate all the uncertainties, uh, account for these correlations I mentioned, and then we arrive at an uncertainty of roughly 2% each year. And when we do the combination, we arrive at, uh, for the high mu data set, a final luminosity uncertainty of 1.7%. Uh, and for the low mu data sets, the final uncertainty is, is about 1.5% for the, for the full data sets. I've highlighted here the calibration transfer uncertainties. So this was overall the largest uncertainties. So these, so the next steps are then to better understand this calibration procedure and, and reduce the uncertainty here. And this is what this what the next slide shows. Uh, so one possible avenue of improvement to to improve the calibration transfer uncertainty is to look more deeply into track counting luminosity, because of course the calibration transfer relies on track counting to make a, a good or to make the the, the correction. Uh, so the performance of any track counting algorithm depends on the choice of track selection working points. So what we're doing now is investigating other working points. So for example, changing the requirements, number of siliconates, and this is what this plot shows. So the 2017, the selection is used in 2017 plus an additional silicon hit with respect to the baseline 2017 uh, selections. Um, and what this does is provides a means to monitor the stability and internal consistency of the track counting measurements. Another thing we can look at is Z boson counting. So the Z boson production rate at the LHC is sufficiently high that, that right. counting Z bosons, yes, uh, counting Z bosons can act as a luminosity meter. Uh, it serves as an, an additional check on the stability of the primary atlas luminosity measurement from Lucid. So this can help uh, understand that. Finally, I have uh, another effect that we have observed in, in run two, which, which is calorimeter activation. So running with head-on collisions activates the calorimeter materials, and this leads to an artificially high luminosity measurement that gradually decays over time, typically over a few hours. And this is what this plot shows on the left. So it's important to understand these effects for both the calibration transfer and long-term stability. Uh, and currently we're exploring both data-driven and simulation-based approaches to model and correct for these effects. On the last slide, I show a summary of the run two data sets with their uncertainties and links to the relevant documentation. Uh, and finally, I've, I've highlighted a couple of, or three luminosity posters that I check on, on from Atlas. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions to Joy? Maybe I would like to ask if the new tracker, in a tracker planned for Atlas for high luminosity can help with this. Oh, I, I imagine it would. Um, 
off the top of my head, I can't think of any studies, explicit studies that have been done. But I'm, right now, we're focusing on on improvements for run three, and the final uncertainty for run two. Um, Perhaps I can comment on this. Okay. Because on Edsky Sackle, uh, the new tracker will use track counting as we do now. It we will develop pixel cluster counting, which is one of the main CMS algorithm, and uh, we will also have some dedicated sections in the tracker to pixel cluster counting at very high rate for luminosity. Uh, this is something we cannot do in the present uh, tracker TDAC infrastructure, but it will be possible at the HLLC. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, if not, thank. Uh, you and next, let, let's move to the next topic. Uh, it's CMS uh, track reconstruction performance during run two and development for run three. Uh, will be performed by Hello, everyone. Okay, we can see your slides. Okay, thanks. Please go Hello, ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about uh, CMS track reconstruction performance during run two and developments for run three. Uh, typically, we have a certain charge of particle within the tracker acceptance per proton proton collision. And between 25 to 40 collisions per event, so in total, we have around 1,000 charge of particle per event need to be reconstructed. And this is a tracking challenge at LHC. And uh, to reconstruct these particles, we have the largest silicon uh, tracker ever built, which cover active area 200 meters square, and the acceptance apps eta less than 2.5, and immersed in 3.8 Tesla magnetic field. Our uh, CMS tracking system consists mainly from two detectors, uh, strip detector and pixel detector. As you see here in uh, uh, this figure, this is the layout of our uh, uh, CMS tracking system during run one and run two 2016. And then uh, to cope with increasing uh, the luminosity during run two, uh, we had the tracker upgrade in 2017. Uh, as you see here in the uh, bottom uh, uh, figure, uh, the comparison between phase zero uh, pixel detector and phase one pixel detector. Where you can see uh, the original uh, pixel detector replaced with new device phase one pixel detector to address the dynamic inefficiencies in red out chip at high rates. Uh, we can conclude this improvements in three points. Uh, one additional tracking uh, point in both parallel and forward regions, and this allow us to reconstruct the forehead seeds and uh, give us lower fake rates. Also, a smaller radius of any or most pixel uh, layer, and this make us closer to the interaction point and improve our tracking and vertexing performance. Uh, and also uh, reduce the material budget, and this is reduces the multiple scattering and photon conversion. To reconstruct our track in, in, in CMS, we are following iterative procedures where our iteration is starting here. And the first step is uh, to provide an initial uh, track candidate and trajectory parameter in the seeding layer. And then we extrapolate our track uh, to the next layer and find compatible heads uh, and update our filter. We are continue until uh, there is no more layer and or there is more than one missing head. Then to provide the final fitting, we provide best estimation of parameters of each uh, smooth trajectory after combining all the associated heads. And finally, for uh, the track selection, we are following a set of cuts uh, sensitive to the fake rate and uh, uh, also as uh, the track normalized the chi-square and, its, and uh, on its compatibility with the interaction point. Then we remove uh, uh, all the heads of the found tracks and this is reduced for us the combinatorial problem so that we can reconstruct a more difficult track within the CPU time budget. And then we start our iteration from the beginning, but this time with progressively loser setting. As you see here, uh, our 12 iterations summarized here in this table, where we start with uh, the high PT tracks, which is promo track, high, have high precision pixel heads and beam spot constraints. And then uh, we use uh, uh, seed uh, triplet seeds. Uh, and then uh, the later steps use uh, head from the strip detector to find the uh, dead shit tracks. And uh, the final step use uh, special iteration to improve uh, the track reconstruction in high dense environment like 
reconstruct a track inside jets or uh, use information from other subsystem like mains. You can see here in the bottom plots uh, our tracking efficiency uh, per each iteration uh, as a function of simulated track BT and simulated track production vertex radius. Then uh, following the improvement done in 2017, we also had new track seeding algorithm based on cellular automaton technique. Uh, in uh, CA technique, the head bears uh, formed between detector layers, and then the bear compatibility with the interaction point is checked. And finally, uh, the triplets or quadruplets that used for seeding are formed from the compatible bears. Uh, you can see here in the bottom plots uh, a comparison between uh, the performance uh, during 2016 and 2017 using the CA. Uh, as you see, uh, we have increase in the efficiency and decrease in the fake rate and also improve in the BT resolution, especially in the transition region between the barrel and the indicator. Also, uh, we have uh, improvement in the timing. Uh, actually, with additional uh, layers in the pixel detector, uh, we would expect uh, uh, slowed down uh, track seeding with using a conventional seed uh, finding. But using the CA reduced the timing, as you see here in the left plot, back to or even below 2017, uh, 2016 performance. Uh, also, the reduction in the fake rates that we showed in the previous slide make reduction in the time spent uh, on pattern recognition, as you see here in the uh, middle plot, and this is independent of the seed algorithm. Uh, so, in total, we have uh, around 20% faster track reconstruction, as you see here in the right plot, at uh, high pileup, uh, despite the increase in the number of pixel layers. Then looking at the tracking performance in run two legacy data, uh, you can see here uh, in this plot uh, the tracking efficiency uh, in run two legacy data with the total integrated luminosity 137 inverse fem to parn, where you can see in the left and the middle plot, uh, we have uh, tracking efficiency almost 99.9% despite all the challenges we had in run two. So thanks to the long shutdown one uh, improvement and also uh, during run two. Uh, and uh, if, uh, if we compare the, uh, the different era for run two, we have here good agreement in the right plot. We have good agreement uh, uh, between the tracking efficiency for uh, uh, 2018, 2017 uh, and 16 new ABV settings. And uh, we have a loss in the efficiency up to 2% found uh, for 2016 old ABV settings. Uh, looking at uh, the track uh, impact parameter resolution, as you see here in the top plot, uh, we have a comparison here between uh, the um, 2017 vertex reconstruction and 2016 one. And as you see, 2017 uh, vertex reconstruction show better performances than 2016 one. So uh, thanks to the new pixel detector. Uh, and in, as you see here in the bottom uh, plot, uh, this is uh, the transverse uh, track IB resolution in uh, uh, 2017 uh, legacy data with phase one uh, pixel detector as a function of uh, track uh, transverse momentum and the track eta. Uh, as you see, we have uh, for BT between one and the 10 GeV and apps eta less than 2.5. Uh, the resolution between 20 and uh, 75 micrometer. And uh, for apps eta less than 1.4, we have resolution between 20 and 65 micrometer, which is much better than phase zero pixel detector. Then uh, uh, the tracking reconstruction at uh, high level trigger, our tracking at HLT is uh, regional tracking. I mean, we reconstruct the track around physics object. Uh, and due to the time constraints at HLT, uh, we reduce uh, the number of iteration with respect to of line tracking. Here you can see in this table example for CA seeding for uh, BF at HLT, since 2017, we have only three iterations. But uh, during the operation in 2017, we had several issues with uh, phase one pixel detector, and uh, this led to non-negligible fraction of non-active pixel modules in each event. And so in 2017, we adopted the static mitigation uh, via dedicated iteration in a specific ETA and phi regions. 
but uh, this, the recovery was insufficient for additional dynamic pixel issues. And so in 2018, we adopted the dynamic mitigation of the pixel issues. And as you can see here on the right, uh, the HLT tracking efficiency uh, is almost uh, matching to the ideal uh, uh, efficiency. And uh, also we have efficiency is flat, almost flat as a function of biolog. Uh, then uh, turning to the developments uh, for run three, uh, actually with increasing the luminosity and the consequently the accumulated uh, radiation, uh, there will be non-negligible degradation in uh, our tracking detector uh, in uh, both uh, pixel and strip detector uh, with respect to the nominal performances that we have now. So uh, there are uh, new developments targeting run three is ongoing now. Uh, like uh, developments in the mitigation strategy and uh, also developments in the track selection and the developments in uh, track seeding in uh, dense environment like track seeding uh, inside jets, also in the seed cleaning. So let's uh, try to discuss uh, some of these uh, developments now. Here you can see uh, uh, the, the improvement targeting uh, tracking inside jets. Uh, actually, tracking inside jets become inefficient if we go over uh, 500 Gs uh, due to cluster merging. And so uh, we have some developments targeting RUN3. Uh, as you see here in the flow chart, uh, we, we aim to skip the clustering uh, and using uh, the pixel clustering and using uh, the convolutional neural network to produce track seeds in jets. Uh, so our input here will be uh, the, the, the pixel row info, the four layer pixel row info, as you see here in the bottom plots, and uh, uh, plus jet, jet BT and uh, eta from the calorimeter, and our target here will be uh, track seed parameters. Uh, actually, performing this uh, test show us, uh, uh, as you see in uh, the left plot here, uh, uh, efficiency which almost matching the Monte Carlo truth seeding, which is, of course, will be ideal efficiency. And also, uh, we had uh, fake rate reduction around 60%, and also a uh, seeding time reduction around 85%. Then, uh, uh, following the developments for RUN3, we also uh, have uh, developments targeting seed filtering. Uh, as we uh, discussed before, uh, the track seeding, uh, as you see here in the flow chart in, on the right, the track seeding in the pixel detector start with uh, head doublets, and then we form the triplet and the quadruplet to build seeds. Uh, what we aim to do uh, for RUN3 is uh, starting from this doublet generation, we will filter uh, the pixel clusters based on their shape using CNN. So our inputs here will be uh, the maps of uh, cluster uh, of pixel clusters for the heads making uh, the doublets. And uh, performing this test uh, show us almost uh, any change in the performance of the downstream track reconstruction. And as you see here in this plot, we have fake rate uh, reduction around uh, 40%. And also we have time uh, reduction here uh, around uh, 68%. Okay, you have one, okay. Yeah, okay, the conclusion. Uh, okay, so we can conclude what we discussed uh, in that. Uh, despite the challenging condition we had uh, at LHC in round two, we have high tracking and vertexing performance, uh, which uh, uh, depend on uh, the performance of the detector as well as the algorithm used in the event reconstruction. Uh, also, we can say that uh, phase one pixel uh, tracker helped us to cope with uh, the large increase in the luminosity and the pileup events. And uh, we can say about HLT tracking, uh, it, uh, it was efficient. Uh, we have new developments targeting uh, uh, RUN3 uh, to cope with increasing in the luminosity and uh, in the rate. Uh, which uh, mainly uh, in the mitigation strategy and in the track selection, where we aim to use a deep neural network for our track selection. And also we have uh, developments targeting the track seeding inside the dense environment like in jets uh, using the deep core and uh, seed cleaning uh, using CNN. 
Thanks. Thank you. Uh, questions to all? Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, I have questions uh, for run two. You have excellent uh, efficiency, but for run three, you expect uh, degradation. So, what is uh, target efficiency for run three? Uh, we aim to keep with the same excellent efficiency for run three. For this reason, we are uh, trying to do developments in uh, the track selections and in uh, also to to to, uh, to development our mitigation strategy and so on. So we target to to keep with uh, uh, the same uh, excellent performance even during run three. And actually, our results up to now from uh, the developments for run three is promising results. So we hope so. Mm -hmm. So you are not expecting reduction of efficiency even after accumulating full luminosity? Yeah, I hope so, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. I don't see questions. Okay, so uh, thank you, let's move to Next presentation, uh, it's uh, CMS Electron and Photon Performance at Run 2 and uh, Prospects for Run 3, but uh, Olivia, so yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, can please you go ahead. Should to, you should also see me, maybe? Sorry? Do you also see my video? Yes, yes, uh, we see your slides. Okay, you should also see my, my, uh, okay, okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot. Uh, in this talk, I will uh, explain you the performance that at the moment have at CMS for concern reconstruction and identification of electrons and photons. So uh, as you know very well, electrons and photons are key ingredients for uh, most many analysis in CMS. And uh, this is possible only because uh, we have a strong interplay between calorimeters and tracker, and we are able to reconstruct these objects with a very high precision and purity. The results that I'm going to show you today, they include the, the full run to data, 16, 17, and 18. And for 2017, we present the legacy version of the data, which means data with a finer and better uh, improved calibration, which allow us to get a better data Monte Carlo agreement and also very good performance in terms of resolution. In any case, also the performance of 16 and 18 are very similar to 2017 legacy. And as well, at the end, I will show you an insight of uh, run three preliminary results. So as uh, you know, the, the CMS detector is a very complex subject with many subdetectors, but for what concern electrons and photons, the two main uh, subdetectors which are relevant here are the, the inner tracker, which has been just very nicely described, where uh, the main improvement is related to the upgrade that we had during the previous uh, long shutdown. And now we are able to, to use a more uh, complex information of the pixel uh, detector with more layers. And this really makes a big difference as I will show you in the next slide. And then, uh, obviously, the, the electromagnetic uh, calorimeter of uh, CMS, uh, which is made of uh, libidum state crystals, which is able to provide that excellent performance. And also, in this case, I'm not going to describe the detector because uh, already the, the previous talk has been uh, very nice on this, and there is also a poster, which I invite you to, to visit to have more details. So, uh, here, just in two sentences, all the excellent performance that the vehicle provides to us, perfect uh, energy resolution between 1% and 5%, and also, surprisingly, a very good timing resolution of roughly 200 picoseconds. And these two numbers allow us to do very nice uh, uh, studies. And uh, this is kind of a summary of the main results that you're going to see here in this conference uh, related to electrons and photons. The X decays in, in, in ZZ and the land and electrons or the X in the photons, but also searches for new physics with uh, some non-conventional signatures, which in this case, uh, for example, are delayed jets that exploit the timing measurement in, 
in the in the ical uh, so first of all uh, everything starts from the collection of the signals in our crystals in the detector at the moment the reconstruction of the signal amplitude is done since 2015 with a new method that is called the uh, template method where we somehow take into account the and subtract the information of the out of time pileup and we get a much better estimation of the energy deposited in the crystal with respect to the previous method that was used in, in the round two. In this case, you can see that the, 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 in the plot on the bottom, the, the resolution, the energy resolution improves a lot by a factor of roughly 50%, especially at low energy where the out of time pile up is more uh, important. Then uh, what we have to do, we have our signals in the ECAL, we have to reconstruct the objects. So at this point is where the tracker enters in the game because the, the, there is a strong interplay between clustering in the ECAL and the reconstruction of the track in the tracker. We have dedicated algorithms to do that. For the clustering, we exploit the shape of the energy deposits in the detector. For the, the tracker, we apply the Gaussian sum filter algorithm. And in this way, we are able to reconstruct with very high efficiency both electrons and photons. These algorithms are applied both online and uh, offline. And in addition, there is also a dedicated algorithm to collect the energy spread in the transversal plane due to the presence of the magnetic field, which bend the charge of particles. So as I was saying to you uh, before, the presence of the new uh, pixel detector is very important because it has a, a huge improvement. For example, in this plot, I show you the, um, the improvement in terms of the uh, fake rate um, uh, as a function of the number of pile up. In, in green, you have 16, which means the old pixel detector. In blue is 17, and the new detector. You see that we have an improvement of roughly 30% as a function of the, of the pile up. And also, as I was saying to you, the efficiencies in the reconstruction are very high, more, bigger than 96% over the full PT spectrum. At HLT, performance is also very good. In this case, we test the efficiencies of one of the many electron or photon trigger paths that we have. And as you can see, the efficiencies are stable uh, in time, which means that they are not affected by the detector aging, and they are very good in, both in terms of pile up, but also in terms of uh, uh, in terms of energy. In this case, I'm showing uh, a reference trigger with the double electron requirements. Uh, for what concerns the offline uh, reconstruction, uh, after having built our uh, clusters, both for an electron for a photon, we have to correct the energy measurements for many effects. We have a multi-step procedure. The first uh, procedure is a multivariate uh, um, technique in order to correct the energy itself of the object. And then there is a second step where we apply residual corrections using the Z-boson mass. We basically scale, the, the, um, shift the data to match the position of the peak of the, in the Monte Carlo, because that is the, is the truth. And then we smear the Monte Carlo to match the resolution that we observe in data. There is a significant improvement in this procedure with respect to RAN1 because we are doing this correction with a very finer granularity. And in addition, there is also um, another uh, correction applied for very precision analysis, like for example, this to gamma gamma, as shown here, where this correction is also applied as a function of the energy in order to uh, correct further the, the residual disagreement between data and Monte Carlo. Uh, so here you have the performance of the energy resolution. As you can see, we get a very nice agreement in terms of data Monte Carlo comparison for the Z mass peak, this, in this case is 2017 data. But also if you look at the plot on the right, the resolution in the mass and the dielectron decay for the Z is within one and 4% over the full ETA spectrum. And this is true for all the years, clearly. For the 2017 legacy, we observe a better resolution, but all the three years provide us a very uh, solid and good quality results. Then, uh, after having measured the energy of our object, we have to identify the objects, the electrons and the photons. We basically have two main strategies. 
One is to exploit the shape of the energy deposits in the, in the calorimeter. Another one is to exploit the isolation. So the amount of energy is around the direction of the electron or photon in the, the, the tracker, the ECAL or the atomic calorimeter. At CMS, we have the several uh, working points, several kind of selections for both electrons and the photons. So we also have two different approaches, uh, multivariate one and a cut-based approach. The cut-based is most relevant for exotic searches where you really don't want a model-dependent selection. And as you can see in the, in the plots here, we have uh, the, um, the raw curves for the MBA working points, but also reported here the several working points for uh, the cut base. In addition to this, uh, we have also a uh, couple of uh, dedicated identification requirements, either for displaced objects or for very high energy electrons or photons. So the, uh, for what concerns the performance of the identification, the I, what I want to stress here in the plot on the left is the improvement in terms of theta Monte Carlo agreement for the identification efficiency, where the, 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 the correction factor to Monte Carlo were roughly 80 90% in 2017, with the new legacy calibration, we managed to improve to get an improvement of roughly 5-10% in terms of agreement between the Monte Carlo. The plot on the right here shows you the agreement again between the three years of full run two for what concerns a, a specific working point, but still, also in this case, the both efficiencies and data Monte Carlo correction are very consistent among the, the years. Then, as I was telling to you, there is also another important aspect of the ECAL detector. We are also very um, um, lucky that we can use this detector to measure very well, not only the energy, but also the timing of the particles hitting the calorimeter. We measured the, the timing resolution of the full run to data set, and we got a resolution of roughly 200 picoseconds for energies above 30 uh, GP. This number is not the 30 picoseconds that we expect for, uh, for the high LUMI phase, but still is a very good ingredient and allow us to perform searches for new physics. For example, in this, search, in this plot, I show you the, the timing distribution that you expect uh, in data, so something around zero within uh, the, 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 the quoted resolution, but also the timing distribution that you expect uh, for photons arriving in delay on the detector coming from a scenario of physics beyond the standard model. So you can see already from these plots how powerful is this information in order to search for potential, potential signals of um, physics, uh, of a new physics. In addition, we are also exploring the new phase regions, uh, phase phase regions. So at, the, at this point, we are also dedicating a lot of efforts to low PT objects. This is very important because low, elect low PT electrons are very common in B-physics searches, but also I would say in exotic searches. For this reason, uh, our experts have developed a dedicated uh, reconstruction algorithm with a new seeding uh, strategy able to recover the reconstruction efficiencies at low energy, so this means below 2 GV, from basically zero up to 60%. And this is very good because it allows us to explore a new and unexplored region of energies also in our physics searches. And finally, run three. So for run three, as we have already said, we expect a much harsher environment at LAC, much larger pile up, and also a lot of more noise in the ethyl crystals. And obviously, if the noise increase, we have much more, much more rekits in our cluster, in our energy deposits that we should consider or not when we study our, uh, and we construct our electrons and photons objects. This means that the, if we include, mistakenly include the wrong rekits in our, uh, objects, the performance of the reconstruction and the identification decreases. For this reason, our experts at the moment are developing new superclustering strategies in order to apply some noise cleaning and recover the performance in terms of reconstruction and identification that we have uh, now around two. And these uh, strategies are based on, uh, uh, again, uh, multivariate-based uh, algorithms. So in the specific, I just give you here an example. Yes, it's finished. I just give you here an example where we have an identification variable that we use very frequently, which is called sigma eta. In this case, the, the shape that you expect is the red one for run three with the correction applied 
with the new reclustering will be the blue one and we will be able to, re to recover the performance in terms of uh, background rejection that we have at the moment now in run two, which are here in green. In addition, let me comment that we will also have a new edge call detector that will allow us to perform a new, new way of identification also in our uh, in the case of electrons and photons exploiting the layers of the edge call. This brings me to my conclusion. I hope that I convince you that the performance that CMS at the moment has for electrons and photons are very good, that there have been many improvements starting from the new template method for the cluster for the signals up to the new re recalibration of the detector. And we are prepar preparing now at the moment a paper on RAM2 that is going to be released in summer. I want to finish showing you this very nice plot that has been approved very recently in, uh, in CMS, which show you the performance in terms of energy re resolution for the three years, but this time also 2016 and 2018 are presented with the legacy calibration, so with the very final calibration. So we can say from this plot that this is the best uh, that CMS can provide at run two in terms of energy resolution for electrons and photons. Performance again are stable over the three, over the three years. And uh, these numbers really are very promising in terms of performance for physics analysis that will be released in the next uh, months. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions to leave here? Okay, so let, let me ask uh, uh, questions. You show very nice uh, figures that uh, your resolution doesn't depend on ear and uh, practically no degradation except to the very high uh, ether region. Uh, what uh, do you expect for round three? So for, yeah. so for for RAM3, uh, the, 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 let's say the purpose is to develop the, the new superclustering algorithm that I was mentioning to you before uh, in order to uh, recover the RAM2 performance. So we, what we expect is that with the new tools that people are developing now, we will be able to match the performance that we have here. So you expect to get the same resolution about 2% for... Yeah, between uh, 2 and 5, yeah. In, in spite of the radiation damage and so on. Yeah, I mean, that, that is exactly the, the, the point, is to try to, to tell the, the, the tool, the tool should be able to learn itself from the performance of the rekits, how is the best way to cluster the, 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 the object in order to to match the performance that uh, we still have. And this is valid also for the identification. For the identification uh, selection, we are trying to target the same efficiencies that we have now with the new definition of the new variables when needed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's move to uh, the next talk, uh, CMS Jet and Missing Transverse Momentum Performance at Round 2 and Prospects for Round 3. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see also the slides? Yeah, we can see slides. Okay, so I will be giving a summary talk about the construction and calibration of jets and missing transverse energy in the CMS collaboration. So during round two, a lot of data was collected by the CMS detector with the average pileup of 30 interactions per bunch crossing. And our ultimate goal is to achieve the best performances for both jets and missing transverse energy. And to do so, we use a plethora uh, of techniques to handle the challenge of very different pileup scenarios. And as you can see on the right, uh, right-handed plot, we collect data up to six interaction per batch crossing, and the expected pileup for the upcoming run tree is even higher than what we had so far. And we're getting ready to face this challenge, as I will show you in the next slides. Okay, so let me uh, jump directly into the chain used by CMS for reconstructing jet and missing transverse energy. This scheme is used uh, for both the online and the offline reconstruction with some differences uh, in the amount of the information uh, that is used or the level of, of correction that is applied uh, just to achieve a fast uh, performance during data taking. 
So we start from a local reconstruction, uh, which means that we combine information in each subdetector. And here it's very important to be fast for the online reconstruction. And in the future, the GPU will, uh, will handle this task. The next step is what we call particle flow. We use all the quantities uh, that are reconstructed in the previous step to identify the particle composition of each event. And already at this stage, uh, some of the pileup mitigation techniques are, are applied. Afterwards, we start the reconstruction process, which consists of the clustering of uh, all the particle flow candidates into jets. And we use a variety of uh, clustering algorithms and cone sizes. And only at the very end, uh, we deal with the final calibration of our jets we propagate uh, the correction to uh, the missing transverse energy and we can also apply additional pileup cleaning. So in proton-proton collision, multiple interactions happen in the same time uh, and additional particles that are produced can deteriorate the measurements since they may end up in the, in the reconstructed jets. And here there is a sketch where we have pileup contribution uh, in those jets. So getting rid of pileup is an art, and there are a variety of techniques uh, one could use. And one, is, one example is the CHS algorithm, which uses information from the detector to remove uh, the charged particles that are associated to a pileup vertex. But the target coverage is uh, only limit, limited in ETA. So outside, uh, outside the tracker, we don't know really the charge of the particle. So to account for the effect of neutral component, uh, we, we take care of this in the jet energy correction, so, as I will show you in the next slide. Moreover, to reduce the effect of the neutral component, CMS uses as an alternative uh, the PAPI algorithm, which assigns each particle a weight uh, corresponding to the probability of originating from a leading primary vertex. This weight is used to scale uh, to scale down the form momentum, and it is by construction at a zero one for charged particles. Whereas for the uh, for the neutral uh, component, you can see the distribution of the weights on the top plots. Um, another technique applied by CMS uses a boosted decision tree to identify uh, low low PT jets coming from pileup, and uh, and here you can see on the on the left plot, the contamination of pileup jets in trillion events before we apply any discriminator. And we use this technique. Uh, with this technique, we're able to reject 95% of, uh, of those noisy jets with a minimal loss in efficiency. As we, can, as we heard a few, talks, a few talks before, at the beginning of 2017, uh, CMS upgraded uh, the pixel detector, extending the coverage in ETA from uh, 2.5 to 2.7. And on the right hand side plot, I'm showing you the training in the extended coverage in ETA, and you can gauge the impact uh, on, the performance in, on the performances before and after the upgrade. On slide number six, uh, we can now understand how the different algorithms perform. Uh, the, this plot shows the efficiency and the purity as a function of the number of uh, pileup interactions. And as you can see inside the, uh, inside the tracker acceptance, PAPI that is in blue has high performances in both efficiency and purity. Uh, but on the other hand, even though uh, for CMS, which is in red, uh, the efficiency is better, the purity drops uh, quite fast uh, towards high pileup scenarios. And to recover in, in, in purity, but at the expense of on the efficiency, one can apply uh, this pileup jet ID at different working points according to its own needs. For high ETA values, we have similar scenario for, for efficiency, but the purity drops uh, more rapidly in all the cases. And even though PAPI performs uh, already better than CHS only, with the usage of this pileup ID on top of CHS, we can improve the performances uh, with respect to PAPI only. We can also size the performances of CHS and PAPI on physical variables. For example, uh, the, um, the jet mass resolution, which is used at the analysis level. And on this, on the top figure, you can see the stability uh, that against pileup brought, brought by the PAPI algorithm. So after uh, pileup mitigation uh, techniques, uh, one can cluster and calibrate the jets. And, and for jet calibration, CMS uses a factorized approach. And you can see here a schematic representation of this procedure in which the first step consists of uh, pileup subtraction. This is a simulate based correction that aims at removing uh, the average offset coming from pileup. 
And you can see in this plot as a function of eta that we monitor this average offset per pileup interaction uh, for each type of particle flow candidate. But actually the, the calibration procedure is heavily relying on the second step, uh, which is the calibration of the jet response. Here, the main purpose is to account for um, discrepancies between the true and the measured energy of the jets. And if you look at the plot on the right, you can, uh, you can see the correction needed inside the detector from the, uh, from the tracker area at low eta towards the calorimeter only part at high eta. And here changes in performances at high eta values and low PT are caused by, by detector acceptance. Now at this stage, uh, the jet energy scale is well calibrated in simulation and therefore we can apply uh, some residual corrections uh, to, to get rid of small differences between data and simulation. And we divide uh, the, those corrections into two steps. There is an eta dependent part, which is the purpose of correcting different response in each sub detector with respect to the central and better calibrated part. And those eta, eta dependent corrections are very small everywhere and only in the transition region between uh, between the sub detectors are, become, are becoming sizable. And please note the, the scale on the y axis. Uh, I, 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 I mean, I want to emphasize that almost everywhere these corrections are, are less than 5%. The second part of the residual corrections have some PT dependence and they are trying to adjust the absolute scale difference in the central region of the detector. To derive those corrections, uh, we use a precisely calibrated reference object, as you can see here in this sketch, uh, for example, muons, photons, and, uh, and electrons, and we combine everything together into a global fit. And yet you can see that the level of the correction needed is, uh, is up to uh, a few percent. Now, after that the jet energy scale has been corrected, uh, the jet energy resolution in simulation uh, need to be, needs to be smeared uh, to match the resolution in data. Therefore, we apply scale factor in simulation to widen uh, the detection response distribution. And finally, we reach fully calibrated jets uh, with uncertainties that are uh, less than 1% towards, uh, towards high PT. And as you can see, the pileup contribution is one of the most, uh, the most important one. Okay, so leaving jets uh, aside for a moment, uh, we could also talk about uh, missing transverse energy. It, it arises from invisible particles, and they're already known as neutrinos or also new physics. And it's usually estimated from the momentum conservation in the transverse plane. This means that if we miscalibrate the visible part of our event, we will have an inaccurate description of the transverse, uh, transverse energy. But this is not the only source of error, as you can see on those two plots. In fact, uh, we can have anomalous high PT miss events in data that can appear, for example, from, uh, from detector effects. And CMS adopts several mechanisms uh, to suppress these spurious events in data. Now, the performances of the reconstruction of the missing transverse energy is measured in Drelian events, uh, where we have a well-calibrated object that defines a uh, scale in, in an axis. And as you can see from the sketch, uh, we also use uh, an hadronic recoil to balance, uh, to balance the boson. And in those kinds of events, uh, we do not expect any, um, any genuine PT miss. As you can see maybe on the, on the right-hand plot, where the mean value of the, um, uh, of, of the boson is, uh, of the energy uh, is, is centered down zero. Now on the left plot, we can also see the missing energy scale. And here we have a turn on, and this is due to the, uh, an imperfect calibration of the, um, of the lower uh, low PT uh, jet component of, uh, of our reconstruction. And here the X axis uh, correspond to the boson energy scale. On the middle plot, we can also see the distribution of the resolution, which is dominated by the hadronic recoil. And we can also gauge uh, the agreement between the three different channels that are used uh, to perform this analysis. But also in case of uh, PT miss, we can apply the PAPI algorithm. And it has the advantage of reducing the resolution uh, of the missing transverse energy at the expenses of having a slightly uh, larger tails. And this is due to the wrong assignment of the neutral component in the PAPI algorithm. We can also see a direct improvement um, 
in the resolution of the transverse mass in W plus jet events, uh, where we do expect the genuine uh, p uh, missing transverse energy. And here I'm presenting the same plot once, uh, once for CHS and one with the puppy algorithm applied. And you can see that, that the results are quite impressive. There are other features brought by the puppy algorithm. Uh, one of those is the slightly uh, a slower turn on in the energy scale, but the big improvement um, is, the, uh, is in the resolution. And in fact, puppy show once again, a better stability against pileup. And in fact, you can see that for the expected values of, of pileup for N3, uh, the gain here is quite significant. Okay, so this brings me- Five minutes left. Okay. So this brings me already to my summary, actually. Uh, I presented uh, several techniques uh, coming from our run to experience. Uh, they already have uh, high performances and we will, uh, they will allow us to cope with, uh, with the upcoming run tree. And in this regard, the puppy algorithm is very promising. But this is not the end of the story. We are um, we're aiming uh, at reducing the uncertainties on calibration down to 1% for our final calibration of the run to data. And for doing that, uh, we want to increase the granularity of, of our correction in order to tackle uh, the aging of our detector. In the future also, machine learning uh, techniques uh, will be used uh, to achieve even better, um, even better results. So stay tuned because uh, more exciting results are yet to come. Okay, thank you for the attention. Thank you. Uh, questions to Andrea? Okay, uh, so, so uh, your uh, puppy algorithm show very good uh, improvement uh, for round two uh, and uh, for round three, you are going to use uh, that uh, strategy. That is, that is the plan so far. We still uh, try to finalize our decision, but uh, that, that is the plan. Puppy will be the default one. But of course, we will also have CHS for, for uh, some cases. I mean, it de really depends on the kind of analysis that is being performed that the usage of Puppy is not, uh, is not really suitable. So, but for the main analysis, Puppy would be the default. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Okay, if not, thanks. And Thank let's move to the next presentation. Uh, it's uh, tower identification, exploiting deep learning technique. Andrea. Yes. Hmm? I should be sharing the slides. Can you see them? Yes, we, we see slides and can hear you. Perfect, then I'll start. So good evening, I'm Andrea. Okay, another Andrea working uh, in CMS uh, in Hamburg. And I will talk about uh, the tau identification exploiting deep learning techniques. So first, here's a slide uh, describing an overview of the various measurements that can be done with tau leptons. In particular, I'm pointing to, for instance, the measurement of the Yukawa couplings of the Higgs to fermions, uh, or the measurement of the CV properties of the Higgs and several also other searches for beyond standard model physics. The tau is the heaviest lepton in the standard model and has a mass of roughly 1.78 GeV. It is the only lepton that can decay both leptonically and hadronically. And it has an average lifetime of uh, roughly three times 10 to the minus 13 seconds, which means it has a decay length of roughly 1.5 millimeters, uh, taking into account an energy of 30 GeV. Therefore, it decays before reaching uh, the innermost layers of the detector, usually. It always decays in at least one charged particle, which I will refer from now on as prong. And uh, as we can see here, the leptonic decays uh, always involve only one prong, while for the hadronic decays, uh, we have usually either one or three prongs. 
In particular, the Hadron E decays uh, are via mesonic resonance, in particular via the raw meson at 770 MeV and the A1 meson at 100, um, sorry, 1260 MeV. Regarding leptonic decays, these are usually reconstructed in data events where we apply the usual selection we do in CMS. So we, we, we construct a muon based on deposits also in the muon chambers in the outer part of the detector or electron based on electromagnetic deposits in the calorimeter and trucks. And we require them to be isolated and sufficiently separated from other tau decay products. Of course, in a data events, we also expect the presence of missing transverse energy. From now on, I will then proceed to talk on about hadronic taus. Regarding the reconstruction in CMS, uh, what we use is the particle flow algorithm for all reconstructed objects, which matches uh, trucks and energy deposits in the calorimeters. For hadronic taus, there is another algorithm, which is the hadron plus strip, which assigns to uh, particle flow candidates, which are the reconstructed objects from the particle flow algorithm, uh, to a hadron, which would come from the decaying uh, tau, and uh, and uh, uh, particle flow candidates associated to an electromagnetic shower in the electromagnetic calorimeter to a strip uh, when they are elongated in the phi direction of the detector, because that would be a signature of the decay of a pi zero. Originally, this uh, HPS algorithm had uh, three decay channels reconstructed, which are the three ones I'm pointing here, while in the latest version, we have four, which are the one prong, one prong plus pi zero, Three prong and three prong plus by zero. There are several objects that can be misidentified as hadronic taus by this algorithm. And in particular, there are jets. In particular, if a jet is highly collimated, it can mimic pretty much any tau decay. Then we have muons, which usually contribute to a contamination for the one prong decay. And electrons, for which I am pointing out here a brief sketch. In particular, an electron can have uh, sufficient energy to reach also um, in terms of a shower, also the hadronic calorimeter, and can be misidentified as a hadron as a result. And it can emit uh, photons via Bremsstrom radiation, which could be misidentified as the decay of a pi zero and therefore as a strip. The result is that uh, the electron pretty much can mimic the decay of a Rose meson. To reduce the misidentification rate, uh, the uh, a neural network based algorithm was introduced, and it's the deep tau algorithm. This uh, algorithm is based on a convolutional neural network, and uh, I will proceed now to describe first the inputs of such a neural network. In particular, we have low level inputs uh, based on the trucks and energy deposit of particle flow candidates, and high level inputs, which are related to the, the properties of the tau candidate and some general event properties. I'll then move on to describe the general structure of the neural network and then proceed to describe what we do with the outputs. We have four output nodes, in particular one for the genuine taus and one for each uh, misidentifiable object. So jet, electron, and muon. And from these four output uh, scores, we retrieve three classifiers, taken as the ratio of the score for the tau divided by the score for the tau plus the score for the other objects. So this uh, classifier will be close to one if the object is very likely to be a, a tau, and very small if it's very likely to be a misidentified object. In terms of input features, we divide them, as I said, in low level and high level. The low levels are constructed in the following way. We divide the CMS detector in cells of eta times phi. And in each cell, we take all available information for the leading particle flow candidate, so the one with the highest energy. We also have a higher density of cells in a signal region, which is defined with respect to the uh, direction of flight of the leading uh, tau uh, decay product uh, of size that are uh, 0 0.1, and an isolation region of size 0 0.5 that are size 0 0.5 constructed around it. The idea of having two different granularities is that uh, this allows to have a good compromise between having a high number of features for the neural network to be able to reconstruct correctly which object decayed or uh, which signature has been found in the detector, and a low enough number of features so that uh, 
the computation time and memory wise use of the neural network is uh, uh, reasonable. At the moment, we have 180 up, up to 188 uh, features per cell. We also have 47 high level inputs, which are the properties of a tau candidate, for instance, the PT, eta, phi, HPSTK mode, and so on. And other properties, for instance, the average energy in the event and the eta separation between the directional flight of the tau and the leading photon or electron in the strip, for instance. In terms of structure, this is a convolutional neural network which takes as input something of the order of 100,000 low and high level features and says something of the order of 1.5 million, uh, million trainable parameters. Regarding the low level features, these are pre processed to reduce the number of features. There are free convolutional layers associated to the various uh, substructures uh, in terms of features, so for electron, photons, and uh, hadrons. And then they are processed through other convolutional layers with window size three times three to uh, con um, concatenate uh, uh, the various features between the different objects. High level features are pre processed via directly dense layers. And then all the various features from the different sources are merged together and processed via five dense layers, leading up to four output nodes. The training is performed using the N-Adam algorithm. And due to a number of parameters, uh, we run the training on one GPU, and it takes roughly three days per epoch. Here, I'm now showing directly the, class the classifiers that we obtain from the output nodes, particularly the against muon classifier and against electron. In this plot, I'm, I'm showing the misidentification probability on the y-axis and the efficiency in the identification of genuine tau's on the x-axis. Here, I'm showing not only the classifiers obtained with the deep tau algorithm, but also the previous classifiers using CMS. In particular, we had a cut-based one for the muons and an MVA-based one for electrons. And we can see that the use of the deep tau algorithm, so of the use of deep learning, improved, uh, uh, reduced the misidentification rate. Regarding JET, we have one classifier, as I said earlier. However, to estimate the misidentification rate, this is done in two separate studies. In particular, we look at the JETs coming from TT bar events and a JETs coming from Dalpas JETs events. And here I'm showing the updated uh, deep tau classifier uh, with, uh, and uh, as a comparison, the former MVA based one. And we can see that we have overall a nice increase uh, in the purity of the selected uh, uh, tiles. Moving on to analysis level, I'm showing here the visible mass distribution on the left using the old MVA discriminators and on the right using the new deep tower identification. We can see from the increase in this uh, yellow histogram, which is uh, the Z2Toto process, that we are increasing the number of collected genuine tiles and this is done by a factor of 20%. While from the decrease of these red, pink, and blue histograms, which corresponds to Dow plus Jets, QCD multi-jet, and ZLL, we are reducing the number of fakes uh, comparing left to right. And this is done by roughly 23% uh, as cumulative among all the different types of fakes. To conclude, I showed today the tau identification exploiting deep learning techniques, which has uh, noticeably reduced the misidentification rate and increased the fraction of collecting genuinely adjoined tiles. We also have increased the uh, possibility to, this, to model uh, Monte Carlo to data correctly, and we have correction scale factors that are now of the order of 10%. There have been, uh, in parallel, performed uh, other algorithms in CMS. In particular, we have a defective performance summary here regarding a low PT tau identification algorithm, which is focusing on specific kinematics, and in particular, this one on the free prong decay channel. At analysis level, there have been several new analyses which obtained a noticeable gain by using the deep tau identification. And tomorrow there will be an overview shown at the Higgs session at 9.30 by the title Higgs boson measurements in final states with taus at CMS. So let's look forward to the new physics result with tau leptons. Thanks. Okay. Uh, 
uh, questions to Andrea? Uh, okay, uh, I would like to ask questions. Uh, you show that uh, your deep learning technique allows to improve uh, efficiency and decrease fake rate essentially. Uh, and uh, uh, the number of, uh, uh, do you have some room for, for improvement? Uh, for example, by increasing number input parameters, or it's already saturated? We have uh, still some room for improvement, and there are plans for essentially uh, phase two upgrades to have uh, a new version of the architecture to try to optimize further the, um, the fake rejection and the um, efficiency in the section of TAUs. Uh, one thing, for instance, that uh, we uh, are currently improving on is also combining uh, uh, this uh, uh, deep learning technique, also, for instance, to uh, recognize the decay modes uh, of the TAUs on top of this uh, HPS algorithm I talked about. So there is still room for improvement, and there are plans uh, currently in motion. OK, thank you. Uh other questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, think, speaker, and let's move to another presentation, new jet tagging technique at CMS by Dennis Schwartz. Yes, hi everyone. Let me share the screen. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me well and can you see the slides? Yes, we can see your slides and can hear you. Please go ahead. Oh, per okay, perfect. Um, yes, so uh, hi everyone. My name is Dennis and uh, I'm going to talk about new jet tagging techniques at uh, CMS. And as you all know, uh, at the LHC, we have uh, abundant jet production and these jets can have manifold origins. So uh, jets can originate from light and heavy quark flavors. Um, there will be actually a talk uh, focusing on this. Uh, so basically focusing on B-tagging and the discrimination power against uh, light jets and gluon jets. Uh, I think it's actually the next talk. Uh, then you already heard from Andrea, uh, the identification of jets that originate from pile up vertices. And so this makes it possible for me to focus uh, on the last source that I listed here. And these are boosted heavy objects, such as top W, Z, or Higgs bosons, uh, which I will cover in this talk. Okay, so why, uh, why do we care about boosted heavy objects? Uh, a typical example would be a search for uh, new heavy particles that then decay into, into these heavy objects. Uh, so top W, Z, and Higgs. And when these particles are heavy, uh, then the decay products uh, have high transverse momentum typically. And this leads to the fact uh, that we have boosted decays. So uh, we cannot uh, reconstruct the, the decay products of a top, for example, as separate jets, but all uh, decay products merge into a single jet. And this is, uh, sketched here on the bottom where we have uh, in case of a top quark that is that is produced at rest uh, we have three separate jets in the hadronic decay and they all merge into one large jet uh, in the boosted case so how can we identify those jets uh, and the answer is we use jet substructure so basically properties of the jets and uh, two Two common examples is uh, using the n-prong structure of a jet. So uh, there we make use of energy distribution functions. I guess the most prominent example is the n-subjectiness, where usually the ratio, so tau2 over tau1 or tau3 over tau2 is used. And as an example, you see the plot on the, on the right, the top plot, uh, where you can see the two-prong decays of the W, Z, and Higgs against the one prong decay of QCD. And you can nicely see that all these bosons accumulate at low values of the tau to one, and this can be used to identify those jets. Uh, another prominent example is the jet mass. Since the jet 
mass should be sensitive to the original particles mass. Uh, and this is exactly what you can see on the bottom uh, right plot, where we have these nice peaks of all the bosons at their corresponding masses, while uh, in QCD, uh, we have a falling spectrum uh, starting or peaking at, at very low values. So typically, we can use those, uh, yeah, those observables to distinguish jets and uh, identify them. But the question is, can we do better? And obviously, the, the answer is yes. And uh, first example that I would like to show is the boosted event shape tagger, which is called BEST. And here, the idea is that you boost your decay back into the rest frame of the original particle by assuming uh, yeah, the top W, Z, and Higgs mass. And if you catch up the correct boost, then your decay should lead to an isotropic angular distribution. And also, you should be able to see some momentum symmetry in this rest frame. And this uh, momentum symmetry, or better, the momentum asymmetry, uh, is displayed in the plot on the, on the right side, uh, where, for example, when you boost, uh, assuming the W mass on the on the top uh, row of the plots, then you have an asymmetry which is distributed around zero for W jets and for all the other jets you have some other values, and the same also works for the top as the bottom plot shows. And these features, so the information that you can can gain from from boosting into the rest frame of the original particles is then combined with uh, additional jet properties, for example, the end subjectiness or the jet mass in a fully connected neural network. And this can be used then, then to identify those heavy objects. But you can go even further and uh, include even more information about the jet. And this is done, for example, in the deep AK8 algorithm. And this is uh, also a multi class classifier. So you can uh, distinguish tops and also Ws and Zs and so on. And this is a machine learning approach that it makes use of all the particle candidates. So what you actually plug in into your network, into your neural network, is uh, properties of up to 100 jet constituents and also properties of up to seven secondary vertices. And uh, yeah, this, this is an enormous amount of information. So uh, you need this neural network structure to, to really learn something from this. And you start with actually two separate networks, so one for the jet constituents and one for the secondary vertices, and extract uh, features with, with a neural network. And then these features of the two inputs are then later combined with a fully connected layer. So the architecture is uh, sketched there on the, on the top. Um, yes. And on the bottom, you see uh, the discriminator, so the output of this network for the mode uh, where you want to identify top quarks. And uh, it's very nice to see that uh, actually after all this network, we still have a nice data to Monte Carlo agreement in this discriminator value. Um, one thing that uh, Deep AK8 also learns is the jet mass. So you plug in all the jet constituents, but Deep AK8 is able to learn the jet mass. And this also means that it sculpts the mjet distribution in the end, which you can see uh, on the right plot where the deep AK8 in blue really has a shape of a W peak uh, for all jets that pass this requirement. And this makes it difficult for some analyses because you cannot even see resonances on top of your background anymore because your background distribution is sculpted weirdly. And in CMS, we have many decorrelation approaches. Um, I can uh, just uh, show you one here. This is a mass predictor network. So you basically have a second network that tries to predict the, the jet mass of the jet. And then you can assign a penalty to, to your original classifier network if uh, your output is largely correlated with the mass. And with this, you achieve basically a smooth uh, background distribution after the deep uh, after the decorrelation which is shown in the same plot here in the green dotted line which is then the nice spectrum you would assume from from QCD 
In CMS, we have then a large machinery that validates all these taggers and all these performances. And you can see rock curves uh, for all different taggers. Uh, this is also for the top example on the, on the top right. So top versus QCD. And what you can see is that all the machine learning taggers already outperform the classical taggers. So this is really nice to see that deep AK8 here in blue uh, has the largest signal efficiency for uh, the same background efficiency as other taggers. Uh, so this really helps in, in the jet tagging, the, the neural network approach. And then uh, we derive correction factors for all these taggers in order to be able to correct uh, for different efficiencies in data and simulation. And you see some examples in the bottom. And it's very nice to see that basically all the, all the uh, correction factors that we extract are compatible with one or or let's say close to one uh, almost over all range of taggers. And uh, this, is, this is very nice to see. One new example that I would like to show uh, is ParticleNet. And ParticleNet uh, is also a tagger and ParticleNet has actually the same inputs as the deep AK8 algorithm, but has a very different architecture. So, Particle net is a so-called graph neural network. And what, what you basically learn or what, what the network tries to do is to find two particle correlations, so correlations between particles. And this is somehow sketched on the right where you can see uh, decays of uh, the top plot is from a light quark jet and the bottom plot is from a W jet. Uh, so you can already see the one prong or two prong decays here, and these line that that represent uh, basically correlations between all these particles that uh, are the the squares and the the circles that you can see in these planes. And really, just from from changing the architecture of the network and not changing the inputs, uh, you can already gain. So in the performance plot on the bottom left. You see a comparison between the deep AK8 and the particle net. And in this uh, particular phase space that is shown here, uh, this is again the top quark identification, the particle net outperforms the deep AK8 uh, algorithm. So it's not only about uh, including more and more information, but it's also really about creating an, an architecture that can, can make use of all this information. And this uh, brings me to my summary. So uh, I hope I could show you that jet identification is uh, crucial for yeah, most of LHC analyses. And at CMS, we have a large machinery which uh, validates the performance of all these taggers. And as I've shown you, the categorization of jets or the identification of jets uh, already largely profits from machine learning techniques. And there are lots of new taggers that are developed, and uh, they are, yeah, developed to, to even to even better performance. And there's there's even more taggers that I uh, didn't have time to show you. So there's ImageTop, which basically uh, projects also the the uh, decay or the all the particles in a jet on a plane and plugs this into a neural network. And there are classical cut-based taggers such as the CMS top tagger or the hot VR tagger. And yeah, there's, there's much more uh, to read about and uh, much more to come, I guess, in new taggers. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions to Dennis? Maybe I would ask, uh, these are, of course, fantastic applications of ne neural uh, networks. Uh, my question is, uh, are you all, for, for the training of these networks, are you using purely like Monte Carlo or some mix with data or data or how is it? Uh, so I think for, for most of the taggers, this is for now purely simulation based, the training. Okay. And, and uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, other questions? 
Yeah, maybe, maybe one more question uh, is: Are these uh, when when the when the network is uh, trained, is it possible to use it somehow uh, online, or it is always uh, for the offline analysis? Uh, so I only know of the use for for the offline analysis for all these taggers. Mm -hmm. I cannot really think of of somewhere where you can use them online. There is no way how to use it, for example, in the trigger. You mean directly for, for example, yeah, top tagging? Yeah, yeah, you would be selecting online something using this. Hmm. So, I mean, I guess it should be possible, but I, I'm not an expert how this works out in performance and if this is quick enough. Oh, so I okay. guess it's not yeah. quick enough when you use all these constituents because you don't have them at trigger level. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. So let's move to the last presentation of this session. Heavy flare tagging in CMS in round two. Alessandro. Hello, can you see the slides and can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, but cannot see your slides yet. Can you see them now? Yes. Perfect. So I'll be discussing about heavy flavor tagging in CMS in CMS from two. So first, a quick outline of the talk. Of course, jet flavor identification and uh, calibrations are, uh, are quite crucial when it comes to all the, the major physics analysis at HC, for HIG standard model, BSM physics, and so forth. The big quarks are present in a top quark decay, so of course they are uh, of um, paramount importance for such analysis. And also in the case of the Higgs, of course, this is just an example, but the largest Higgs decay branching ratio, branching ratio at 125 GV is in BB bar. So of course we need to achieve a very good tagging performance there. So uh, the, um, this slide is mostly outlining the talk. I'll be giving a very quick introduction of the CMS heavy flavor tagging. Um, defining the main features, then algorithm performance, as well as results for boosted and resolved jets. So the ones which are reconstructed with a large cone or rather a small cone, depending on the kinematics of the final state. Then a little bit more on terms of highlights and application of CMS physics measurements where B-tagging is being used extensively to uh, improve results and also CMS upgrade projects. A little bit more on calibration techniques, the one uh, that actually um, equalize the efficiency response in simulation in, uh, uh, in simulation with respect to, to data. And finally, wrapping up and uh, conclusions. So just to start off, we see this very nice uh, event display where CMS collision is depicted with three jets, which are reconstructed in three um, AK4 um, you know, techniques, and that, as well as a multitude of tracks as well as reconstructed primary and secondary vertices. So let's start off with heavy flavor tagging. Of course, B jets stem from the process of organization of B quarks and we can make use of the properties of B-hadrons to identify such, uh, such um, B-jets, mostly the mask, uh, also the long lifetime that actually creates displaced trucks and secondary vertices, the large momentum that is being carried by B-hadron, which is around 75% of the full momentum, and also the presence of direct and indirect semi decay is coming from the fact that the B can uh, yeah, decay into leptons or through C uh, with branching ratio of around 10, 20, uh, 12%. Now, the, the general um, strategy in CMS and also in general high, level, high energy physics experiment is to make, make use of inputs from le low level taggers, which actually exploit the full feature of the final state and the jet decay topology, such as, for instance, the impact parameter of the trucks associated to the jets, also the presence and the, the shape uh, of the distributions associated to secondary vertices and so forth. And then we combine the information on um, such low level inputs in high level observables uh, which are being fed uh, uh, into the, uh, um, uh, deep, ne uh, deep neural networks or um, uh, boosted decision tree algorithms. So one important feature I'd like to mention here is that actually in CMS uh, over the past couple of years or so, there has, there has been a, a very strong push for developments of uh, deep neural network based techniques, react which actually uh, overperform um, quite dramatically the, uh, the previous results. So let's start off with the first uh, discussion on the tagging inputs for the resolved jets. In this case, as I said, we make use of uh, features which would uh, separate between the light flavor uh, information with respect to CNB uh, jets. For instance, the track impact parameters, the, uh, the secondary vertex features, such as the mass, the flight distance, and so forth. Here you have, for instance, some of the example plots 
where you see the various contributions of light C and B uh, components in blue, green, and red, respectively, and how they uh, behave with respect to data as a function of the, uh, of the input variable. You see that the, that the modeling is, is, is pretty nice throughout the full spectrum. And then, as I said, we make use of um, uh, deep neural network algorithms, in this case, uh, the, the so-called deep CSV in CMS, that is trained on, um, on multi-jet events and also on top quark pair events. And actually, uh, they make use of such input features to, to get a high level um, variable. You see the deep CSV discriminator here in the bottom part of this slide, which provides the B versus light and the B versus C separation. This is then being used, of course, in physics analysis by exploding a selection on such a, uh, such a variable, which attacks the jet with a given efficiency. Another important feature here I'd like to mention is that not only do we uh, need to account for B-tagging, but also for C-tagging, right? So C-tagging is an additional challenge because as you see from here, the, the very well-known plot of the impact parameter, uh, 3D impact parameter uh, significance of tracks associated to B, C, and light, the C component is somewhat between the B, which is of course featured by the very large tail due to the lifetime component and the light part. Therefore, the C discrimination is, is made possible on top of the B1 uh, by exploiting the same deep CSV algorithm with two additional um, output nodes for light and for B, uh, for B discrimination. So let's move on a little bit further. As I said, we've tried to push uh, towards uh, improvement in technology to account for, um, for better tagging. Um, so before we made use of input features, high level input features in deep CSV, um, but then uh, in order to get uh, more performant targets for the final run two legacy results in CMS, we also developed a deep jet, which is actually um, to be considered as a sort of success for a successor of deep CSV. And as I said, it makes use of low level input features, unlike the, the previous algorithm from particle flow candidates. So these actually uh, most notably the properties of charge and neutral particles, which are associated to the, to the final state as well as secondary vertices. And as you see from the rock curve here, we see that for a given budget efficiency point, if we, if we compare the, the performance in terms of MIS-ID probability for deep jet and deep, uh, and deep CSV, which was the old version of the, um, of the tagging algorithm, the, there is a significant performance gain. This mostly comes from the larger set of low-level inputs, which uh, also uh, account for correlations among such inputs inside the network. And also by the fact that we make use of a less restrictive track selection um, and as more suitable, as I said, complex neural network arch architecture. Here you have links to uh, presentations and um, uh, public results from CMS where additional details are, are provided. So let's move on a little bit further. So we've discussed about resolved jets and now it's a uh, let's turn to boosted jets. That has, uh, as already mentioned in the very nice presentation that just came before mine, uh, there are several measurements exploring high PT, uh, uh, the high PT regime in order to mitigate the overwhelming QCD background, which is of course um, uh, the main, um, uh, the, the one that is actually playing a role in most of the physics analysis there. So the, uh, in CMS, the collimated B jets are reconstructed using uh, 0.8 um, cone jets. Um, and as I said, we, we, we do um, exploit um, boosted targets uh, in several physics measurements. Uh, mostly uh, for, for two cases, the, the so-called deep double B and deep AKH, you see here the, the distributions of the results for such targets as a function of the usual signal efficiency. In these two cases, we, uh, we feed the network using boosted features provided, and, and, and the network itself actually provides distinct probabilities for the, the BB signal component versus the light flavor versus the top and versus the QCD background. And of course, depending on, uh, on the analysis and on the, say, the dominant background, um, we can choose the, the most suitable output node. So as already mentioned before, uh, we, we did um, experience a very large gain with respect to previous algorithms. And uh, as you see from the plot here, when we compare the red, the, the red with respect to the blue line, which were based on a kind of uh, simpler architecture. And also we've managed uh, to successfully master correlate the output as already mentioned in the, in the previous presentation. A little bit more on the highlights on B-tagging physics analysis and upgrades before we moving to the second part of the presentation. As I said, several CMS physics measurements uh, have benefited dramatically from the improved B-tagging performance. You have just mentioned two uh, within the Higgs realm. So the, the, the Higgs to BB uh, five sigma discovery that um, 
was achieved a couple of years ago here of a link, and also the inclusive IPT GG Higgs to BB search. Again, uh, more links uh, to presentations and to talks later on in the, in the, in the sessions where Bitangi is playing a leading role. This is not only for, for say, run two uh, analysis, but also for upgrade. Um, in CMS, we've uh, recently released uh, um, technical design report of, on mid-timing detector, in which we improve quite a bit the bitangin characterization by increasing the overall performance, um, accounting for timing information, information associated to the track selection. Here you have the output, uh, the, the uh, results in terms of uh, probability uh, as a function of widget efficiency for different pileup profiles. And you see that we do not uh, lose that much of a performance, even if very high pileup, 200, the one that we expect for Halume C, if we um, introduce a timing selection at the tracking level, and then if we run B target. So let's move on to the second part of the presentation, calibration on data. So the, the technique actually will have to uh, be uh, validated on data in order to ensure that the performance, namely the efficiency, of very favorable tagging in simulation is the same as the one in data. So for that, we exploit several topologies and final state, uh, which are typically enriched in B, C, and light favor jets. For B jets, we exploit TT bar events and uh, events where we enrich them in muons from semi leptonic decays. For C, we exploit the W plus C um, component, and for light flavor uh, jet, we, we make use of QCD uh, multi jet events in which we extract the light, uh, light flavor jets. One important feature to mention is that the majority of calibration methods they calculate scale factors, so the, the data MC uh, efficiency ratios for fixed cut on the discriminator value. So we have a shape and then we we define uh, a given efficiency up to which we, we calibrate. However, in some specific cases, we also uh, fully calibrate the shape of the algorithm. This is most notably, notably the case for deep CSV and deep jet, which is quite useful for physics analysis, such as, for instance, the Higgs measurements in the BB final state, which actually make use of the, of the shape and not just the, the fixed cut operating point. Um, uh, another important feature is that, as you see from the plot here in the bottom part of this slide, we have a full set of calibration methods and sometimes more than one option for a given method in order to ensure the redundancy on, on the outputs and also to exploit the combination of the results. Here, for instance, it's the case of the B calibration, where you see that the various methods do agree quite nicely as a function of one of the jet kinematics we calibrate against, which is the, the, the PT of the jet. So let's quickly go through uh, the, the calibration techniques. First, B jets. In this case, um, uh, as I said, there are two main methods. One which is based on semi-leptonic and dilepton TT bar um, events, where we probe uh, one, uh, sorry, we tag one jet and then we, we probe the other one to determine the efficiency, or we try to um, remove as much as possible the, the, the component from ISR and FSR jets, which is our background for the analysis by exploiting a BDT with kinematic variables. This is the case of the kinematic fit for the TT bar calibration. And then another very uh, reliable method is based on the presence of muon, uh, uh, muon in, the, in the final state. And as you see from the uh, bottom here, the, the plot here in the bottom part of this slide, the, the PT rel information, namely the, 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 the PT of the muon with respect to the jet axis, is actually quite discriminating in the, in the case of B jet here in red with respect to the light and C option. And this is actually being used to, to enrich in this specific flavor, named uh, B, and extract the calibration factors. For C jets, this is uh, um, a bit different because in this case, uh, we exploit the W plus C topology. And in this case, um, W and C are opposite sign. Whereas the background, which is W plus a generic Q, Q bar uh, pair is actually a balance opposite sign, same sign. Therefore, by exploiting this opposite sign minus same sign technique, we can fully enrich uh, the, the sample in W plus C with a signal purity, which is quite, quite large. It's around 60 or 80%, depending on the, on the, on the flavor of the lepton. And from there on, we, we extract efficiency in data in Monte Carlo to get the scale factors as a function of the observable. Another method, as you see from the plot here on the, uh, in the bottom part of this slide, is, to, um, is, uh, is making use of TT bar semi events in which we, again, enrich in C jet. With a, with a dedicated kinematic reconstruction. However, this is actually quite limited, as you see from the plot here, by the statistics of the sample itself, but still it enters the combination with the main W plus C method, which drives, of course, drives of course the measurement. One more. Um... You have one minute left. Okay, so... thanks. Just the last one. 
One more point related to the light flavor jets. In this case, um, as you see, uh, the, the scale factors themselves in the bottom plot um, are quite larger with respect to the one we, we, we extracted from, uh, from C and, uh, and B. And also the mismodeling, uh, uh, which actually creates the up and down variation is around five, 10%, as you see from the, from the systematics band around the, the central value mostly uh, dominated by um, the, the mismeasured trucks. And here we, we make use of the fact that the, the distribution it should be symmetric for light flavor jets uh, in, uh, in, the, in the main observables, especially for instance, the impact parameter and then the non-zero value of such uh, impact parameters come, can only come from, uh, from resolution effects. So I'll be <clears throat> quickly going through the last slide, which just brings, brings me to my conclusion. I've, uh, I've um, I hope I um, I've conveyed the idea that actually heavy flavor tagging is a crucial ingredient for all physics measurements and searches at LHC. I've presented a quick overview of the algorithm developments for B, C, and uh, light um, uh, um, mistag identification. Several new algorithms are, are being deployed. We have a very uh, an excellent background uh, discrimination level, and this has definitely pay, definitely paid off both in terms of searches as well as measurements and upgrade projects where we make use of B tagging such as this CMS flagship analysis using, for instance, VHBB or TTHBB, where, uh, where B-tagging is playing a leading role again. And uh, when it comes to calibration, the, the B and C uh, tagging algorithms are um, also uh, checked against uh, data efficiency. The calibration are, analysis are actually very complex measurements and have largely benefited from a combination of such results uh, by using several methods uh, targeting different uh, phase spaces in order to ensure combinations and redundancy. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions to Alessandro? Uh, so, uh, uh, about calibration, uh, what is the accuracy of calibration do you have? So, it, it, this is actually very um, flavor dependent, as I said. So, for B calibration, um, as you see from this plot, the accuracy is very nice. It's less than 2-3%. And also, it, it's a bit, I mean, dependent on the, on the PT uh, bean we are talking about. And this is a bit less accurate. In the case of the light flavor calibration, you see that the the the, the band around the central value is around five to ten percent, and this is mostly because of the of the modeling of trucks, which is the main uh, uh, say bottleneck for this analysis. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, if not, thank you and thank thanks you so to all speakers of the session. So we a little bit behind of schedule. So uh, let's have five minutes coffee break uh, and we will we resume at uh, seven. Uh, I mean, I think that we can put seven seven twenty easily. Seven twenty uh, and seven twenty. Yeah. Jury will uh, chair yeah. the next session. Yes, thank you very much, Alex. Very good work, and thank you to all the speakers for a very nice uh, presentations. Of course, it is very technical now, but still we have seven talks. So let's start at at seven twenty. I'll be back in like a three minutes and we can we can try also some sharing or you can also try with the ZTA with uh, Tadeash. So please uh, check if you are able to share. So we will have a smooth rest of the session. Thanks.
Hello, just testing my connection. Can you hear me? Yeah, do you hear me? Yeah, perfect. I might just check slide upload as well. Cool. Working fine. Okay, awesome, thanks. <clears throat> yes. Do you see the slide? Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks. Can you see my slides? Yes. Hope so. Now nice. they're gone. Yes, they are changing. Okay. Looks good. Okay, when I when yes uh, when 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 I am checking the uh, speakers if they are present, I I am not able to see Ben Benjamin Taylor. Okay, hopefully, hopefully he will be able to join. Okay, I I think that in principle uh, we can start. So uh, please wait wait a minute just a couple okay. of seconds I'll start the stream. Okay. Okay, I can see you started recording. You can go ahead. Okay, perfect. So uh, this is the last part of the se of this session, the se second session of the track uh, 12. And we will start uh, with uh, Victor with flexible physics selections at uh, 30 megahertz. So Victor, if you can, you can start, share. Okay. <clears throat> Do you see the slides? Yeah, perfect. So you hear me well. So, um, so my name is Victor, and on behalf of the LHCP collaboration, uh, it's my pleasure to discuss flexible physics selections at 30 megahertz. Um, so uh, first thing first, I have to introduce uh, the LHCP trigger in 11112. And the first thing, first thing I want to say is that for general purpose LHC experiments, the signatures were roughly in the kilohertz region in terms of weight. So we doubt that 100 kilohertz was extremely efficient. And LHCB, which was designed to study beauty and charm physics, has or had a rate of BB bar around 45 kilohertz and a charm uh, CC bar rate of uh, roughly one megahertz. So one megahertz readout was a requirement. And the LHCB trigger had to be flexible enough 
to give high efficiency for rare decays such as uh, B2K Stamimu, as well as high purity for child physics uh, with uh, here uh, D2K Pi. So the strategy in one one and one two was to have first a hardware trigger, the L0, followed by two stages of, store of software trigger, HLT1 and HLT2. In upgrade conditions, we have five times the luminosity uh, available during uh, run one or run two. For general purpose LHC experiments, uh, there is no major change in the trigger strategy, but for LHCB, the signal rates will be up to uh, a few 10 megahertz. So uh, having a hardware trigger is actually uh, not possible anymore. And the L0 trigger will be removed. And such high signal rates also change the purpose of a trigger. We go from rejecting backgrounds to categorizing different signal modes. So uh, this is the um, scheme for the HB trigger in one three. Uh, a full software trigger with first uh, with two layers, HLT1, which will be run on GPUs, uh, which has to deal with the detector readout at 30 megahertz, which is uh, the frequency of uh, colliding bunches in the LHC, track reconstruction of charged particles and selections based on single and two tracks, a buffer uh, in between HLT1 and HLT2, and HLT2 dealing with a full reconstruction, the detector alignment and calibration, particle identification, and at least a thousand selections to deal with. To compare with run two, we have five times the luminosity, 30 times higher HLT1 input rate, and the disk buffer is reduced to from a couple of weeks to a couple of days. So this trigger has uh, a number of challenges uh, to, to answer. First, an efficient HLT1 reconstruction at 30 megahertz, uh, that will be discussed uh, by Renato during next talk. A real-time alignment and calibration procedure, which gives offline quality, uh, and Maria will discuss this on Friday, and of course selections that I will uh, discuss in this talk. So, in addition to having to be uh, really fast, uh, a thousand selections to deal with gives a very complex graph and the execution itself has to be optimized. So the trigger selection framework was revisited. Uh, it consists in the data flow, which are um, configurable, configurable sorry, algorithm properties and input and outputs defined by users that create selections, and the control flow, which is what should be run and when to stop. Here on the, on the right, you can see a mock-up of uh, a trigger line, which is based on two uh, sub lines. Uh, so the decision in line one and line two are composite nodes, uh, which means that they can be associated with uh, logic and or, or not. And that there is um, a possibility to execute all children of a composite node. You can also allow for a short circuiting if at least one of the children gives uh, a positive uh, trigger candidate. And uh, at the bottom here, you see basic nodes, which are only one algorithm plus a list of its data dependencies. And here you can have uh, a prefactor, a prescale, a global event cut, and a filter. Um, so for the execution, the data dependency uh, is constructed by matching input and outputs of the different basic nodes. And these basic nodes are then reordered to respect the data constraints. So you go from uh, a slight, slightly complex uh, graph to a single list of ordered 
uh, algorithm to be executed. Uh, and here is, a, is an example of a more realistic uh, trigger selection with uh, algorithms uh, in red, uh, the control flow, and the different objects that pass through uh, in blue. Um, so you go to from um, objects to slightly uh, more elaborated objects to a final decision on your selection. Um, Renato will discuss uh, more uh, VHL2 on itself, but you want to have a quick look on its uh, really good performances. You can see here um, the track rec reconstruction efficiency for tracks uh, coming from BDKs as a function of uh, transverse momentum. Uh, and here you can see the Mion identification efficiency as a function of momentum. And here are the different lines that are run uh, at the HFT1 level. So one track, two track selection, as well as time muons and dedicated uh, charm trigger lines. Uh, and here is the total HFT1 uh, output rate uh, currently. So as I said, HLT2 uh, level uh, has to deal with a really high number of lines, both inclusive and exclusive. So sharing with the fixed 10 gigabytes bandwidth, uh, output bandwidth will be challenging. And this can be optimized using a genetic algorithm uh, where uh, trade, where both rate and efficiencies are taken into account. And there is another layer of flexibility, which is uh, the data output, which can be defined by the user, because um, a trade-off can be achieved between selection rate and even size using Turbo. Um, so, uh, as rate is no longer relevant, uh, and output bandwidth is the major constraint of the HGB trigger in run three. Um, Turbo is the LHGB framework to create reduced event format uh, data. Um, it, in the most extreme case, all raw event uh, is dropped and only reconstructed uh, objects used to create the trigger candidates are uh, saved, which gives an average event size of 15 kilobytes. And it can go all the way up to dropping raw events, but saving all reconstructed objects, uh, which gives 70 kilobytes. And each user designing a selection can define a selective persistency where some parts of the event that can be meaningful for future physics analysis um, can be saved. And here at the bottom, you see the full reconstructed event being saved up to only the trigger candidate uh, being saved and everything in between. Uh, is possible on a case-by-case -case basis. And Turbo has already been proven uh, during Run2. There's also an ongoing uh, effort on improving HLT2 performances. Efforts uh, were um, concentrating on HLT1 first, but are now shifting towards um, HLT2. And here is the, is the current breakdown of the throughput for the HLT2 reconstruction. Um, brand two selections are currently being ported to the new framework uh, with positive feedbacks from users. And the integration of the HLT2 with HLT, HLT1 uh, being run on GPUs uh, is um, also ongoing. So um, to conclude, the HGB trigger in run three, in run three will have high rates, meaning that we go from rejecting backgrounds to selecting signals. 
and from optimizing rate to optimizing bandwidth. It will be a full software trigger with a detector readout at 30 MHz, HLT1 on GPUs at 1 MHz, and HLT2 on CPUs with fixed bandwidth of 10 GB per second. And flexible selection will be achieved with a framework to reorder algorithm based on user-defined inputs and outputs, and a reduced event format uh, for storage with flexible user settings. Current developments are uh, primarily targeting improving HLT2 performances, um, bringing new selections uh, to problem free, and preparing for commissioning. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Uh, questions? Are there any questions? Uh, nothing on on Metromost. Uh, actually, I would have a question. Uh, actually, what is the what is exactly the reason why using the uh, GPUs for uh, the first level and the CPUs uh, for the second? It is just the speed, or so. Oh, um... It's a mixture of performances uh, and physics performances. The HLT1 on GPUs uh, has proven to be cost effective uh, and uh, being able to give better uh, physics performances. But for HLT2, as we have a buffer, we have more time to process and um, uh, HLT2 and, and GPUs won't be uh, cost effective, I think. Okay. And the second question uh, what is actually limiting the bandwidth? Uh, uh, storage. Uh, how many disks we can buy? Ah, okay. So, so no, no problem with cables or something like this, just the storage? Uh, yes, this is definitely the major uh, constraint. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, thank you very much again. And uh, we will move to the second presentation, which is Renato. Yeah, can you um, hear me? Yes. You, yes. Can, you can try to share. Yes. Can you see my slide? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Uh, do you see the first one? Yes. Okay, so hi everybody. Today I'm going to talk about the physics and the throughput performance of the real time reconstruction at the LACB upgrade. So, the LACB detector, as uh, briefly introduced by, <clears throat> by Victor, it's a high precision experiment at LAC optimized for BNC addon decays. Here it's a sketch with the various sub detectors uh, highlighting the detectors responsible of tracking and the ones responsible of particle identification for charge. Uh, particles final states. It has shown excellent performance in run one and run two and more details can be found in the talk from Martina. And uh, the detector is designed as a forward arm spectrometer because in photon proton collision, the BB bar and CC bar are produced boosted in the forward region. Now, apart from the sub detectors uh, performance, it's important that you take decisions and select events in an efficient way. And uh, here it's a sketch of the trigger schemes and how it has evolved uh, during run one and run two, and how it will be look like in run three. Uh, as Victor said, the run one and run two has been characterized by the presence of an hardware trigger, which uh, we're aiming to reduce the 40 megahertz input rate from the proton proton collision to a one megahertz event rate, which was the limitation of the readout of the whole uh, detector, detectors, the tracking system, for example, and this one megahertz input rate were then uh, passed to a software trigger split in two steps, one aiming to further reduce the rate from one to 100 kilohertz and performing just a partial reconstruction of the events, taking some selections and then going to the second stage. And during run one, uh, the output of the trigger were, was expressed in kilohertz, meaning in events per second, and the reconstruction was performed uh, again offline uh, with alignment and calibration constants updated. In run two, this has changed with the real-time alignment and calibration uh, paradigm, which uh, consists in having this intermediate buffer 
perform the alignment and calibration and offline quality information directly in the online system and perform analysis directly from the trigger, which uh, triggers directly to what is going to happen in run three, where the, the hardware trigger will be completely removed and uh, the full uh, non-empty bunch crossing rate will be reconstructed at collision time, basically with a 30 megahertz input rate. The event rate will be reduced by the partial event reconstruction uh, from HLT1 to 1 megahertz, so again with the buffer, and then you run HLT2 and the selections that Victor presented, which converts the output rate from kilohertz to gigabit per second, because uh, as Victor explained, you start to optimize the final bandwidth and not anymore the event rate. Now, all this change in run three impose that you, have, have, you must be able to read out the wall detector at 40 megahertz. And uh, the main reason behind this is that LACD in run three uh, expects to operate at five times higher instantaneous luminosity, which means that for each single collision, almost one out of three of them will have a CC bar or a DVR hadron which shifts the trigger paradigm from rejecting background to categorizing signal base. <clears throat> and moreover, you have much more TVs, more tracks and more signal, which uh, comes back a bit to the basics. Uh, how, how can you actually trigger in LACB an event which is from a B or from a C hadron? What are the kind of informations you need? So if a particle comes from a B or a C hadron, it has a transverse momentum at the order of GB, at least in one of the final states. Then uh, those tracks originate uh, displaced from uh, any primary vertex, and you can identify for a single track how it is displaced for a single, from a single primary vertex, or when you combine more than one track, uh, you can find some uh, secondary vertices and evaluate how displaced it is. The challenge here on three is exactly this, uh, be able to find those PVs and tracks and uh, find the momentum and transverse momentum of them and uh, possibly identify also the the type of track, for example, if it's a muon or not, in real time, so directly at 30 megahertz input rate. So you need to perform this track reconstruction at collision rate, which is a huge computing challenge. And this huge computing challenge in LACB has been tried to be solved in two different approaches, which landed in two different TDRs. One using CPUs, where the HLT1 reconstruction was executed in the server farm after shipping the 30 megahertz input rate from the event builder. And the other approach, which is what is going under the name of Allen project, is to do that on GPUs, where you plug the GPU cards directly on the servers uh, available in the event builder. You run the reconstruction, you take selections, and you ship out a 1 megahertz output to the server farm, which performs the full event reconstruction and selection and storage to this. The final decision uh, taken by the LACB experiment is to use GPUs uh, for the HLT1. And one of the major benefits of doing that, apart of being cost effective, is that it allows to reduce the network bandwidth between the event builder and the server farm, and as well free up uh, the filter farm to perform the full event reconstruction on, G on, G on CPUs. Now, what, what does it mean, uh, this HLT1 reconstruction? What are the tasks that has been implemented that are uh, fulfilling the requirements of the LACB upgrade? So here it's a brief scheme of how it will work. So you have uh, the servers in the event builder, builder, which will ship the raw data to the GPUs, uh, which uh, will decode and prepare the data and the value subdetector to use the reconstruction, perform reconstruction, make decisions, and then uh, the, the, the events that you select will be sent to the, to the filter farm. Now, the HLT1 uh, is composed by various uh, small uh, uh, algorithms, which composed, uh, are composed by data preparation in various subdetectors, in particular the tracking subdetectors and the muon system, and reconstruction in the various subdetector, and I will describe later the C reconstruction sequence that is executed. And at the end, take selections based on information of one track or two tracks. Now, uh, LACB has developed all of this on GPUs. And when you deal with that, you need to know how to actually parallelize on GPUs. And the scheme that has been followed is to pipeline many HLT1 reconstruction sequence across thousands of events in parallel for each GPU cards. And within each event, you parallelize uh, the, the the single algorithm. So depending on the task, uh, you typically parallelize in different way. 
just as an example, for raw data decoding in the various subdetector, you parallelize not only across the events, but also across the readout units. While for track reconstruction, for example, in pattern recognition, you want to assign or add hits to a given track candidate, so you can parallelize across the combinations of hits that you're building along the way. And if you have a C tracks, you can parallelize as well across the C tracks that you're dealing with. Now, the first uh, algorithm that runs on this uh, reconstruction is the velo tracking, which uh, uses the vertex locator for the upgrade. The detector is placed co close to the interaction point, so you have uh, you have all the kind of tracks which comes out from proton-proton collision. And uh, typically, in this region, you have uh, basically a you have no magnetic field, which means that all tracks behave as straight lines in the bending and non-bending plane. And this implies that all tracks are more or less uh, all uh, contained within a given phi azimuthal angle uh, uh, region. The way in which this has been implemented and parallelized for GPUs is to interleave uh, steps, one uh, called seeding, where uh, you iterate over all possible three heat combination from three consecutive modules from the, from the velo, and you build uh, all those combinations in parallel, and then you forward them to the next module, and uh, given the alignment in phi, you, you, you basically maximize and optimize the, the, the structure such that those heats will be exposed for maximally mm, to get, I mean, to well, get the fastest algorithm as possible. Uh, benefiting from the spatial and temporary locality of that. And then you interleave this with another seeding step and forward. Now you have segments in the velo and uh, you propagate them uh, to the upstream tracker, which is the tracker uh, which is placed uh, upstream the dipole magnet. Between the velo and the UT, there is a small magnetic field bending of those tracks, which are accounted for when looking for search windows. The upstream tracker is, uh, is a four-layer detector, and each, uh, and each layer has uh, some uh, sector sectors where you can identify the Y and X regions uh, within the heats are falling. And given the projections of the input tracks, uh, the algorithm is parallelized to look up to the sector ranges and then combine all the layers within the same sector ranges to build up the, the segments which will match the velo input track. Even that there is a small bending field, uh, at this step you also have uh, an information with a resolution of around 20% of the momentum of the track that you have reconstructed. And you use this information to find the full track across the full spectrometer, which basically after the upstream track, you integrate the whole magnetic field and you, the track flies to the scintillating fiber tracker which is composed by 12 layers. And given that you have uh, an information on the momentum, you can open a search window across all the layers and uh, collect all the possible leads uh, which could match the input track. You start combining the triplets from the three layers having the bigger level arm between the, <clears throat> between the three stations. And uh, you select those triplets uh, with some parametrization of the magnetic field within the sci-fi. And then those triplets are forward there. All this happens in parallel. All triplets are constructed in, in parallel for each, for each input track, and then you forward all uh, triplet candidates to the other module. Now you have the full track passing the spectrometer, and you want to know if it's a muon, and this is what uh, the muon AP does. You project the track that you have found in the sci-fi to the muon stations, and within a field of interest, you look for matching it uh, in the X and Y plane, and if all the stations are fired, you assign the muon uh, the muon tag to those tracks. <clears throat> now you have all the tracks with the momentum and so on, and you need also the primary vertices in the events. Those are reconstructed starting with the velo tracks that I discussed a few slides back. And the algorithm has been initial, has been developed for the for, for the CPU to, to get the maximum throughput and has been ported to GPU. And it is based on an histogramming technique along the beam axis where all velo tracks are projected to the point of closest approach. And then a peak finding algorithm uh, finds the position of the vertices. And then the vertices are fitted. Uh, and here you can see the final resolution that we get on the primary vertex position in this uh, real-time reconstruction using Allen uh, in, as a function of uh, the, the resolution in the x direction and the z direction of the primary vertices. <clears throat> 
Now let me talk about the track reconstruction efficiency. This is a scheme of the various sub-tracking uh, algorithms that I've just described, Velo, Velo, UT, and SciPy. And as you can see here, the performance in the Velo is excellent, uh, almost 100%. So it's finding all the possible uh, reconstructible tracks uh, coming out from a BD case. Then in the Velo UT, you, you start doing some selections on the, on the search windows and so on, which introduce this turn on, and then you do the sci-fi track. Now for HLT1, what you care about is high transverse momentum track. So already here, you can see that you are more above 90% efficiency for the kind of tracks that you care about to take selections. But the tracking down to zero PT is already implemented in Allen in the GPU, and this could cost only up to 20% extra on the GPU resources. And it will improve significantly the, per it is the performance at low PT. Here it's the momentum resolution that you get out of this reconstruction sequence, which is below 1%, and it's pretty good as a function of momentum. And the neon AD efficiency, which is well above 90%, the primary vertex reconstruction efficiencies, uh, which uh, is as well uh, pretty good, and the neon uh, pi onto new misidentification efficiency as well. Now you have the tracks, you have the primary vertex, so you, you have to take some selections uh, for events to reduce the rate from 30 megahertz to one megahertz. And as you can see from this table, the pass through is uh, you let pass everything. So it's the input rate. It's a line, th those block here is uh, lines which are non-physics related in some extent, but just are just operational ones. And the, the goal is to have all of those selections tunable such that you can ship out a one megahertz output rate. And as you can see from this table, this is uh, achieved with this uh, reconstruction and selection and so on. And several lines are already implemented for exclusive modes and calibration ones as well the single track, track neon and true tracks and so on. And then you can tune those, uh, those lines to match the one megahertz output. Uh, and here you have a table with efficiencies that you get on several decay modes. And this already shows that uh, this reconstruction sequence and selections is fulfilling a broad range of decays of interest for the lazy D upgrade program. <clears throat> and uh, ongoing, uh, we, are, we are adding uh, many more selections in this, uh, in this framework. Now let me talk about the performance, the computing performance of the HLT1 reconstruction. Here it's a, a throughput uh, of the reconstruction sequence on various uh, GPU cards, <clears throat> and the One minute. and the scale, yes, and the scaling of the of the throughput as a function of the theoretical 32 bits teraflops. And as you can see from the plot, uh, the scaling is pretty good. So with new generation GPU cards, uh, it's expected to further improve. And let me just highlight that uh, this uh, 30 megahertz reconstruction can be processed uh, using 215 GPU cards and the available slots are 500, meaning that there are large rumors of still of improving this. And that's why I'm saying here that uh, LACB is planning as well to expand uh, uh, the HLT1 reconstruction in as, more, as many more as possible algorithms like PID, long lived track reconstruction, optimized track reconstruction for LA. Now uh, I land to the conclusion. I've not covered the full event reconstruction. I have some slides in the backup, but uh, I hope I convinced that uh, the LACB is almost ready to face the megahertz signal area, changing the trigger paradigm that goes from background rejection to signal selection and characterization. As Victor said, uh, at the end of the chain, uh, you do not anymore uh, optimize for an event rate reduction, but a bandwidth reduction with the storage to disk. And LACB has undergone a major detector and data acquisition system upgrade. The partial event reconstruction will be performed at 30 megahertz using GPUs, and the one performing the full event reconstruction with an input rate of one megahertz will be performed on CPU. And currently, the, 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 main, uh, the main topics LACB is covering is to improve the computing performance of the HLT2 add as many more selections as possible and get ready for commissioning and possibly expand the GPU potentialities in HLT1 as much as possible. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Please. It's, yeah, it's very interesting actually. Uh, 
Actually, wh wh why there is uh, no more possible the hardware trigger? Like a very general question, or it it would would it be possible to do have a hardware uh, hardware trigger and what uh, hardware you would have to use for it? So I mean, the, the reason why we drop the hardware trigger is because already run through, as you can see in this backup slide, on Adronic final states of the B Adron in order to keep. Uh, a readout limit and a readout limit of one megahertz. You have to start tightening up uh, more and more the thresholds, limiting the the capabilities of the detector itself uh, at increasing luminosity. So the point is that the signal rate is so high that a single sub detector will not be possible in principle to select efficient okay. So you want to have the the flexibility to switch between one decay mode and another and optimize based on the P6 case probably during the run period will become more and more important for the LACB P6 program. I think this is one of the key aspects of having okay. at the So start. I would expect that before you were, uh, you start to Yes, I cannot hear anymore. Yes, I lost you too. Can you still hear me? I can hear you, but I cannot hear you. See. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, thanks. Uh, sorry, sorry, my, my Zoom is slightly bad. So my question was, uh, if you if you actually, before you were, uh, you start the upgrade of your hardware, if it was already optimized for this plan with the, for the triggering? Yeah, so let's say that the hardware update were necessary because of the Iger occupants in the various sub detectors and also to be able to get the readout at 40 megahertz. So the whole upgrade uh, consisted uh, in upgrading this, the tracking sub-detectors, so for example, in the Velo using pixel sensors instead of uh, R5 sensors, improve the momentum resolution uh, uh, in the Velo UT stage, such that you can take some selections and optimize the search windows uh, for the full tracking. So some studies uh, were done on the way to structure your sub-detectors to get uh, a reconstruction sequence, which was uh, hopefully fast enough and you can decode the, the, the detector of fastly enough. But then uh, the reconstruction sequence uh, is very similar to what you do in run one, run two, but with different detectors. So many developments and uh, improvements on them uh, has been put in place, taking advantage of the, for example, that in the Velo you get directly X, Y, Z, while before you had to combine more information to get a position. And uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the, the, the detector upgrade that has been done was necessary to cope for the Iger multiplicity and Iger, uh, and Iger occupants in the virus of the detector and sustain the radiation environment and so on. Then uh, algorithms have been written for the upgrade, uh, were working quite well, but they were super slow. And then uh, we have spent a lot of time and energies on uh, uh, developing the multi-threaded framework for CPUs, uh, parallelizing algorithms with uh, CMD instruction and so on. And then uh, two years ago, the GPU project uh, uh, appeared and uh, all the reconstruction sequence has been re-implemented with some more freedom with respect to the framework that was shared between HLT1 and HLT2, which allows to shuffle around the data structures you were dealing with to optimally parallelize uh, the algorithms. So in some extent, uh, the, the only interplay between detector and software is the way in which you ship your sub-detector readout and the links. So you get, for example, in some sub-detectors, each it's which are already sorted by construction. So you don't need to resort things at software. So those are the kind of uh, tweaks that has been done in a later stage with respect to 
with a tech okay. then so okay thank you very much thanks uh thank you and so so we have a time to move to other presentation uh so we will move from LHCB now to bell so bell 2 and it should be better uh yes just to confirm are you able yeah. to hear me and, yeah. and see my slides perfectly okay very nice okay let me begin so um good morning or good evening to you all depending on your time zone and in this talk, I will be presenting the measurement of the Bell 2 trigger efficiency, more specifically the level one efficiency uh, for tau pair events. Okay, let's begin with a brief overview of SuperKEC B. Um, so SuperKEC B is an energy asymmetric electron positron accelerator located at KEK in Tsukuba, Japan. And the facility will enable searches for new physics by studying B, D and tau lepton decays and it represents a major upgrade of the uh, prior KEKB accelerator. For example, it has higher beam counts and it utilizes the um, so-called nanobeam scheme. So the capacity to reach uh, a 50 nanometer vertical beam spot size during the collisions. And this will allow it to reach an unprecedented luminosity of around six by 10 to the 35, which is roughly uh, 30 times higher than at KEKB. In fact, if you're not aware, just last month, um, SuperKEC B broke the peak luminosity world record. And in 2016, the accelerator had its first beams in commissioning. In 2017, the Bell 2 detector was uh, rolled into the collision point and it recorded its first collisions in April of 2018. Okay, uh, on the right here, you can see a diagram of the Bell 2 detector. So it keeps the general design of the previous Bell detector but with some major upgrades to its subsystems. So the vertex detector is located closest to the collision point, and it uh, currently consists of uh, effectively um, one pixel layer and four layers of silicon strips that uh, together provide improved tracking and vertex resolution. Then going further out comes the um, central drift chamber, so CDC, which has a larger volume with uh, smaller drift cells compared to Bell. And then further out, there are the new A-rich and um, top systems that provide uh, improved particle ID in the forward and barrel regions. And then surrounding this is the uh, electromagnetic uh, calorimeter. And then um, finally, furthest away from the collision point is the k and muon detector. Okay, uh, so Bell 2 began its so-called um, phase three of data taking in March of last year. And this figure uh, here summarizes the weekly recorded and total integrated luminosity during this period. So as you can see, we have recorded around uh, 74 uh, in this film to so far. And the results I will show today uh, are only for the 2019 data set. So around 90 this from advance. So we are still in the uh, very early stages of the Bell 2 program. And over the next 10 or so years, we aim to collect uh, 50 inverse out of bounds of data, which is a factor of 50 more than at Bell. Okay, so SuperKEC B delivers events at a rate that goes beyond the capacities of the um, data collection network and the data storage systems of Bell 2. And at the design luminosity, uh, the physics rate is around 20 uh, kilohertz. So the table on the right shows the breakdown of this rate amongst different physics processes. And as you can see, um, tau pair production makes up around 30%, uh, th 3% of this rate, sorry. Um, there is also the uh, machine background to contend with. So, uh, which are much larger than at Bell, and they come mainly from Tushek and beam gas scattering. And together, they increase the trigger rate significantly. And the hardware level one performs the critical task of reducing the average physics plus background rate um, to a maximum of, of 30 kilohertz. And the requirements of this system are um, high efficiency, not only for high, but also for low multiplicity physics, a fixed lat latency of about five microseconds, a timing precision uh, um, 10 nanoseconds of less than 10 nanoseconds and a minimum two event separation of um, 200 nanoseconds. Okay, and on the right here, you can see a schematic overview of the level one trigger. Roughly speaking, uh, there are four sub, sub triggers that send their outputs to the global decision logic where the final online uh, trigger decision is made. And the two main sub triggers which are studied here in, in this, uh, what's shown in this presentation are the uh, CDC and ECL triggers uh, which are highlighted here in blue. And the main, the main function of the CDC trigger is 2D track finding, while for the ECL trigger, it computes the total energy sum 
uh, finds isolated clusters and identifies barbar-like events, for example. I'll give some more details in the coming slides. Okay, so tau pair events provide a nice test bed of the L1 performance uh, in the early data for low multiplicity physics. So first of all, you know, uh, tau pair production has a relatively large cross section. And also with tau decays, you get a wide variety of low multiplicity signatures with tracks, so electrons, muons, and pions, and the clusters, so also including the pi zeros. And here I summarize uh, how we uh, reconstruct the tau pair events for this trigger study. First, we require the tracks to be either one by three or one by one with respect to the thrust axis, as shown in this diagram on the left. Then we reconstruct six decay channels, depending on whether the tracks originate from uh, electrons, muons, or pions. So there's a likelihood ID. Um, for one by three prong decays, so four track events, we consider the uh, E3 pi, mu3 pi, and pi3 pi channels. Whereas for the two track events, so one by one prong, we consider the E mu, mu pi, and mu mu channels. We then apply some additional selections to suppress the non tau backgrounds. So, for example, for one by three prong events, um, we required the thrust value to be um, uh, below some value, uh, to be above some value, sorry, to help suppress the QQ bar, as you can see here. And also, we apply some upper threshold on the total visible energy to suppress mainly um, iterative bar bar uh, events. Several other selections are applied, uh, which I list here, including cuts on the number of reconstructed pi zeros and additional um, high energy photons in, uh, in each hemisphere. Okay, now let's go into some results. So here I show the uh, overall level one efficiency for a one by three prong events for uh, uh, several combinations of um, unprescaled CDC and ECL triggers. So uh, keep in mind that the trigger decision is made independently using only the CDC information or ECL information. And this allows us to perform a data-based measurement of the per event trigger efficiency. So the strategy as shown in this equation um, is to measure a particular trigger's efficiency with respect to a set of orthogonal reference triggers. So for CDC triggers, we use the ECL triggers as a reference and um, vice versa. The trigger combinations um, that, are, uh, that are shown in this plot are those that we found to have the highest efficiency for the tau events. So going from left to right, they include the CDC triggers that require at least uh, two or at least three full tracks. The short track triggers, so I'll explain full and short tracks a bit later. Um, the ECL energy, ECL energy threshold, cluster counting, uh, cluster topology, uh, cluster energy, and finally ECL a dimuon trigger. And as you can see, the CDC triggers um, perform rather well in all three channels. And as you would expect, the ECL energy threshold trigger has a highest efficiency where there is an electron on the one prong side, shown here in um, blue. And the cluster counting triggers perform well, especially in the pi three pi channels um, uh, where you have more clusters from the pi zero, so shown here in green. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I show the same thing, but for the one by one prong decays. Here again, as you would expect, the CDC trigger, which requires at least two full tracks, has high efficiency. And the trends for the ECL triggers are sort of similar to before. So where we have an electron, the energy sum trigger has highest efficiency. And uh, uh, where we have more pi zeros, the cluster counting triggers perform better, generally speaking. Okay, the main uh, CDC triggers target uh, what I called before full tracks. So these tracks pass through all the axial CDC superlayers and reach the barrel as shown in this um, bottom left figure. Um, as a result, um, the full track triggers will have a drop in efficiency in the end cap. So this can be seen by looking at the blue points in these two plots, which show the uh, per event efficiency as a function of the theta of the track with um, minimum PT. And to compensate for this drop in efficiency, we, use so, we have so-called short track triggers, which have been operational since October last year. And here, short tracks are those that pass through the innermost five um, axial plus uh, stereo superlayers, reaching the end caps or curling back inside uh, the barrel. And as you can see, by comparing uh, the blue and orange, um, the short tracks provide a significant boost in the efficiency, ranging from five to 40%, depending on, on the track detail. Uh, here I show the same thing, but as a function of track PT. 
And as you can see, uh, by comparing again blue and orange, the short tracks provide a substantial gain in efficiency, special, especially for low PT. And of course, this will have a positive impact on tau and other low multiplicity physics. Another important uh, class of triggers for tau physics are the ECL energy threshold triggers. So here, a sum is performed um, um, over what we call trigger cells. So these are trigger towers of four by four um, crystal granularity. And the current lowest energy unprescaled trigger has a one GeV uh, energy threshold. And uh, this performs well for tau pair events that deposit the most energy in the ECL. So as we saw earlier, I think on slides five and six or so, uh, but uh, this includes the tau, the tau to enu nu leptonic modes and the hadronic modes, including the pi zeros. On the right here, you can see the overall um, efficiency for this trigger as a function of the uh, total cluster energy. And as, you ex as we expect, we see quite a sharp turn on around one GV. We do observe some drop in efficiency at high energy, especially for one by three prong events. We suspect this is coming from um, uh, the Baba veto requirement, which is uh, constantly in a state of development. So this will improve in the future. So, so far we have seen the trigger performance for standard model tau decays, but now let's look at a um, particular example of a new physics search. So first some motivation. So due to neutrino oscillation, we know that lepton flavor violation occurs in the neutrino sector, but so far we have uh, no experimental evidence for LFE with the charged um, leptons. If we minimally extend the standard model to include neutrino masses, then LF, charged LFE can occur through loops as shown here, but this is suppressed to the fourth power of the neutrino masses. So it's branching ratios are too small to ever be observed. However, um, um, if we did observe some signature of charge LFV, uh, then this would definitely be uh, some indication of new physics. So as you can see here on the right, the mu to E transitions have already been heavily constrained. Uh, on the other hand, the tau transitions um, shown in blue um, have weaker bounds coming mainly from Bell and Barba. And new physics can typically enter at the 10 to the negative 10 or negative seven level where Bell and Barba were already entering the interesting regime. So Sensitivity studies for Bell 2 indicate that it will push the current um, tau LFE bounds forward by at least uh, one order of magnitude. And one of the golden channels for tau LFE discovery is tau to three muons. You can find more details in, in the, um, on this search in the talk by Inami-san on Friday. Um, now tau, tau to three mu is one of, the most, one of the more challenging signatures to trigger on at level one. Um, and to study the L1 efficiency for this signature in real data, our strategy was to use um, the standard model one by three prong uh, tau decays. So three pions instead of three muons. And the events were then required to pass the similar signal selections to the LFV search, which are listed here. So in this way, the standard model process have, has, is made to have LFV-like kinematics. So in Bell 2, we have several new, what we call low multiplicity ECL triggers that have requirements on, for example, um, the number of clusters, the cluster theta region, energy and topology. And amongst these triggers, we have found that uh, the at least three cluster trigger performs best. Um, on the right here, you can see the measured efficiency for this particular trigger as a function of the delta E on the signal side tau. And yeah, almost finished. And uh, where we expect the signal, so around delta E equals zero in this orange region, uh, we reach an efficiency of around 95%, which outperforms quite a bit the CDC triggers, which are typically used in these kinds of analyses. Um, on this slide, I show the same thing, but split according to whether the um, one prong track is identified as a, a muon, a electron, or pion. And here, as you would expect, the plateau efficiency is higher where we have the more highly energetic uh, electron cluster, or where we have more clusters coming from additional pi zeros. Um, okay, this brings me to my final slide. So yeah, um, the level one trigger system plays a very important role in enabling um, tau and other low multiplicity physics at Bell 2. Um, we have studied the L1 efficiency in tau pair events, so one by three and one by one prong the case. And we observe overall good performance in the early data. Uh, you can find uh, the uh, recent public plots here. Um, we observe some drop in the CDC full track triggers, 
when we have at least one of the tracks in the end caps. This is also the case in Bell 1, um, and it impacts most the one by one prong events. And uh, we have some new short track triggers which show great promise. Um, and we have some new ECL low multiplicity triggers, which, as we have seen, will play a, an important role in upcoming tau LFB results from Bell 2. Um, just very briefly, the topic of this talk is mainly performance, but there are some level one developments uh, in the pipeline um, coming mainly relating to the CDC trigger. So generally speaking, um, we, we now try to reduce the background rates by utilizing 3D tracking at level one. Um, in particular, there is this neuro Z trigger, which is trained on data to compute the um, Z0 within the level one latency and with a good resolution with respect to offline. And with this, it should be able to keep the level one rates significantly lower, which is of course very important once the luminosity really starts ramping up. And this will keep the, um, hopefully keep the triggers unprescaled and the thresholds as low as possible, which is important for tau and low multiplicity physics. Okay, that's all for me. Um, thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much. My nice presentation, quick question. Okay, I, I would have maybe the quick question. So, uh, why why actually the silicon silicon tracker is not included in in the hard uh, hardware trigger or level one trigger? I think it's. Um, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily an expert on this, but I suspect it's an issue with uh, readout limitations. Mm -hmm. So, um, lots of the, um, the let's say the main components of the level one Bell two trigger was inherited from Bell one. And um, it was decided that it wouldn't be feasible to have uh, the um, readout uh, be high enough to facilitate using the, definitely not the PXD or even the SVD. I, I'm not sure if there, I, 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 I think it's a really a hard limitation, but perhaps people are thinking maybe in the longer future to perhaps include this, but for now it, it's not feasible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much again. So. Uh, we will we'll move to uh, other talk, which will be uh, Mario from Atlas. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. You can okay. Share. Yeah. Um, okay. Can you see that? Mm, yes. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, as I said, my name is Mario Grandi. Um, I will be presenting the Atlas Inner Detector Trigger Performance in Proton-Proton Collisions at 13 TeV during the uh, LHC Run 2 on behalf of the Atlas collaboration. So, let me begin by highlighting the importance of triggers uh, in Atlas. So, here I have the uh, for invariant mass distribution for, for leptons from the, uh, the decay process of Higgs to four leptons. Uh, using the full run to data set. The level of precision shown here is only possible because of the high performance of the leptonic triggers. Uh, and it's important to stress that every, tr uh, every event was selected because of the successful operation of the tracking in the leptonic triggers. So the track and vertex being construction within the Atlas detector is done by the inner detector, which is an, uh, a dedicated Atlas sub detector um, and it consists of three subsystems. Uh, the pixel detector, which is the closest to the beamline and the interaction point, and is shown in the diagram by the, the dark green and lighter green uh, bands, uh, which, is, which consists of three layers of barrel and end cap silicon pixel modules and an insertable B layer, which was added in run two. Uh, then in the blue band, we have the semiconductor tracker which consists of four barrel and nine end cap layers of silicon microstrip modules. And finally, in the orange band, we have the transition radiation tracker, which consists of a barrel uh, of barrel and end cap modules of straw drift tubes. So the Atlas trigger system is separated into a hardware stage uh, called level one, which identifies region of interests and a software stage uh, called high level trigger which processes uh, these uh, ROIs identified by, by the level one. So the ID trigger is part of the, uh, of the HLT system and performs the online track and vertex finding. Uh, and it's important to highlight that, that these tracks are essential in triggers for nearly all physics signatures. And that as pileup increases, tracking becomes even more important. And that is the most complex aspect of the trigger and very computationally intensive. 
So one of the main tasks for the HLT is, to, is that it needs to reduce the peak data rates from approximately 100 kilohertz down to approximately 1.5 kilohertz. And that um, the pixel and SCT cannot be read out in L1 and the earliest is in the HLT. So to ensure the speed while maintaining high performance, two main strategies are used. There's a base, uh, baseline single stage uh, strategy, which consists of a data preparation stage where the detector elements are reconstructed for a given spatial ROI. Then it's then followed by a fast tracking stage where the fast track finder algorithm is run, which is optimized for track finding efficiency and providing initial track fit and, param uh, and track parameters. And finally, it's followed by a, a precision tracking algorithm which applies the offline track fit using tracks from the, from the fast track finder and extends them to the TRT and runs ambiguity, ambiguity solver algorithms to remove duplicate tracks. The other strategy is the multi-state strat, strat, strategy, which is used for more complex objects such as tau or B jets and consists of two stages. So the first stage, in, in the first stage, it performs an initial fast track finder uh, tracking uh, algorithm in a narrow width ROI, but extended uh, along the entire beam line as shown in the diagram on the left by the uh, dark purple um, uh, area. And there it determines tracks or vertex of interest. Uh, it then is followed by the second stage where the tracks identified in the first uh, region of interest are, are used as seed to, for the second ROI, which is uh, in a narrow range along the beam line, but wider in E10 phi, as shown in the diagram on the left now with the, with the blue area. In, the, in this new ROI, it then performs the second stage uh, FDF, and then, uh, which is then followed by the precision tracking again. So what we find is for uh, when tracking muons in, uh, with pileup of, uh, uh, with mean pileup of 52, is that the fast track finder runs in uh, on average in around 40 milliseconds per ROI. Uh, on the other hand, the precision tracking only runs in uh, on average in approximately seven milliseconds per ROI as it uses the, the tracks seeded from the um, FDF. In, the, in this diagram, I'm also showing the isolation tracking, which is one in a wider ROI after selection of full muon candidates to establish muon isolation. And so this runs in, on average, in approximately 116 milliseconds per ROI due to this. Uh, on the other hand, the multi-stage tracking um, for um, uh, a tau trigger reduces the, the fast track finder computation time from approximately 66 milliseconds when run as a single stage down to uh, on average to approximately 46 milliseconds if we combine uh, the first and second stage. This is because although part of the detector about the tau track is processed twice, the overall volume uh, is lower than if done in by a single stage. So the tracking efficiency and resolutions are measured by comparing the tracks found by the online trigger algorithms to the tracks found by the full offline track reconstruction. Uh, a tag and probe analysis is used to select muons candidates coming from the decay of the Z boson where the tag muon is fully selected in a muon spectrometer and inner detector, whereas the probe muon is selected based on the muon spectrometer reconstruction alone without the use of the inner detector tr uh, trigger tracks and therefore is completely unbiased by the inner detector reconstruction. So what we find is that we have very high efficiencies, even up to one TV in a, in a, a track uh, momentum and above 99% efficiencies, even at large transverse impact parameter uh, values. As well, we have very good resolutions that are better than 20 micrometers for full range of TDD values for the muons. Uh, similarly to the muons for the elections, we use an election tag and probe consistent with the Z mass. And this greatly reduces the background for fake electron candidates. And so we have a very high efficiencies for all for the full PT spectrums. In fact, for electrons with uh, uh, transverse energy above 15 GV that have radiated up to 80% of their energy as photons, we still have uh, um, efficiencies above 98%. So um, something to note is that the transverse um, electrons with transverse energy over transverse mo uh, momentum, which uh, for now on, I will just refer to as ET over PT for simplicity. Uh, so electrons with ET over PT above one 
show Bram Stralung electrons. So these are electrons that have radiated away some of their um, uh, energy via photons. And so they have a, um, a, a PT value below uh, the, the deposited ET. Uh, on the other hand, electrons that have uh, ET over PT below one uh, indicate electrons with less well reconstructed trap ET. This is a electrons that have a PT that is actually greater than their deposited energy. And so in our analysis, we are able to, to remove these electrons. Um, yes, for the one prong uh, tau uh, 25 GeV trigger, we have uh, um, efficiency is better than 99% across all pseudoreductivity values and in the full range of, uh, of uh, PT. It is important to note, uh, for, oh, sorry, I should mention for, the, for both the first stage and second stage of the multi-stage um, strategy. Uh, it is important to note, however, that the second stage fast tracking resolution is actually better than the first stage at lower PT. This is due to the fact that uh, low momentum tracks bend out of the narrower uh, first stage ROI in the magnetic field, and so they're not uh, fully reconstructed but they are then picked up by the, the second stage, which is why there's, um, it has a better resolution. It is also important, very important to note that we observe uh, very high efficiencies, um, which are approximately constant at, uh, for the full range of, uh, of pileup interaction multiplicities, even at very high uh, pileup interactions, multi multipli multiplicities. Um, for the B jets, the vertex reconstruction runs two algorithms a simple histogramming algorithm and an offline based vertex uh, algorithm, algorithm. The histogramming algorithm has a higher efficiency for low track multiplicities. And this is due to a softer requirement of uh, track qualities, which allow for reconstruction of vertices with lower track multiplicity. On the other hand, the offline based algorithm has a better resolution, which is as good as uh, 20 micrometers for longitudinal impact parameter with increasing uh, vertex track multiplicities. Uh, it, uh, we also find very good resolutions for B-jet tracking for longitudinal in-track parameters. So we, in fact, we see that it's actually better than 12 micrometers for the full range, uh, full PT spectrum for the precision tracking. Uh, although we find that it's slightly lower for the fast tracking, but that's uh, expected. So to recap, the ID trigger is fundamental to achieving the required performance of the Atlas trigger system. I've shown the performance in terms of, of efficiency, resolution, and processing time uh, for the most important tracking related signatures for the high luminosity run two. And uh, I'm shown the excellent tracking performance that has been observed in a high pileup mul uh, multiplicities. In fact, we've sh uh, I've, I've shown that the tracking efficiency seems largely independent of pileup interaction multiplicity. Therefore, the ID trigger continues to provide excellent performance in run two, outperforming the already excellent performance in run one, and thus allowing the continuations of the Atlas physics program. Uh, I would like to also highlight that uh, to handle the expected conditions of uh, LHC run three, there are ongoing changes to the Atlas software in infrastructures to make use of the new developments and allow increased use of uh, multi-threading. And so the ID triggers are undergoing an extensive, extensive re-implementation of many aspects of the um, processing. Uh, so this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Questions? Uh, actually, I, I would have a question. So, uh, very general question. Why at the moment or currently for Atlas, the inner detector is not the part of the level one figure? Why it is used only for this high level trigger? It is because of the bandwidth or, or the speed? Yeah, I believe, I believe that's, that's the case. It's due to the, the, the processing time that's required to, to access the, the different parts of the inner detector and reconstruct the, the, and reconstruct the, the objects. Okay. Uh, however, uh, for, the, for the high luminosity LAT uh, and with the inner tracker that is planned, I think that the inner tracker should be the part of the level zero. Uh, the new new level zero trigger. So, so you know why it will be possible? Oh, I'm uh, I'm afraid I'm not uh, I'm not an expert on this. So I, I'm. I'm oh, okay. Uh, 
I do not want to comment on something that. Uh, I'm, so, so, but you I'm mentioned that already for run free, there are uh, yeah. significant changes planned. So, yes. what, what is the main thing? So the main thing is that uh, we're, we're implementing the multi-threading into the into the whole Atlas uh, software infrastructure. Um, okay, we will probably hear about. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, mm. I, I believe okay. so. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank yeah. you again. No and, problem. Thank you. And and we will move to uh, other Atlas presentation it will be uh, given by Kate. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. You can try to share. Sure. Just one second. Okay, can you okay. see the slides now? Yes. Okay, so I'll be discussing the phase one upgrade of the level one calorimeter trigger. So I move to slide two. Um, the Atlas trigger system is a two level trigger system which selects interesting events for offline analysis. So uh, the first level is a hardware based level one trigger which has a very low latency and performs a, a course selection using a limited amount of information from the detector. So only from the calorimeters and the muon detectors. The second level, the high level trigger or HLT is a commercial CPU farm, which performs a more refined selection using the full detector information. So the, the combination of these two systems uh, reduces the event rate from 40 megahertz, the collision rate down to 100 kilohertz at level one and finally to one and a half kilohertz after the HLT selection, and this is what is actually written out to storage. So on slide three, I'll give a little bit of motivation for why we're upgrading our system. Um, triggering in high pileup environments is very challenging. Uh, you can see from the, the pileup plot here in the bottom right-hand corner, the, the pileup is increasing year by year and the luminosity of the LHC is already exceeding its design value. So we need to keep up with this. Um, the physics motivation for the phase one upgrade, which Atlas is currently undergoing, uh, is based on numerous different uh, physics analyses and searches. So for example, uh, missing ET and multi-jet trigger rates are very vulnerable to pile up. And these are important for SUSY beyond the standard model and invisible searches. Um, identification of isolated objects is also very important for electroweak measurements. And this uh, is challenging in high pileup environments. And finally, there are a lot of studies of unique signatures uh, for things like uh, vector boson fusion or long-lived particles, which are becoming very popular right now. And these really benefit from specialized triggers as well. So um, one, one issue for run three is that because of detector readout limitations, our level one trigger rate uh, is fixed at a maximum of 100 kilohertz. So it's really important for us to be able to reject pileup while still maintaining low trigger thresholds in order to avoid losing any of this interesting physics. On slide four, I'll introduce the level one calorimeter trigger. So this identifies calorimeter based physics objects like uh, electrons and photons, taus, jets, missing ET and ET sums. Uh, the trigger objects which are identified by the system are then sent to the level one topological trigger or L1 topo which performs some additional selections which I'll discuss a little bit later. And the object multiplicities are sent uh, to the level one central trigger for the final one, level one accept decision. On slide five, uh, I'll explain the motivation for why we're upgrading this system. So as I said before, uh, the level one trigger rates are very vulnerable to pile up. And as Pavel showed, earlier in this session, uh, the liquid argon calorimeter is also being upgraded to provide higher granularity inputs uh, to our trigger system. So if you look at this diagram here on the left, uh, in run one and run two, the inputs to the level one calor trigger were trigger towers, which measured 0.1 by 0.1 in eta and phi. And then if you zoom in on a single trigger tower here, in run three, this is split into 10 supercells. So you have subdivision into calorimeter layers and also in the first and second layers of the calorimeter where the bulk of the shower energy is deposited, it's more finely segmented in eta. So this gives us a good handle on identifying um, isolated objects. So to exploit all of this uh, new higher granularity in the calorimeter, 
in level one Calo, we've introduced new ATCA based feature extractors or FEXs, which are able to run more sophisticated algorithms. They have a much larger optical input bandwidth than the previous system. They have improved isolation performance and pilot robustness. And this will allow us to reduce our rates while still keeping our trigger thresholds low. So you might have noticed in this uh, sketch of the system here, um, you can see in yellow highlighting the, the parts of the system which are running in run three. And then I also show in this green and blue at the bottom of the diagram, the legacy systems from run one and run two. And the two systems will actually run in parallel during the commissioning phase. And once the, the new run three system has been fully commissioned and is ready to provide triggers for physics, then the, the legacy system will be removed. So on the next couple of slides, uh, I will introduce the feature extractors a little bit, starting with the EFX, the electron feature extractor. So this identifies isolated E gamma and tau objects and consists of 24 ATCA modules. And you can see an example of one on the right. So these, uh, this system exploits the full calorimeter granularity in each layer and allows us to perform more sophisticated clustering algorithms. And we can compute the isolation of objects using shower shape observables. And this gives us a significant rate saving at level one. So this plot here on the bottom left, um, the points in black show a turn on curve uh, for the EM trigger that was used at level one in run two. And then the blue and the red uh, show a couple of different examples of thresholds. Uh, so for example, the, the blue gives us the same rate as run two, but with a much lower threshold. And the red curve gives us a reduced rate with respect to run two, but the turn on threshold is at the same point. So this will be really beneficial for physics with EM objects. On slide seven, the next FEX is the JFEX or jet feature extractor. So this identifies jets, but also missing ET, ET sums and hadronically decaying tau's. And this consists of six modules with a full eta phi coverage. Uh, the calorimeter inputs to this trigger are 0.1 by 0.1 trigger towers. So if you look at the, the cartoon on the top here, the run two system had 0.2 by 0.2 inputs, whereas the run three system has uh, more finely granular inputs. And also you'll notice that it uh, is able to run more sophisticated round jet algorithms as opposed to this basic square shape, which we had in run two. And this can uh, look at either small radius jets or large radius jets. In addition, the JFEX can perform noise suppression and pileup subtraction, and this will mitigate the impact of pileup on missing ET and multi-jet triggers. I show a performance plot here at the bottom right. Um, this is with a die Higgs to 4B sample uh, simulation, and you can see the level one trigger that was used in, in run two is, is given by the black points, and the run three JFEX curve is shown uh, in blue here. And you can see that for close by jets, so you have uh, an offline selection of PT greater than 30 GV and at least one jet within delta R of 0.6. Um, and online requiring three jets, you can see you have better performance for close by jets. So this will be very useful for, for this type of search. Finally, on slide eight, the GFEX or global feature extractor. And this is a bit different in that it's a single ATCA board, which is processing the full calorimeter coverage. And because it's only a single board, you can exploit full scan algorithms to compute uh, global event quantities. So we can use more sophisticated algorithms for missing ET. Uh, we will use one which is based on the jets without jets. I give a link to the paper describing this here. Uh, you can also compute things like the pileup density rho, for example. And this is particularly useful um, for physics with boosted objects. So it can compute uh, jet substructure quantities. If you look at the plot in the bottom left, I show uh, in this blue square here, we have uh, a Z prime to TT bar event. And the run two level one jet trigger would only be able to capture the information which is in this blue square. Whereas with a large R jet trigger from the GFX in run three, you would have access to everything in this black circle. So you would have much more substructure information about this event. 
On slide nine, um, the level one topological trigger was introduced in run two and commissioned and provided triggers for physics. The boards have been redesigned for run three uh, using a design based on the JFEX modules. And these will provide more processing power and additional functionality with respect to the legacy version. So this is a really useful uh, trigger because it provides additional background rejection and high signal efficiency without raising thresholds. And it does this using topological cuts. So the inputs are objects, not only from the level one Kello system, but also from the level one muon trigger system. And it can apply selections on things like invariant mass, angular cuts, and it can also look at late objects from other bunch crossings. So in these plots on the bottom, I show a few examples of things that L1 topo can do. Uh, the first plot on the left is a B physics trigger which applies a dimuon selection. And you can see if you compare the blue and the red curves by adding an angular cut uh, and an invariant mass selection, you can reduce the rate without actually raising the PT threshold. In the middle, I have a plot of a large R jet trigger efficiency. So um, if you compare the solid points which show a selection on some ET in a cone of delta R of one versus uh, the open points here, which just have an ET selection, you can see that the trigger efficiency is actually recovered for events with at least two subjects. And then finally on the right, I have an example of a turn on curve for a trigger for a unique signature. This is a VBF Higgs trigger, which combines angular and invariant mass selections. And this is an example of how this kind of selection can be used for physics uh, analyses involving challenging signatures. On slide 10, uh, in addition to the new feature extractor modules, we're also adding some new infrastructure. So uh, in order to cope with the vast number of optical fibers that are coming from the calorimeters to the FEXs, we have the FOX fiber optic exchange and then a similar topo FOX, which matches the maps the fibers from the level one Calo and muon systems to L1 topo. Uh, we also have the T-REX system, which will transmit digitized information from the tile calorimeter to the level one Kello system. And then we also have uh, some new control and clock hub and readout systems. Uh, and the readout will be done via the new Felix system, which is being used in, in several experiments. On slide 11, I'll say a few words about commissioning and installation. So uh, commissioning has been taking place at CERN in our surface test facility. Um, unfortunately, due to the COVID shutdown, uh, we had to leave the facility for several months, but progress is picking up once again. We are back in the lab, and our goal is to achieve a fully integrated vertical slice with synchronized data transmission on the real time and readout paths. So we're performing a number of different tests in this facility. Uh, we take digital inputs from the LAR calorimeters. And we also have FEX test modules, which provide test patterns. And then we send these to the EFEX, JFEX and GFEX, to L1 topo, and then to the readout. And we perform hardware, firmware, uh, online software tests, fiber mapping tests, and all of these are underway at the moment in our lab. On slide 12, uh, just a few words about what comes next. So as we're moving from the run two system to the run three system, I mentioned before that these two systems will actually run in parallel during commissioning with beams in the startup of run three and the legacy system will be removed once the phase one system is fully commissioned and providing physics triggers. So this will be um, a very lengthy process. So currently we are recommissioning our legacy system and of course also commissioning the run three system in the lab. In the second half of this year, we will be installing the system underground in the Atlas Cavern. And this will of course require well-tested hardware. Then the next step in the commissioning phase will be internal testing. So testing the con connectivity and configuration and mapping of the fibers and in the individual modules. Then from there, we move to integration with the calorimeters, which of course requires functioning readout and TDAC control. Then we move to integrating with the full Atlas system, which will be of course a very gradual iterative process. Uh, we will do beamless commissioning with cosmic data. And then once the LHC starts up, we will do commissioning with beams, which of course is a very 
careful process. This requires good monitoring to catch all of these rare bugs and timing calibration, of course, will also be critical. And then the end goal will be to provide robust and efficient triggers for physics in run three. So that's it for me. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Uh, questions? Uh, Okay, so so I would have a question. So you mentioned that, of course, the calorimeter and muon chambers are the part of the level one trigger at the moment for the current uh, atlas detector. Uh, the tile color is not. Yes, the tile calorimeter is also part of of the level one trigger. Okay, uh, then I would like to ask what what is the increase of the granularity of ECAL, the plan for Aran three. For the EM calorimeter. Yeah, it's like 10 times or... Yeah, um, let me go back on slide five. So you can see um, this cartoon in the bottom left. Mm -hmm. uh, the run one and run two is shown on the left. And then on the right, you have the run three system. So you go from a single trigger tower input, which is subdivided, subdivided into to 10 supercells. And it's more finely okay. granular in the, the region which mm -hmm. receives the, the most of the energy deposit. Is, is this done by like really the physically changing these active volumes or it is like only by the readout channels or, or the change of the readout electronics? Uh, yeah, this is a, a change in the, the liquid argon electronics. Okay, okay. And uh, last question, uh, what is the expectation for the high luminosity or what is the plan? Because you mentioned also the Felix readout, which I mm -hmm. know will be also the solution for uh, inner tracker. Yeah, so the the run three level one calorimeter system that we will use in run three will also be used in run four for the HLLHC. Uh, so is, the is design there any has upgrade plan. Um, well, the the, the design four? the design has been made with run four in in mind. There will be mm -hmm. uh, an additional feature extractor which will be added for forward electrons, the FX, which I didn't touch on here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, very, very nice. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, okay, uh, so we will continue with uh, Atlas and we have triggering on hadronic signatures uh, with the Atlas detector, uh, Benjamin. Oh. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, we, can, uh, we can see you if you can try to share. Yeah, I'll share. Um, Perfect. You can yeah, see the slides, okay? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So I'm Ben Carlson. I'll talk about triggering on hydronic signatures with Atlas. Um, so the basic uh, theme of this talk in terms of physics motivation is uh, things like dark matter. For example, we know uh, from astrophysics that there's additional matter that can be explained by standard model. We have models like supersymmetry. And of course, because this is a trigger talk, we also want to trigger on the standard model. And so all of these are important physics motivations. What I'll do is I'll talk about the Atlas trigger, which you seen a number of times already, I'll emphasize a few different details about level one as those will impact some of the features I'll talk about for jets and missing the So you've seen this before, but the basic argument for the Atlas trigger is that we have a large data rate coming in because we have relatively large events. Uh, and in principle, we can have an event rate of up to 40 megahertz if every uh, bunch crossing was, was filled. So then what we do is we have a a two-tier trigger or two-level trigger where we have events in a, in a on detector buffer, which then some information is sent to the um, level one trigger where we use FPGA to do very fast calculations to just the calorimeter and muon system to reduce the rate to 100 kilohertz. And we can read out um, 100 kilohertz of these event buffers. Any more than that, then it introduces dead time, which comes back to an easy, earlier question about why we can't uh, utilize tracking information in our detector because we can't actually retrieve the information. So then once the information is saved, it goes into a permanent or temporary storage in, in disk and we access that information using software. So to give a little more information about level one, which I'll need to explain some of the improvements that we did on run two, um, the input to the trigger system is, is roughly 0.1 by 0.1 granularity for most of the detector. And this is done by taking the liquid argon and tile subdetectors, which are much more granular, and having analog sums done uh, to get to the higher granularity. So the 
input to the level one system is actually digital inf or analog information as well. And then the first thing we do is actually digitize it. Uh, so we have sampling in 25 nanoseconds or, or 80 or 12.5 nanoseconds uh, sampling, digitize it, and then run some filters to reduce the impact of the out-of-time pileup, apply a correction to uh, shape the, the bunch crossing dependence, and then apply some threshold to remove pileups just using ET. Then we do things like identify jets and missing ET and electrons and show up. We also have the ability to combine information from the level one system in the level one topological processor where we can calculate math um, and do other calculations, which I'll mention. So we'll talk about jets next. I'll mention the motivation. I'll talk about single jet triggers, large radius jet triggers, and vector boson fusion. So this is a very extreme event. This is uh, a die jet event that has a mass of 8 TeV. And this might come from dark matter. For example, you have a mediator. This is the prime that couples only the quarks, and then you get die jet events. Now, um, one way to think about jet triggers, it's not the only use, but one way to think about them is in terms of searching for dark matter. Uh, the event display on the previous slide came from very high mass, but in principle, we want to probe a whole range of mass. And so the way to do that is to split this up into different triggers. So for example, if you have a single jet, you can trigger on the high mass part. The other parts of this require different triggers. And so I'll also mention the very low mass part, which uses a large radius uh, jet. And so we have improvements on that, and so I'll mention that as well. So for single jets, uh, at level one, we have a, a pre-scaled trigger that's fully efficient by around 200 GeV offline. And then for the high-level trigger, it's after taking into account improvements in calibration, which utilize things like uh, detector response across pseudo-rapidity, and then once we calibrate those differences away, uh, we end up with the, the red line. Um, now in the HLT, we do have some tracking information, so we can utilize those tracks to get a slightly better calibration, which is shown in blue. Uh, and you can also see that there's a really big gap between these two, which is uh, an important feature for some analyses. For large radius jets, um, we also have triggers both at level one and the high level trigger for this. The physics case is similar. Again, you have the same kind of Z prime models pertaining to quarks, which are jets. But uh, if you boost the system with an ISR jet, then they can be collimated into a single roughly radius one cone. And so at level one, uh, to get around the issue of the fact that our, our jets are a little bit too small to capture this, what we do is take all of those jets in the topological trigger or L1 topo, sum their ETs together if they're within a cone of radius one. And then that allows us to improve the efficiency of our large radius jet triggers. And you can see that on the left-hand part of this plot. And it, it improves the efficiency by about 20 to 30 GV for the same rate compared to level one just by itself. And that's shown in the back of the you're interested. Another feature of this plot is that you see the biggest improvement when there are multiple subjects, like for example, a, a TT bar today. Um, the right-hand side shows the HLT efficiency. We also have large radius jet triggers here. Of course, much higher thresholds. Um, we can get around that a little bit by requiring two jets, where there's, there's a mass requirement on, the, on both jets. That removes a lot of the CCD background. So we've improved a lot. But of course, you can also just look at these two plots and see that um, HLT is not on top of level one, so we can, in principle, get more clever and attack these cases uh, depending on the physics case. The last one is uh, vector boson fusion. So this is also a jet trigger. The physics motivation here is that we have vector boson fusion Higgs events, but the Higgs decays are too soft. So this might be case for B jets. It might be something long lived uh, that you can't trigger on otherwise. And we utilize these two jets and uh, evaluate the digit mass in the L1 topo trigger. And you can do it using this simplified expression. There's also a delta phi term. And uh, calculate approximate mass. So we did that. And this is the efficiency curve for that trigger, but also after the HLT. So the HLT has the same basic selections and a delta phi cut to reduce the QCD rate, because um, we don't have any other requirements in the trigger. And after all, the selections is fully efficient by about 1.3 TeV. Um, we also have triggers that I won't go into that have uh, other objects in the HLT, like BGS and the with the slightly lower BBF threshold. And you can see already one example in the archive of how you might want to use this trigger. So I'll switch and talk about missing transverse momentum or missing ET now. I'll mention the motivation, talk about how we handle pileup at level one, which is really crucial. And then the same question in the HLT, using new algorithms and show the performance. 
The missing transverse momentum, our missing EP, is uh, a way that we look for invisible particles. So for example, if you have this event display, you can see that on one side of the event, there's a very high PP jet, and on the other side of the event, there's nothing. That tells you by conservation of momentum in this plane that there has to be another particle. Uh, and so this is how we look for invisible particles, which is uh, dark matter. Now, most of our events are not this extreme. This would be, I think, a very easy event to identify. So usually we're looking at much lower thresholds, things that are more, look a lot more like the background. And so it turns out this is very susceptible to pile up. And so we need ways to deal with that at level one and the high level trigger separately. And we'll start with level one. So um, after the filtering techniques that I mentioned, one of the last handles is just the ET threshold on individual towers. So if you imagine looking at the sketch on the left hand side, you can see that there might be a few high ET towers that stand out and then a lot of noise of towers that are just not very energetic from pileups. So we apply a threshold and we cut those out to fit about one GV. And then we take the remaining towers to compute the missing ET. And uh, then the calculation is just ET times the cosine of phi to get the EX and similar for EY. And then we take the magnitude of the two to get the ET. Mix. And the impact on the rate is really substantial of this, of this cleaning. You can see, for example, just these few runs where we made this improvement and reduced the rate from the black to the blue and the red. So this is a significant way we can clean up the missing ET rate at level one. Uh, the next question is about the efficiency, of course, because you need to also understand what happens to the efficiency when you do those kind of cleaning. So the way we measure the efficiency is by using Z to mu mu events, where the, the muon PT is a proxy for the missing ET because muons are essentially invisible to the calorimeter, uh, at least the liquid argon. And, and uh, they're, the deposits they do have are essentially negligible for the PT scale. And you can see the backup for why that is. Um, the plot on the left shows the efficiency as a function of PT mu mu. So if you integrate to the right, then of 150 GV, then you can see the plot on the right, which shows the integral efficiency, which is about 95% efficient above 150. Then it's also split up into efficiency for the entire year, and then the three periods on the last slide, where you can see that within an, about 2% uh, shift, the efficiency is stable within all of these level one settings. And so given the change in rates, this is really a significant uh, statement because it shows that we're able to control the rate and also accept all of the interesting events as well. So switching to the software trigger, or the high level trigger, um, here we have different inputs. We have the entire calorimeter and we have much longer latency where we can use up to about 150 milliseconds of software. So we have a few different algorithms and I'll discuss uh, the performance of these. Um, one is very much like the level one algorithm where it just uses all the calorimeter cells with a threshold applied to each cell. Um, but instead of having trigger towers as input, it uses the full granularity of the detector. We compute topological clusters in software, um, which use nearby cells to group them into clusters. Um, we use jets. And then we have a dedicated pilot subtraction algorithm that uh, we've, we published in this paper that explains or that removes the impact of pilot. So this shows the comparison of algorithms. So I'll explain what this plot shows. Uh, we have already accepted these events at level one, and then this shows just for the high level trigger, what the acceptance is for background events on one axis, and on the X axis, it shows the efficiency given a PT of the dimuon system of 175 GV, which is actually a little bit tighter than what we typically want to do, but it illustrates what um, a way to compare the algorithm. So the left-hand side is for PT for mu less than 20, and you can see that the ordering of the algorithms is, is TU fit is better than TCLCW, which is cluster, and then uh, MHC, which is jets, which is better than cell. And bottom right-hand corner is the best uh, of, of all the algorithms. But then once you switch to higher pileup, then the order actually flips, um, and you see a really significant gain of pileup fit compared to the other simple cluster-based algorithms. And the cell net algorithm is actually doing a much better job of, of maintaining performance at high pileup in the simpler cluster algorithm. This plot is a snapshot summary showing all of the different triggers we ran in, in the HLT uh, during the four years of run two. And you can see from left to right, the evolution of the rate. So the rate is decreasing and we introduced a new algorithm. And that's the most striking changes between 
the orange squares in 2016 and the purple triangles in 2017, where we introduced the PU fits algorithm. Um, then we also did some additional tuning where we utilized the CellMed algorithm because it does actually have relatively good performance at high pileups. And so we can use that to reduce the rate by another 30 or 40 percent. Slide 19 shows the efficiency as a function of PT mu mu, and then the inset shows the efficiency as a function of mu. And you can see the efficiency for each of the years using the triggers that we ended up using. And for the most part, they're very stable with the exception of 2000, or very similar and stable. Um, but the one exception is that 2015 is a little bit better efficiency than the other years, uh, about 5% better, above 150 GeV. And that, that has to do mostly with the fact that we had very low pileup in 2015. So in summary, I described the Atlas trigger system to you and pointed out uh, key features for uh, dark matter triggers, particularly jets and missing AT. I described um, the jet triggers and some improvements for jet triggers, and then uh, missing AT triggers and how we dealt with the impact of pileup and how we uh, reduced the rates and maintained the efficiency as much as possible. I link here some uh, papers for further reference if you're interested. And um, if you have specific questions, let me know. After the session, I can join the Zoom room here, which I created. But uh, do let me know if you would like to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, questions? Uh, okay. Uh, so, so you mentioned that uh, these uh, hadronic uh, signatures are especially important for the dark matter and these things beyond standard model, which will be definitely the main topic, for example, for the high luminosity LAC also. Uh, so first thing, uh, you are using for this just the calorimeters or you are using also other part of the detectors? So for the triggers that I discussed here, the, the level one only uses the calorimeters. Um, and then in the high level trigger, the missing ET only uses the calorimeter. And the jets almost exclusively use the calorimeter except for one thing, uh, where we have very high PT jets, where we've computed the track already for B jets. And then we do use the track to improve the calibration of IPC jets. Okay. And, were you and, uh, yes. You were asking about high luminosity as well, or? Yeah, yeah. Now, now, now the second question is exactly about the high luminosity and if you will be able to more implement, for example, in a tracker to these analyses. Yeah. So the plan for the high luminosity LHC is to instrument the entire liquid argon. Uh, for the first level trigger, which is called level zero. So you get all of these cells and then run something called double clustering, which uh, kind of groups those together. Um, that happens in the first level. So you see the 40 megahertz input rate. And then the inner detector tracking, it's possible that that will be available at a reduced rate of either one or four megahertz. Um, but that's not in the first level trigger. It's kind of a split level trigger. So in that case, it would be a three level trigger. And then the level one, information, then we will call it level one and you have tracks after either one or four megahertz. Okay. Um, yeah. Does that answer okay. your question? Yes, yeah, perfect, thanks. Uh, other questions? If not, thank you very much again. And, and we are going to the last presentation of the today's session, which is Mark, and we will stay with Atlas and multi 3 d operation for Traeger. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I should be sharing screen now. Yes, you can see slides. Okay. Uh, so yes. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, preparing the uh, Atlas Trigger software for multi-threaded operation. Uh, so as uh, Kate and uh, Ben have already been talking about in the session, uh, this is the Atlas data flow. So you see the Atlas detectors uh, and uh, the data flow that then comes from these through the level one system and then into the, the high level trigger. And then this interacts with the data acquisition system, which of course then also writes this out to the permanent storage uh, at CERN. The HLT farm during run two consisted of 40,000 processor units and had a peak input rate of 100 kilohertz. This produced an output rate of one kilohertz on average per LHC fill. This talk I'll cover really the software that's running on the HLT, and this is based on the Athena software framework, which is also what we use in Atlas for reconstruction, simulation, and physics analysis too. So why are we talking about multi-threading? Well, the CPU to run Atlas reconstruction will really increase dramatically when we get to uh, run four and beyond. And so in this period, given the expected modeling of uh, the CPU budget uh, and the R&D that we are planning to do, that 
if we don't do changes, then we would really not fit within this uh, budget in the future. So we really are trying to start the improvements now, even though in run three, we should really easily be able to take the data that we have with the existing software. Uh, why are we then for multi-threaded? Well, we, the single thread performance has really plateaued in the computing market, and yet the number of cores is still growing. Uh, however, memory is also not getting cheaper, which means then that the maximal throughput uh, for the, your processing is really limited by the memory per process. Additionally, if we move to multi-threading, the software could then make use of accelerators. So for example, we could use a GPU to process a thread entirely. So in uh, run one and two, we were using Athena, which was based on Gaudi, which was not designed for multi-threading. So what we're now designing and implementing is Athena MT. This uh, has the H2T requirements really included from the start. So this includes partial event data processing. It includes three different types of MT processing. So you have inter-event, which means that multiple events are parallel, uh, processed in parallel. You have intra-event, where multiple algorithms can run in parallel for an event. And then you also have in-algorithm, where algorithms can utilize multi-threading and vectorization. So you can see in the diagram, just an example, where you have four threads, and you can see that you have an event being uh, processed in two, while you're also having two extra events being uh, processed. And these are really, the, the first two are really the aspects we're looking at using uh, at the moment within Atmos of this multi-threaded processing. This uh, uh, processing of an event is really managed by every algorithm that we're trying to run, having an input and output data dependency. Once the inputs are available for an algorithm, then the Gaudi Hive scheduler pushes this into the Intel thread building spot queue. The execution is then also depending on how many uh, number of threads and event slots we have configured. So the way we actually are running this in the HLT itself, uh, we have the HLT mother process. We, uh, we have one of these per processor unit in the HLT. This process is what loads the whole configuration. We're using Athena in the past, now Athena MT. And then from, the, from this, we then fork child processors. So the mother really is just handling these child processes. It doesn't handle actually any events itself. And this is really the same multi-process approach that we were using in run two. The memory was then saved in run two because we were then really only uh, using copy on write. So we were loading as much as memory at the start and then and this would then change very little during a run. Each child then runs a single instance of Athena to process events sequentially. And then each child, uh, the HLT child process itself is what was driving the event loop. So this was requesting uh, events from the, the, the data flow and then sending them to Athena to get processed. In front of three, this is slightly different. So now we can, because we're using multi-threading, we can really share both read and write memory. The Athena MT on the HTC child process now also can contain multiple threads itself and also multiple event slots. So within here you have multiple threads and here each, each of these then has extra slots. Athena MT now actually does the requesting of the events where it passes this request through the child process. When, and it does this when it has three processing slots available. So really uh, the interfaces that are processing using it have also been changed as well as the setup of uh, the Athena MT. The offline emulation of this configuration is really improved, so we have better development and testing that where we can really replicate this offline rather than having to run this on the HLT farm itself. Uh, the performance uh, will be really optimized by really adjusting the number of forks, threads, and slots. However, it's not just an optimization we have to do for performance. We also have to account for stability. So if there is a crash in Athena or if the process reaches a processing timeout threshold, the event data is what we call force accepted to a debug stream for offline and debugging or recovering. So this means that the whole event just gets passed without any HLT processing inside of it. In run two, in this case, uh, a single event that was being processed by Athena would, be get, would get written to the debug stream. In run three, this now applies to all the events that are being uh, processed in the same fork at that time. So this means if you have too many events uh, per event slots per fork, this increases the number of unrelated and potentially good for physics events in the debug stream. Uh, however, the number of event, a number of threads really does not affect the number of events lost. So these events could still be recovered, but it means we have to do more offline processing to really look at uh, these events. So for the software itself, well, we're actually, what we actually run on the HOT is an event selection based on what we call chains. These are built up of different HOT algorithms, which share as much code as possible with the offline versions. And then they have hypothesis tests to test conditions for acceptance of these chains. The chains are seeded by level one items. And in, in run two, we had roughly 1500 of these active. 
The HRT takes on average around half a second to process an event, which compares to 30 seconds for offline reconstruction. So to have these two running very similar code, we have to achieve this by the HRT only reconstructing part of the event, which is what we call regions of interest. So these are defined as cones around the collision point, around the interesting objects in the event. And then these HRT seeds are then pro provided by the level one trigger. We also implement early rejection, which actually you heard earlier in the LXUB talk, where the, you're trying to really process only part of the chains and you have uh, the early parts are fast and then later on uh, you do the more complicated detailed analysis and so you only do these where necessary. In run two, these features were really achieved uh, by custom HRT scheduling and data caching. For run three, the HRT software is rewritten and integrated into Athena MT. And this is not just a rewrite of the th aspects related to multi-threading, it's really a rewrite of actually nearly all of our HRT software. This uh, is a really allowing us better unification with the offline software and also the framework itself. Uh, and then the really specific HLT extensions we have on top of this is the event views, which is what provides a part of the event reconstruction. So this is just serving up only part of an event rather than the whole. And then the control flow, which we use for uh, early rejection, which I'll go through next. So to process an event, we have, uh, as I talked about earlier, we're input and output data dependencies. So you can see as each of these dotted lines go through all of the algorithms, these are individual chains and then the black lines represent a data dependency to go through one of these steps. To begin with, each of the, thing, each of the uh, chains are built up of uh, four algorithms. So we have filter algorithms, which are really running just to make sure the inputs are available to the algorithms. Then we have the input maker, which really goes and uh, takes the uh, information from the specific region of interest that you want to process. Then you have a reconstruction algorithm, which then processes the data in this and extracts the features you want. And then finally, we apply a hypothesis on this, where we really then check if the data we've reconstructed passes what we want to accept. This whole control graph is uh, created in initialization and then the events are, uh, the steps are then exercised based on what data is available in a particular event. So as the filter passes, we keep going through into each of the subsequent steps, but should we fail, then uh, we stop processing. So then all of these subsequent steps would not get processed. And this is how we then save CPU online. If we reach the last step with the chain still passing all of its steps, then this is when we accept an event. All of this configuration is actually uh, stored initially in the trigger database and it's loaded as part of the HLT initialization. So in run two, this database structure was uh, represented by a table uh, per object. So we had something like 90 tables, which were all filled by parsing XML files. This information was then accessed by four, uh, what we call keys, which are the primary keys of all the relevant parent tables in, uh, in the database. And if you want to learn more, there's a new paper that's just been published uh, this week um, onto archive. Uh, in run three, this uh, structure becomes much simpler as most of the database schema will now be replaced by directly storing JSON files. So this means that these files now contain the objects that were holding all of these subsequent uh, separate table information. So it means our schema is now much more simpler because we have only 10 tables and so all of the interaction is faster. This is easier to extend during data staking uh, rather than trying to update a database schema while we're taking data. And then also it does have the downside of having uh, increased data duplication because these data JSON files, we will, uh, the whole point of the previous schema was to reduce as much possible the data duplication, use links to save uh, on this. But this created really time consuming lookups for saving uh, information when we got to the end of run two. So this was really deemed much more important to, to save. So this, uh, this, is uh, this is how the process we go through now. And we also, uh, by doing all of this, is removing an extra step of converting the data. So no longer do we go from XML into a database and then into some metadata storage for offline processing. We now directly store these JSON files also into the offline data. So this means that when we are accessing data without da database access, we're really parsing the same, uh, same information. So it also saves us on the software that this unifies how we read all of this in several places too. So as a summary, Athena MT is being developed to prepare for future data staking requirements and the available computing resources. The core functionalities to be able to run the HRT are in place and the full set of algorithms to deploy the run through menu are really being developed. The validation campaigns are ongoing, both offline and line, online. So this means using Monte Carlo data, data replaying run through data through the actual HLT system, or also actually now taking live cosmic and random triggers uh, with the updated software. 
The performance studies have started to, but the, really the final configuration of this MT usage will be measured at the start of run, two, uh, run three. And if you want to find out some more information, there are also two other related talk, um, presentations at this conference. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Questions? Uh, okay, I, I will have a question actually. So you mentioned already run two. So you are already you were already trying the first steps on run two or? No, no. Um, well, the, the parts we were doing in run two were um, this uh, forking process where, so mm -hmm. even though Athena wasn't um, multi-threaded, we were able to use it in multi-process. So this was what saved okay. us the memory in uh, run two. So we just now have much more flexibility in run three that we can also run multi-threaded as well. So do you have any expectation how, how it will change the throughput or the speed or is there some ratio of how it was before and what should what it should be, for example, for run free? So I think uh, online uh, we will really gain by really uh, more the effect that we're rewriting the software to be closer to offline. So we will gain that we will have the same workflows and the same uh, sim much closer selections. Um, Actually, processing-wise, the throughput will be very similar to between run two and run three. Um, the, the, the performance gains for actually using the, the memory more efficient are really for the offline okay. processing. We just benefit by being more in sync with how offline processes them. Uh, I, I would expect that this is also the future for run four, or is there some different plan? Or? Exactly. So this is really the starting point where if we, can, if we develop this now, then we can uh, expand on this for run four and we can really see how to really improve our performance to know what, what our limitations are, because certainly this will be different. And so then we would be looking into running this on GPUs, for example. Okay. And, and last, last question. You mentioned, of course, that Athena is not used only for triggering, but also for data analysis and, and Monte Carlo simulations and these things. Uh, is this multi-trading or this parallelization also usable or will it somehow affect also this uh, let's say yes, aspect it, of Athena? It, exactly. So all of that, the software is moving to Athena MT. So yes, okay. everything for the reconstruction simulation will all move to this as well in the future. So it's really a, a rewrite of all of our software to be ready for the future. Okay. And the future for this, let's say, analysis or simulations is also run free already? That's right, yeah, it should be for run three, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, maybe. Uh, so I guess many of your algorithms access common things like uh, geometry or, did, yeah, uh, did you have to kind of rewrite how uh, algorithms are using these things? Uh, we didn't have to rewrite so much how uh, this, but uh, the, we do have a different system in the core framework. So yes, this is it is is different to how we were doing it in uh, in run two. But it's um, I mean these were the first things that were developed was to make sure that uh, the core framework is there in place so that you can access this information, uh, especially when you're running multiple threads accessing the same information. Uh, uh, for, for the developer of algorithms, these are actually quite small updates that they have to do. This is really handled by the, the development of the framework itself. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so, the, for example, the geometry is still kind of accessible from any place? Or any yep, yeah. Oh, okay. okay, any other question? Okay, if not, uh, thank you very much again. Thank you for this presentation and thank you to all the speakers of this very long session. I think it was, uh, we had a very dense but beautiful program. Thank you very much for preparation, such a nice presentations. I think that uh, we can now close uh, the official program. We can close probably the recording and, and, and live stream because we are already significantly late. But of course, if there would be some, uh, some uh, discussion following uh, the room still 